chapter sixty three of the history of pendennis this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the history of pendennis by william makepeace thackeray chapter sixty three which accounts perhaps for chapter sixty one the information regarding the affairs of the clavering family which major pendennis had acquired through strong and by his own personal interference as the friend of the house was such as almost made the old gentleman pause in any plans which he might have once entertained for his nephew's benefit to bestow upon arthur a wife with two such fathers-in-law as the two worthies whom the guileless and unfortunate lady clavering had drawn in her marriage ventures was to benefit no man and though the one in a manner neutralized the other and the appearance of amory or altamont in public would be the signal for his instantaneous withdrawal and condign punishment for the fugitive convict had cut down the officer in charge of him and a rope would be inevitably his end if he came again under british authorities yet no guardian would like to secure for his ward a wife whose parent was to be got rid of in such a way and the old gentleman's notion always had been that altamont with the gallows before his eyes would assuredly avoid recognition while at the same time by holding the threat of his discovery over clavering the latter who would lose everything by amory's appearance would be a slave in the hands of the person who knew so fatal a secret but if the begum paid clavering's debts many times more her wealth would be expended altogether upon this irreclaimable reprobate and her heirs whoever they might be would succeed but to an emptied treasury and miss amory instead of bringing her husband a good income and a seat in parliament would bring to that individual her person only and her pedigree with that lamentable note of suspendatur per column at the name of the last male of her line there was however to the old schemer revolving these things in his mind another course yet open the which will appear to the reader who may take the trouble to peruse a conversation which presently ensued between major pendennis and the honourable baronet the member for clavering when a man under pecuniary difficulties disappears from among his usual friends and equals dives out of sight as it were from the flock of birds in which he is accustomed to sail it is wonderful at what strange and distant nooks he comes up again for breath i have known a pell-mell lounger and rotten row buck of no inconsiderable fashion vanish from amongst his comrades of the clubs and the park and be discovered very happy and affable at an eighteen-penny ordinary in billingsgate another gentleman of great learning and wit when outrunning the constable were i to say he was a literary man some critics would vow that i intended to insult the literary profession once sent me his address at a little public-house called the fox under the hill down a most darksome and cavernous archway in the strand such a man under such misfortunes may have a house but he is never in his house and has an address where letters may be left but only simpletons go with the hopes of seeing him only a few of the faithful know where he is to be found and have the clue to his hiding-place so after the disputes with his wife and the misfortunes consequent thereon to find sir francis clavering at home was impossible ever since i hast him for my book which is fourteen pound he don't come home till three o'clock and pretends to be asleep when i bring his water of a mornin and dodges hout when i'm downstairs mr lightfoot remarked to his friend morgan and announced that he should go down to my lady and be butler there and marry his old woman in like manner after his altercations with strong the baronet did not come near him and fled to other haunts out of the reach of the chevalier's reproaches out of the reach of conscience if possible which many of us try to dodge and leave behind us by changes of scene and other fugitive stratagems 
so though the elder pendennis having his own ulterior object was bent upon seeing penn's country neighbour and representative in parliament it took the major no inconsiderable trouble and time before he could get him into such a confidential state and conversation as were necessary for the ends which the major had in view for since the major had been called in as family friend and had cognizance of clavering's affairs conjugal and pecuniary the baronet avoided him as he always avoided all his lawyers and agents when there was an account to be rendered or an affair of business to be discussed between them and never kept any appointment but when its object was the raising of money thus previous to catching this most shy and timorous bird the major made more than one futile attempt to hold him on one day it was a most innocent-looking invitation to dinner at greenwich to meet a few friends the baronet accepted suspected nothing and did not come leaving the major who indeed proposed to represent in himself the body of friends to eat his white bait alone on another occasion the major wrote and asked for ten minutes talk and the baronet instantly acknowledged the note and made the appointment at four o'clock the next day at bayes's precisely he carefully underlined the precisely but though four o'clock came as in the course of time and destiny it could not do otherwise no clavering made his appearance indeed if he had borrowed twenty pounds of pendennis he could not have been more timid or desirous of avoiding the major and the latter found that it was one thing to seek a man and another to find him before the close of that day in which strong's patron had given the chevalier the benefit of so many blessings before his face and curses behind his back sir francis clavering who had pledged his word and his oath to his wife's advisers to draw or accept no more bills of exchange and to be content with the allowance which his victimized wife still awarded him had managed to sign his respectable name to a piece of stamped paper which the baronet's friend mr moss abrams had carried off promising to have the bill done by a party with whose intimacy mr abrams was favoured and it chanced that strong heard of this transaction at the place where the writings had been drawn in the back parlour namely of mr santiago's cigar shop where the chevalier was constantly in the habit of spending an hour in the evening he is at his old work again mr santiago told his customer he and moss abrams were in my parlour moss sent out my boy for a stamp it must have been a bill for fifty pound i heard the baronet tell moss to date it two months back he will pretend that it is an old bill and that he forgot it when he came to a settlement with his wife the other day i dare say they will give him some more money now he is clear a man who has the habit of putting his unlucky name to promises to pay at six months has the satisfaction of knowing too that his affairs are known and canvassed and his signature handed round among the very worst names at rogues of london mr santiago's shop was close by st james's street and berry street where we have had the honour of visiting our friend major pendennis in his lodgings the major was walking daintily towards his apartment as strong burning with wrath and redolent of havana strode along the same pavement opposite to him confound these young men how they poison everything with their smoke thought the major here comes a fellow with mustachios and a cigar every fellow who smokes and wears mustachios is a low fellow oh it's mr strong i hope you are well mr strong and the old gentleman making a dignified bow to the chevalier was about to pass into his house directing towards the lock of the door with trembling hand the polished door-key we have said that at the long and weary disputes and conferences regarding the payment of sir francis clavering's last debts strong and pendennis had both been present as friends and advisers of the baronet's unlucky family strong stopped and held out his hand to his brother negotiator and old pendennis put out towards him a couple of ungracious fingers what is your good news said major pendennis patronising the other still further and condescending to address to him an observation for old pendennis had kept such good company all his life that he vaguely imagined he honoured common men by speaking to them still in town mr strong i hope i see you well my news is bad sir strong answered it concerns our friends at tunbridge wells and i should like to talk to you about it clavering is at his old tricks again major pendennis indeed pray do me the favour to come into my lodging cried the major with awakened interest and the pair entered and took possession of his drawing-room here seated strong and burthened himself of his indignation to the major and spoke at large of clavering's recklessness and treachery 
no promises will bind him sir he said you remember when we met sir with my lady's lawyer how he wouldn't be satisfied with giving his honour but wanted to take his oath on his knees to his wife and rang the bell for a bible and swore perdition on his soul if he ever would give another bill he has been signing one this very day sir and will sign as many more as you please for ready money and will deceive anybody his wife or his child or his old friend who has backed him a hundred times why there's a bill of his and mine will be due next week i thought we had paid all not that one strong said blushing he asked me not to mention it and and i had half the money for that major and they will be down on me but i don't care for it i'm used to it it's lady clavering that riles me it's a shame that that good-natured woman who has paid him out of jail a score of times should be ruined by his heartlessness a parcel of bill stealers boxers any rascals get his money and he don't scruple to throw an honest fellow over would you believe it sir he took money of altamont you know whom i mean indeed of that singular man who i think came tipsy once to sir francis's house major pendennis said with impenetrable countenance who is altamont mr strong i'm sure i don't know if you don't know the chevalier answered with a look of surprise and suspicion to tell you frankly said the major i have my suspicions i suppose mind i only suppose that in our friend clavering's a life who between you and me captain strong we must own about as loose a fish as any in my acquaintance there are no doubt some queer secrets and stories which he would not like to have known none of us would and very likely this fellow who calls himself altamont knows some story against clavering and has some hold on him and gets money out of him on the strength of his information i know some of the best men of the best families in england who are paying through the nose in that way but their private affairs are no business of mine mr strong and it is not to be supposed that because i go and dine with a man i pry into his secrets or am answerable for all his past life and so with our friend clavering i am most interested for his wife's sake and her daughter's who is a most charming creature and when her ladyship asked me i looked into her affairs and tried to set them straight and shall do so again you understand to the best of my humble power and ability if i can make myself useful and if i am called upon you understand if i am called upon and by the way this mr altamont mr strong how is this mr altamont i believe you are acquainted with him is he in town i don't know that i am called upon to know where he is major pendennis said strong rising and taking up his hat in dudgeon for the major's patronizing manner and impertinence of caution offended the honest gentleman not a little pendennis's manner altered at once from a tone of hauteur to one of knowing good humour ah captain strong you are cautious too i see and quite right my good sir quite right we don't know what ears walls may have sir or to whom we may be talking and as a man of the world and an old soldier an old and distinguished soldier i have been told captain strong you know very well that there is no use in throwing away your fire you may have your ideas and i may put two and two together and have mine but there are things which don't concern him that many a man had better not know eh captain and which i for one won't know until i have reason for knowing them and that i believe is your maxim too with regard to our friend the baronet i think with you it would be most advisable that he should be checked in his imprudent courses and most strongly reprehend any man's departure from his word or any conduct of his which can give any pain to his family or cause them annoyance in any way that is my full and frank opinion and i am sure it is yours certainly said strong dryly i am delighted to hear it delighted that an old brother soldier should agree with me so fully and i am exceedingly glad of the lucky meeting which has procured me the good fortune of your visit good evening thank you morgan showed the door to captain strong and strong preceded by morgan took his leave of major pendennis the chevalier not a little puzzled at the old fellow's prudence and the valet to say the truth to the full as much perplexed at his master's reticence for mr morgan in his capacity of accomplished valet moved here and there in the house as silent as a shadow and as it so happened during the latter part of his master's conversation with his visitor had been standing very close to the door and had overheard not a little of the talk between the two gentlemen and a great deal more than he could understand who is that altamont know anything about him and strong mr morgan asked of mr lightfoot on the next convenient occasion when they met at the club strong's his man of business draws the governor's bills and endosses em and does his odd jobs and that and i suppose altamont's in it too mr lightfoot replied that kite flying you know mr m always takes two or three on em to set the paper going altamont put the pot on at the derby and won a good bit of money i wish the governor could get some somewhere and i could get my book paid up 
do you think my lady would pay his debts again morgan asked find out that for me lightfoot and i'll make it worth your while my boy major pendennis had often said with a laugh that his valet morgan was a much richer man than himself and indeed by long course of careful speculation this wary and silent attendant had been amassing a considerable sum of money during the year which he had passed in the major's service where he had made the acquaintance of many other valets of distinction from whom he had learned the affairs of their principles when mr arthur came into his property but not until then morgan had surprised the young gentleman by saying that he had a little sum of money some fifty or a hundred pound which he wanted to lay out to advantage perhaps the gentleman in the temple knowing about affairs and business and that could help a poor fellow to a good investment morgan would be very much obliged to mr arthur most grateful and obliged indeed if arthur could tell him of one when arthur laughingly replied that he knew nothing about money matters and knew no earthly way of helping morgan the latter with the utmost simplicity was very grateful very grateful indeed to mr arthur and if mr arthur should want a little money before his rents was paid perhaps he would kindly remember that his uncle's old and faithful servant had some as he would like to put out and be most proud if he could be useful any ways to any of the family the prince of fair oaks who was tolerably prudent and had no need of ready money would as soon have thought of borrowing from his uncle's servant as of stealing the valet's pocket-handkerchief and was on the point of making some haughty reply to morgan's offer but was checked by the humour of the transaction morgan a capitalist morgan offering to lend to him the joke was excellent on the other hand the man might be quite innocent and the proposal of money a simple offer of good will so arthur withheld the sarcasm that was rising to his lips and contented himself by declining mr morgan's kind proposal he mentioned the matter to his uncle however and congratulated the latter on having such a treasure in his service it was then that the major said that he believed morgan had been getting devilish rich for a devilish long time in fact he had bought the house in berry street in which his master was a lodger and had actually made a considerable sum of money from his acquaintance with the clavering family and his knowledge obtained through his master that the begum would pay all her husband's debts by buying up as many of the baronet's acceptances as he could raise money to purchase of these transactions the major however knew no more than most gentlemen do of their servants who live with us all our days and are strangers to us so strong custom is and so pitiless the distinction between class and class so he offered to lend you money did he the elder pendennis remarked to his nephew he's a devilish sly fellow and a devilish rich fellow and as many a nobleman would like to have such a valet in his service and borrow from him too and he ain't a bit changed monsieur morgan he does his work just as well as ever he's always ready to my bell steals about the room like a cat he's so devilishly attached to me morgan on the day of strong's visit the major bethought him of penn's story and that morgan might help him and rallied the valet regarding his wealth with that free and insolent way which so high-placed a gentleman might be disposed to adopt towards so unfortunate a creature i heard that you have got some money to invest morgan said the major it's mr arthur has been telling hang him thought the valet i'm glad my place is such a good one thank you sir i've no reason to complain of my place nor of my master replied morgan demurely you're a good fellow and i believe you are attached to me and i'm glad you get on well and i hope you'll be prudent and not be taking a public-house or that kind of thing a public-house thought morgan me in a public-house the old fool damn me if i was ten years younger i'd set in parliament before i died that i would no thank you kindly sir i don't think of the public line sir and i've got my little savings pretty well put out sir you do a little in the discounting way eh morgan yes sir a very little i i beg your pardon sir might i be so free as to ask a question speak on my good fellow the elder said graciously about sir francis clavering's paper sir do you think he's any longer any good sir will my lady pay on him any more sir what you've done something in that business already yes sir a little replied morgan dropping down his eyes and i don't mind owning sir and i hope i may take the liberty of saying sir that a little more would make me very comfortable if it turned out as well as the last why how much have you netted by him in gad's name asked the major i've done a good bit sir at it that i own sir having some information 
and made acquaintance with the family through your kindness i put on the pot sir you did what i laid my money on sir i got all i could and borrowed and bought sir francis's bills many of em had his name and the gentleman's as is just gone out edward strong esq sir and of course i know of the blow hup and shindy as is took place in grosvenor place sir and as i may as well make my money as another i'd be very much obliged to you if you'd tell me whether my lady will come down any more although major pendennis was as much surprised at this intelligence regarding his servant as if he had heard that morgan was a disguised marquis about to throw off his mask and assume his seat in the house of peers and although he was of course indignant at the audacity of the fellow who had dared to grow rich under his nose and without his cognizance yet he had a natural admiration for every man who represented money and success and found himself respecting morgan and being rather afraid of that worthy as the truth began to dawn upon him well morgan said he i mustn't ask how rich you are and the richer the better for your sake i'm sure and if i could give you any information that could serve you i would speedily help you but frankly if lady clavering asks me whether she shall pay any more of sir francis's debts i shall advise and i hope she won't though i fear she will and that is all i know and so you are aware that sir francis is beginning again in his a reckless and imprudent course at his old game sir can't prevent that gentleman he will do it mr strong was saying that a mr moss abrams was the holder of one of sir francis clavering's notes do you know anything of this mr abrams or the amount of the bill don't know the bill know abrams quite well sir i wish you would find out about it for me and i wish you would find out where i can see sir francis clavering morgan and morgan said thank you sir yes sir i will sir and retired from the room as he had entered it with his usual stealthy respect and quiet humility leaving the major to muse and wonder over what he had just heard the next morning the valet informed major pendennis that he had seen mr abrams what was the amount of the bill that the gentleman was desirous to negotiate and that the baronet would be sure to be in the back parlour of the wheel of fortune tavern that day at one o'clock to this appointment sir francis clavering was punctual and as at one o'clock he sat in the parlour of the tavern in question surrounded by spittoons windsor chairs cheerful prints of boxers trotting horses and pedestrians and the lingering of last night's tobacco fumes as the descendant of an ancient line sat in this delectable place accommodated with an old copy of bell's life in london much blotted with beer the polite major pendennis walked into the apartment so it's you old boy asked the baronet thinking that mr moss abrams had arrived with the money how do you do sir francis clavering i wanted to see you and followed you here said the major at sight of whom the other's countenance fell now that he had his opponent before him the major was determined to make a brisk and sudden attack upon him and went into action at once i know he continued who is the exceedingly disreputable person for whom you took me clavering and the errand which brought you here it ain't your business is it asked the baronet with a sulky and deprecatory look why are you following me about and taking the command and meddling in my affairs major pendennis i've never done you any harm have i i've never had your money and i don't choose to be dodged about in this way and domineered over i don't choose it and i won't have it if lady clavering has any proposal to make to me let it be done in the regular way and through the lawyers i'd rather not have you i'm not come from lady clavering the major said but of my own accord to try and remonstrate with you clavering and see if you can be kept from ruin it is but a month ago that you swore on your honour and wanted to get a bible to strengthen the oath that you would accept no more bills but content yourself with the allowance which lady clavering gives you all your debts were paid with that proviso and you have broken it this mr abrams has a bill of yours for sixty pounds it's an old bill i take my solemn oath it's an old bill shrieked out the baronet you drew it yesterday and you dated it three months back purposely by gad clavering you sicken me with lies i can't help telling you so i've no patience with you by gad you cheat everybody yourself included i've seen a deal of the world but i never met your equal at humbugging it's my belief you had rather lie than not have you come here you old old beast to tempt me to to pitch into you and and knock your old head off said the baronet with a poisonous look of hatred at the major what sir shouted out the old major rising to his feet 
and clasping his cane and looking so fiercely that the baronet's tone instantly changed towards him no no said clavering piteously i beg your pardon i didn't mean to be angry or say anything unkind only you're so damned harsh to me major pendennis what is it you want of me why have you been hunting me so do you want money out of me too by jove you know i've not got a shilling and so clavering according to his custom passed from a curse into a whimper major pendennis saw from the other's tone that clavering knew his secret was in the major's hands i've no errand from anybody or no design upon you pendennis said but an endeavour if it's not too late to save you and your family from utter ruin through the infernal recklessness of your courses i knew your secret i didn't know it when i married her upon my oath i didn't know it till the damned scoundrel came back and told me himself and it's the misery about that which makes me so reckless pendennis indeed it is the baronet cried clasping his hands i knew your secret from the very first day when i saw amory come drunk into your dining-room in grosvenor place i never forget faces i remember that fellow in sydney a convict and he remembers me i know his trial the date of his marriage and of his reported death in the bush i could swear to him and i know that you are no more married to lady clavering than i am i've kept your secret well enough for i've not told a single soul that i know it not your wife not yourself till now poor lady c it would cut her up dreadfully whimpered sir francis and it wasn't my fault major you know it wasn't rather than allow you to go on ruining her as you do i will tell her clavering and tell all the world too that is what i swear i will do unless i can come to some terms with you and put some curb on your infernal folly by play debt and extravagance of all kind you've got through half your wife's fortune and that of her legitimate heirs mind her legitimate heirs here it must stop you can't live together you're not fit to live in a great house like clavering and before three years more were over would not leave a shilling to carry on i've settled what must be done you shall have six hundred a year you shall go abroad and live on that you must give up parliament and get on as well as you can if you refuse i give you my word i'll make the real estate of things known to to-morrow i'll swear to amory who when identified will go back to the country from whence he came and will rid the widow of you and himself together and so that boy of yours loses at once all title to old spell's property and it goes to your wife's daughter ain't i making myself pretty clearly understood you wouldn't be so cruel to that poor boy would you pendennis asked the father pleading piteously hang it think about him he's a nice boy though he's devilish wild i own he's devilish wild it's you who are cruel to him said the old moralist why sir you'll ruin him yourself inevitably in three years yes but perhaps i won't have such devilish bad luck you know the luck must turn and i'll reform by gad i'll reform and if you were to split on me it would cut up my wife so you know it would most infernally to be parted from you said the old major with a sneer you know she won't live with you again but why can't lady c live abroad or at bath or at tunbridge or at the deuce and i go on here clavering continued i like being here better than abroad and i like being in parliament it's devilish convenient being in parliament there's very few seats like mine left and if i gave it to em i should not wonder that ministry would give me an island to govern or some devilish good thing for you know i'm a gentleman of devilish good family and have a handle to my name and and that sort of thing major pendennis eh don't you see don't you think they'd give me something devilish good if i was to play my cards well and then you know i'd save money and be kept out of the way of the confounded hells and rouge et noir and and so i'd rather not give up parliament please for one instant to hate and defy a man at the next step to weep before him and at the next to be perfectly confidential and friendly with him was not an unusual process with our versatile-minded baronet as for your seat in parliament the major said with something of a blush on his cheek and a certain tremor which the other did not see you must part with that sir francis clavering to to me what are you going into the house major pendennis no not i but my nephew arthur is a very clever fellow and would make a figure there and when clavering had two members his father might very likely have been one and and should like arthur to be there the major said damme does he know it too cried out clavering nobody knows anything out of this room pendennis answered and if you do this favour for me i hold my tongue if not i am a man of my word and will do what i have said i say major said sir francis with a peculiarly humble smile you you couldn't get me my first quarter in advance could you like the best of fellows you can do anything with lady clavering and upon my oath i'll take up that bill of abram's 
the little damned scoundrel i know he'll do me in the business he always does and if you could do this for me we'd see major and i think your best plan would be to go down in september to clavering to shoot and take my nephew with you and introduce him yes that would be the best time and we will try and manage about the advance arthur may lend him that thought old pendennis confound him a seat in parliament is worth a hundred and fifty pounds and clavering you understand of course my nephew knows nothing about this business you have a mind to retire he is a clavering man and a good representative for the borough you introduce him and your people vote for him you see when can you get me the hundred and fifty major when shall i come and see you will you be at home this evening or to-morrow morning will you have anything here they've got some devilish good bitters in the bar i often have a glass of bitters it sets one up so the old major would take no refreshment but rose and took his leave of the baronet who walked with him to the door of the wheel of fortune and then strolled into the bar where he took a glass of gin and bitters with the landlady there and a gentleman connected with the ring who boarded at the wheel of f coming in he and sir francis clavering and the landlord talked about the fights and the news of the sporting world in general and at length mr moss abrams arrived with the proceeds of the baronet's bill from which his own handsome commission was deducted and out of the remainder sir francis stood a dinner at greenwich to his distinguished friend and passed the evening gaily at box hall meanwhile major pendennis calling a cab in piccadilly drove to lamb court temple where he speedily was closeted with his nephew in deep conversation after their talk they parted on very good terms and it was in consequence of that unreported conversation whereof the reader nevertheless can pretty well guess the bearing that arthur expressed himself as we have heard in the colloquy with warrington which is reported in the last chapter when a man is tempted to do a tempting thing he can find a hundred ingenious reasons for gratifying his liking and arthur thought very much that he would like to be in parliament and that he would like to distinguish himself there and that he need not care much what side he took as there was falsehood and truth on every side and on this and on other matters he thought he would compromise with his conscience and that sadduceeism was a very convenient and good-humoured profession of faith End of chapter sixty three chapter sixty four of the history of pendennis this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the history of pendennis by william makepeace thackeray chapter sixty four phyllis and corridon on a picturesque common in the neighbourhood of tunbridge wells lady clavering had found a pretty villa whither she retired after her conjugal disputes at the end of that unlucky london season miss amory of course accompanied her mother and master clavering came home for the holidays with whom blanche's chief occupation was to fight and quarrel but this was only a home pastime and the young schoolboy was not fond of home sports he found cricket and horses and plenty of friends at tunbridge the good-natured begum's house was filled with a constant society of young gentlemen of thirteen who ate and drank much too copiously of tarts and champagne who rode races on the lawn and frightened the fond mother who smoked and made themselves sick and the dining-room unbearable to miss blanche she did not like the society of young gentlemen of thirteen as for that fair young creature any change as long as it was change was pleasant to her and for a week or two she would have liked poverty in a cottage and bread and cheese and for a night perhaps a dungeon and bread and water and so the move to tunbridge was by no means unwelcome to her she wandered in the woods and sketched trees and farmhouses she read french novels habitually she drove into tunbridge wells pretty often and to any play or ball or conjurer or musician who might happen to appear in the place she slept a great deal she quarrelled with mamma and frank during the morning she found the little village school and attended it and first fondled the girls and thwarted the mistress then scolded the girls and laughed at the teacher she was constant at church of course it was a pretty little church of immense antiquity a little anglo-norman bijou built the day before yesterday and decorated with all sorts of painted windows carved saints heads gilt scripture texts and open pews blanche began forthwith to work a most correct high church altar cover for the church she passed for a saint with the clergyman for a while whom she quite took in and whom she coaxed and wheedled and fondled so artfully that poor mrs smirk who at first was charmed with her 
than bore with her than would hardly speak to her was almost mad with jealousy mrs smirk was the wife of our old friend smirk penn's tutor and poor helen's suitor he had consoled himself for her refusal with the young lady from clapham whom his mamma provided when the latter died our friend's views became every day more and more pronounced he cut off his coat collar and let his hair grow over his back he rigorously gave up the curl which he used to sport on his forehead and the tie of his neckcloth of which he was rather proud he went without any tie at all he went without dinner on fridays he read the roman hours and intimated that he was ready to receive confessions in the vestry the most harmless creature in the world he was denounced as a black and most dangerous jesuit and papist by muffin of the dissenting chapel and mr simeon knight at the old church mr smirk had built his chapel of ease with the money left him by his mother at clapham lord lord what would she have said to hear a table called an altar to see candlesticks on it to get letters signed on the feast of saint so and so or the vigil of saint what do you call em all these things did the boy of clapham practise his faithful wife following him but when blanche had a conference of near two hours in the vestry with mr smirk belinda paced up and down on the grass where there were only two little gravestones as yet she wished that she had a third there only only he would offer very likely to that creature who had infatuated him in a fortnight no she would retire she would go into a convent and profess and leave him such bad thoughts had smirk's wife and his neighbours regarding him these thinking him in direct correspondence with the bishop of rome that bewailing errors to her even more odious and fatal and yet our friend meant no earthly harm the post-office never brought him any letters from the pope he thought blanche to be sure at first the most pious gifted right-thinking fascinating person he had ever met and her manner of singing the chants delighted him but after a while he began to grow rather tired of miss amory her ways and graces grew stale somehow then he was doubtful about miss amory then she made a disturbance in his school lost her temper and wrapped the children's fingers blanche inspired this admiration and satiety somehow in many men she tried to please them and flung out all her graces at once came down to them with all her jewels on all her smiles and cajoleries and coaxings and ogles then she grew tired of them and of trying to please them and never having cared about them dropped them and the men grew tired of her and dropped her too it was a happy night for belinda when blanche went away and her husband with rather a blush and a sigh said he had been deceived in her he had thought her endowed with many precious gifts he feared they were mere tinsel he thought she had been a right-thinking person he feared she had merely made religion an amusement she certainly had quite lost her temper to the schoolmistress and beat polly rucker's knuckles cruelly belinda flew to his arms there was no question about the grave or the veil any more he tenderly embraced her on the forehead there is none like thee my belinda he said throwing his fine eyes up to the ceiling precious among women as for blanche from the instant she lost sight of him and belinda she never thought or cared about either any more but when arthur went down to pass a few days at tunbridge wells with the begum this stage of indifference had not arrived on miss blanche's part or on that of the simple clergyman smirk believed her to be an angel and wonder of a woman such a perfection he had never seen and sat listening to her music in the summer evenings open-mouthed wrapped in wonder tealess and bread and butterless fascinating as he had heard the music of the opera to be he had never but once attended an exhibition of that nature which he mentioned with a blush and a sigh it was on that day when he had accompanied helen and her son to the play at chatteris he could not conceive any thing more delicious more celestial he had almost said than miss amory's music she was a most gifted being she had a precious soul she had the most remarkable talents to all outward seeming the most heavenly disposition etc etc it was in this way that being then at the height of his own fever and bewitchment for blanche smirk discoursed to arthur about her the meeting between the two old acquaintances had been very cordial arthur loved anybody who loved his mother smirk could speak on that theme with genuine feeling and emotion they had a hundred things to tell each other of what had occurred in their lives arthur would perceive smirk said that his his views on church matters had developed themselves since their acquaintance mrs smirk a most exemplary person seconded them with all her endeavours he had built this little church on his mother's demise who had left him provided with a sufficiency of worldly means though in the cloister himself he had heard of arthur's reputation he spoke in the kindest and most saddened tone he held his eyelids down and bowed his fair head on one side 
arthur was immensely amused with him with his airs with his follies and simplicity with his blank stock and long hair with his real goodness kindness friendliness of feeling and his praises of blanche pleased and surprised our friend not a little and made him regard her with eyes of particular favour the truth is blanche was very glad to see arthur as one is glad to see an agreeable man in the country who brings down the last news and stories from the great city who can talk better than most country folks at least can talk that darling london jargon so dear and indispensable to london people so little understood by persons out of the world the first day pen came down he kept blanche laughing for hours after dinner she sang her songs with redoubled spirit she did not scold her mother she fondled and kissed her to the honest begum's surprise when it came to be bedtime she said deja with the prettiest air of regret possible and was really quite sorry to go to bed and squeezed arthur's hand quite fondly he on his side gave her pretty palm a very cordial pressure our young gentleman was of that turn that eyes very moderately bright dazzled him she is very much improved thought pen looking out into the night very much i suppose the begum won't mind my smoking with the window open she's a jolly good old woman and blanche is immensely improved i liked her manner with her mother to-night i liked her laughing way with that stupid young cub of a boy whom they oughtn't to allow to get tipsy she sang those little verses very prettily they were devilish pretty verses too though i say it who shouldn't say it and he hummed a tune which blanche had put to some verses of his own ah what a fine night how jolly a cigar is at night how pretty that little saxon church looks in the moonlight i wonder what old warrington's doing yes she's a devilish nice little thing as my uncle says oh heavenly here broke out a voice from a clematis covered casement near a girl's voice it was the voice of the author of Maylarm. pen burst into a laugh don't tell about my smoking he said leaning out of his own window oh go on i adore it cried the lady of Maylarm heavenly night heavenly heavenly moon but i must shut my window and not talk to you on account of les meurs how droll they are les meurs adieu and pen began to sing the good night to don basilio the next day they were walking in the fields together laughing and chattering the gayest pair of friends they talked about the days of their youth and blanche was prettily sentimental they talked about laura dearest laura blanche had loved her as a sister was she happy with that odd lady rockminster wouldn't she come and stay with them at tunbridge oh what walks they would take together what songs they would sing the old old songs laura's voice was splendid did arthur she must call him arthur remember the songs they sang in the happy old days now he was grown such a great man and had such a success etc etc and the day after which was enlivened with a happy ramble through the woods to penshurst and a sight of that pleasant park and hall came that conversation with the curate which we have narrated and which made our young friend think more and more is she all this perfection he asked himself has she become serious and religious does she tend schools and visit the poor is she kind to her mother and brother yes i am sure of that i have seen her in walking with his old tutor over his little parish and going to visit his school it was with inexpressible delight that pen found blanche seated instructing the children and fancied to himself how patient she must be how good-natured how ingenuous how really simple in her tastes and unspoiled by the world and do you really like the country he asked her as they walked together i should like never to see that odious city again oh arthur that is mr well arthur then one's good thoughts grow up in these sweet woods and calm solitudes like those flowers which won't bloom in london you know the gardener comes and changes our balconies once a week i don't think i shall bear to look london in the face again its odious smoky brazen face but heigh ho why that sigh blanche never mind why yes i do mind why tell me tell me everything i wish you hadn't come down and a second edition of may soupir came out you don't want me blanche i don't want you to go away i don't think this house will be very happy without you and that's why i wish that you never had come may soupir were here laid aside and may larm had begun ah what answer is given to those in the eyes of a young woman what is the method employed for drying them what took place o oh, ring-doves and roses o oh, dews and wild flowers o oh, waving greenwoods and balmy airs of summer here were two battered london rakes taking themselves in for a moment and fancying that they were in love with each other like phyllis and corydon when one thinks of country houses and country walks 
one wonders that any man is left unmarried end of chapter sixty four chapter sixty five of the history of pendennis this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the history of pendennis by william makepeace thackeray chapter sixty five temptation easy and frank spoken as pendennis commonly was with warrington how came it that arthur did not inform the friend and depository of all his secrets of the little circumstances which had taken place at the villa near tunbridge wells he talked about the discovery of his old tutor smirk freely enough and of his wife and of his anglo-norman church and of his departure from clotha to rome but when asked about blanche his answers were evasive or general he said she was a good-natured clever little thing that rightly guided she make no such bad wife after all but that he had for the moment no intention of marriage that his days of romance were over that he was contented with his present lot and so forth in the meantime there came occasionally to lamb court temple pretty little satin envelopes superscribed in the neatest handwriting and sealed with one of those admirable ciphers which if warrington had been curious enough to watch his friend's letters or indeed if the cipher had been decipherable would have shown george that mr arthur was in correspondence with a young lady whose initials were b a to these pretty little compositions mr pen replied in his best and gallantest manner with jokes with news of the town with points of wit nay with pretty little verses very likely in reply to the versicles of the muse of Maylarm. blanche we know rhymes with branch and stanch and launch and no doubt a gentleman of pen's ingenuity would not forego these advantages of position and would bring the pretty little changes upon these pleasing notes indeed we believe that those love verses of mr pen's which had such a pleasing success in the rose leaves that charming annual edited by lady violet le bas and illustrated by portraits of the female nobility by the famous artist pinckney were composed at this period of our hero's life and were first addressed to blanche per post before they figured in print cornets as it were to pinckney's pictorial garland verses are all very well the elder pendennis said who found pen scratching down one of these artless effusions at the club as he was waiting for his dinner and letter writing if mamma allows it and between such old country friends of course there may be a correspondence and that sort of thing but mind pen and don't commit yourself my boy for who knows what the deuce may happen the best way is to make your letters safe i never wrote a letter in all my life that would commit me and emmy sir i have had some experience of women and the worthy gentleman growing more garrulous and confidential with his nephew as he grew older told many affecting instances of the evil results consequent upon this want of caution to many persons in society how from using two ardent expressions in some poetical notes to the widow naylor young spooney has subjected himself to a visit of remonstrance from the widow's brother colonel flint and thus had been forced into a marriage with a woman old enough to be his mother how when louisa salter had at length succeeded in securing young sir john bird hopwood of the blues produced some letters which miss s had written to him and caused a withdrawal on bird's part who afterwards was united to miss stickney of lyme regis etc the major if he had not reading had plenty of observation and could back his wise saws with a multitude of modern instances which he had acquired in a long and careful perusal of the great book of the world pen laughed at the examples and blushing a little at his uncle's remonstrances said that he would bear them in mind and be cautious he blushed perhaps because he had borne them in mind because he was cautious because in his letters to miss blanche he had from instinct or honesty perhaps refrained from any avowals which might compromise him don't you remember the lesson i had sir in lady mirabel's miss fotheringay's affair i am not to be caught again uncle arthur said with mock frankness and humility 
old pendennis congratulated himself and his nephew heartily on the latter's prudence and progress and was pleased at the position which arthur was taking as a man of the world no doubt if warrington had been consulted his opinion would have been different and he would have told pen that the boy's foolish letters were better than the man's adroit compliments and slippery gallantries that to win the woman he loves only a knave or a coward advances under cover with subterfuges and a retreat secured behind him but pen spoke not on this matter to mr warrington knowing pretty well that he was guilty and what his friend's verdict would be colonel altamont had not been for many weeks absent on his foreign tour sir francis clavering having retired meanwhile into the country pursuant of his agreement with major pendennis when the ills of fate began to fall rather suddenly and heavily upon the sole remaining partner of the little firm of shepherd's inn when strong at parting with altamont refused the loan proffered by the latter in the fullness of his purse and the generosity of his heart he made such a sacrifice to conscience and delicacy as caused him many an after twinge and pang and he felt it was not very many hours in his life he had experienced the feeling that in this juncture of his affairs he had been too delicate and too scrupulous why should a fellow in want refuse a kind offer kindly made why should a thirsty man decline a pitcher of water from a friendly hand because it was a little soiled strong's conscience smote him for refusing what the other had fairly come by and generously proffered and he thought ruefully now it was too late that altamont's cash would have been as well in his pocket as in that of the gambling house proprietor at baden or ems with whom his excellency would infallibly leave his derby winnings it was whispered among the tradesmen bill discounters and others who had commercial dealings with captain strong that he and the baronet had parted company and that the captain's paper was henceforth of no value the tradesmen who had put a wonderful confidence in him hitherto for who could resist strong's jolly face and frank and honest demeanour now began to pour in their bills with a cowardly mistrust and unanimity the knocks at the shepherd's inn chambers door were constant and tailors bootmakers pastry cooks who had furnished dinners in their own persons or by the boys their representatives held levies on strong stairs to these were added one or two persons of a less clamorous but far more sly and dangerous sort the young clerks of lawyers namely who lurked about the inn or concerted with mr campion's young man in the chambers hard by having in their dismal pocket-books copies of writs to be served on edward strong requiring him to appear on an early day next term before our sovereign lady the queen and answer to etc etc from this invasion of creditors poor strong who had not a guinea in his pocket had of course no refuge but that of the englishman's castle into which he retired shutting the outer and inner door upon the enemy and not quitting his stronghold until after nightfall against this outer barrier the foe used to come and knock and curse in vain whilst the chevalier peeped at them from behind the little curtain which he had put over the orifice of his letter-box and had the dismal satisfaction of seeing the faces of furious clerk and fiery dun as they dashed up against the door and retreated from it but as they could not be always at his gate or sleep on his staircase the enemies of the chevalier sometimes left him free strong when so pressed by his commercial antagonists was not quite alone in his defence against them but had secured for himself an isle lie or two his friends were instructed to communicate with him by a system of private signals and they thus kept the garrison from starving by bringing in necessary supplies and kept up strong's heart and prevented him from surrendering by visiting him and cheering him in his retreat two of ned's most faithful allies were huckster and miss fanny bolton when hostile visitors were prowling about the inn fanny's little sisters were taught a particular cry or yodel which they innocently whooped in the court when fanny and exter came up to visit strong they archly sang this same note at his door when that barrier was straightway opened the honest garrison came out smiling the provisions and the pot of porter were brought in and in the society of his faithful friends the beleaguered one passed a comfortable night there are some men who could not live under this excitement 
but strong was a brave man as we have said who had seen service and never lost heart in peril but besides allies our general had secured for himself under difficulties that still more necessary aid a retreat it has been mentioned in a former part of this history how messrs costigan and bows lived in the house next door to captain strong and that the window of one of their rooms was not very far off the kitchen window which was situated in the upper story of strong's chambers a leaden water-pipe and gutter served for the two and strong looking out from his kitchen one day saw that he could spring with great ease up to the sill of his neighbour's window and clamber up the pipe which communicated from one to the other he had laughingly shown this refuge to his chum altamont and they had agreed that it would be as well not to mention the circumstance to captain costigan whose duns were numerous and who would be constantly flying down the pipe into their apartments if this way of escape were shown to him but now that the evil days were come strong made use of the passage and one afternoon burst in upon bows and costigan with his jolly face and explained that the enemy was in waiting on his staircase and that he had taken this means of giving them the slip so while mr marx's aides-de-camp were in waiting in the passage of number three strong walked down the steps of number four dined at the albion went to the play and returned home at midnight to the astonishment of mrs bolton and fanny who had not seen him quit his chambers and could not conceive how he could have passed the line of sentries strong bore this siege for some weeks with admirable spirit and resolution and as only such an old and brave soldier would for the pains and privations which he had to endure were enough to depress any man of ordinary courage and what vexed and riled him to use his own expression was the infernal indifference and cowardly ingratitude of clavering to whom he wrote letter after letter which the baronet never acknowledged by a single word or by the smallest remittance though a five-pound note as strong said at that time would have been a fortune to him but better days were in store for the chevalier and in the midst of his despondency and perplexities there came to him a most welcome aid yes if it hadn't been for this good fellow here said strong for a good fellow you are altamont my boy and hang me if i don't stand by you as long as i live i think pendennis it would have been all up with ned strong i was the fifth week of my being kept a prisoner for i couldn't be always risking my neck across that water-pipe and taking my walks abroad through poor old casa's window and my spirit was quite broken sir damn me quite beat and i was thinking of putting an end to myself and should have done it in another week when who should drop down from heaven but altamont heaven ain't exactly the place ned said altamont i came from baden baden said he and i'd had a deuced lucky month there that's all well sir he took up marx's bill and he paid the other fellows that were upon me like a man sir that he did said strong enthusiastically and i shall be very happy to stand a bottle of claret for this company and as many more as the company chooses said mr altamont with a blush hallo waiter bring us a magnum of the right sort do you hear and we'll drink our healths all round sir and may every good fellow like strong find another good fellow to stand by him at a pinch that's my sentiment mr pendennis though i don't like your name no and why asked arthur strong pressed the colonel's foot under the table here and ultimate rather excited filled up another bumper nodded to pen drank off his wine and said he was a gentleman and that was sufficient and they were all gentlemen the meeting between these all gentlemen took place at richmond whither pendennis had gone to dinner and where he found the chevalier and his friend at table in the coffee-room both of the latter were exceedingly hilarious talkative and excited by wine and strong who was an admirable story-teller told the story of his own siege and adventures and escapes with great liveliness and humour and described the talk of the sheriff's officers at his door the pretty little signals of fanny the grotesque exclamations of costigan when the chevalier burst in at his window and his final rescue by ultimate in a most graphic manner and so as greatly to interest his hearers as for me it's nothing ultimate said when a ship's paid off a chap spends his money you know and it's the fellers at the black and red at baden baden that did it i want a good bit of money there and intend to win a good bit more don't i strong i'm going to take him with me i've got a system i'll make his fortune i tell you i'll make your fortune if you like damn me everybody's fortune but what i'll do and no mistake boys i promise you i'll put in for that little fanny 
Demi, sir, what do you think she did? She had two pound, and I'm blessed if she didn't go and lend it to Ned Strong. Didn't she, Ned? Let's drink her health with all my heart said arthur and pledged this toast with the greatest cordiality mr altamont then began with the greatest volubility at great length to describe his system he said that it was infallible if played with coolness that he had it from a chap at baden who had lost by it it was true but because he had not enough capital if he could have stood one more turn of the wheel he would have had all his money back that he and several more chaps were going to make a bank and try it and that he would put every shilling he was worth into it and had come back to the country for the express purpose of fetching away his money and captain strong that strong should play for him that he could trust strong in his temper much better than he could his own and much better than blondel blondel or the italian that stood in as he emptied his bottle the colonel described at full length all his plans and prospects to pen who was interested in listening to his story and the confessions of his daring and lawless good humour i met that queer fellow ultimate the other day penn said to his uncle a day or two afterwards ultimate what ultimate there's lord resport's son said the major no no the fellow who came tipsy into clavering's dining-room one day when we were there said the nephew laughing he said he did not like the name of pendennis though he did me the honour to think that i was a good fellow i don't know any man of the name of ultimate i give you my honour said the impenetrable major and as for your acquaintance i think the less you have to do with him the better arthur arthur laughed again he is going to quit the country and make his fortune by a gambling system he and my amiable college acquaintance blundell are partners and the colonel takes out strong with him as aide-de-camp what is it that binds the chevalier and clavering i wonder i should think mind you pen i should think but of course i have only the idea that there has been something in clavering's previous life which gives these fellows and some others a certain power over him and if there should be no such a secret which affair of ours my boy dammy i say it ought to be a lesson to a man to keep himself straight in life and not to give any man a chance over him why i think you have some means of persuasion over clavering uncle or why should he give me that seat in parliament clavering thinks he ain't fit for parliament the major answered no more he is what's to prevent him from putting you or anybody else into his place if he likes do you think that government or the opposition would make any bones about accepting the seat if he offered it to them why should you be more squeamish than the first men and the most honourable men and men of the highest birth and position in the country begad the major had an answer of this kind to most of penn's objections and penn accepted his uncle's replies not so much because he believed them but because he wished to believe them we do a thing which of us has not not because everybody does it but because we like it and our quiescence alas proves not that everybody is right but that we and the rest of the world are poor creatures alike at his next visit to tunbridge mr penn did not forget to amuse miss blanche with the history which he had learned at richmond of the chevalier's imprisonment and of ultimate's gallant rescue and after he had told his tale in his usual satirical way he mentioned with praise and emotion little fanny's generous behaviour to the chevalier and ultimate's enthusiasm in her behalf miss blanche was somewhat jealous and a good deal piqued and curious about fanny among the many confidential little communications which arthur made to miss amory in the course of their delightful rural drives and their sweet evening walks it may be supposed that our hero would not forget a story so interesting to himself and so likely to be interesting to her as that of the passion and cure of the poor little ariadne of shepherd's inn his own part in that drama he described to do him justice with becoming modesty the moral which he wished to draw from the tale being one in accordance with his usual satirical mood viz that women get over their first loves quite as easily as men do for the fair blanche in their in times conversations did not cease to twit mr penn about his notorious failure in his own virgin attachment to the fathering gay and number one being withdrawn transferred themselves to number two without much difficulty and poor little fanny was offered up in sacrifice as an instance to prove this theory what griefs she had endured and surmounted what bitter pangs of hopeless attachment she had gone through what time it had taken to heal those wounds of the tender little bleeding heart mr penn did not know or perhaps did not choose to know for he was at once modest and doubtful about his capabilities as a conqueror of hearts and averse to believe that he had executed any dangerous ravages on that particular one though his own instance and argument told against himself in this case for if as he said miss fanny was by this time in love with her surgical adorer 
who had neither good looks nor good manners nor wit nor anything but ardour and fidelity to recommend him must she not in her first sickness of the love complaint have had a serious attack and suffered keenly for a man who had certainly a number of the showy qualities which mr huckster wanted you wicked odious creature miss blanche said i believe that you are enraged with fanny for being so impudent as to forget you and that you are actually jealous of mr huckster perhaps miss amory was right as the blush which came in spite of himself and tingled upon pendennis's cheek one of those blows with which a man's vanity is constantly slapping his face proved to pen that he was angry to think he had been superseded by such a rival by such a fellow as that without any conceivable good quality oh mr pendennis although this remark does not apply to such a smart fellow as you if nature had not made that provision for each sex in the credulity of the other which sees good qualities where none exist good looks in donkeys ears wit in their numbskulls and music in their bray there would not have been near so much marrying and giving in marriage as now obtains and as is necessary for the due propagation and continuance of the noble race to which we belong jealous or not pen said and blanche i don't say no i should have liked fanny to have come to a better end than that i don't like histories that end in that cynical way and when we arrive at the conclusion of the story of a pretty girl's passion to find such a figure as huckster's at the last page of the tale is a life a compromise my lady fair and the end of the battle of love an ignoble surrender is the search for the cupid which my poor little psyche pursued in the darkness the god of her soul's longing the god of the blooming cheek and rainbow pinions to result in huckster smelling of tobacco and gallipots i wish though i don't see it in life that people could be like jenny and jessamy or my lord and lady clementina in the story-books and fashionable novels and at once under the ceremony and as it were at the parson's benediction become perfectly handsome and good and happy ever after and don't you intend to be good and happy pray monsieur le misanthrope and are you very discontented with your lot and will your marriage be a compromise asked the author of melarme with a charming mouet and is your psyche an odious vulgar wretch you wicked satirical creature i can't abide you you take the hearts of young things play with them and fling them away with scorn you ask for love and trample on it you you make me cry that you do arthur and 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 don't and i won't be consoled in that way and i think fanny was quite right in leaving such a heartless creature again i don't say no said pen looking very gloomily at blanche and not offering by any means to repeat the attempt at consolation which had elicited that sweet monosyllable don't from the young lady i don't think i have much of what people call heart but i don't profess it i made my venture when i was eighteen and lighted my lamp and went in search of cupid and what was my discovery of love a vulgar dancing woman i failed as everybody does almost everybody only it is luckier to fail before marriage than after merci du choix monsieur said the self making a curtsey look my little blanche said pen taking her hand and with his voice of sad good humour at least i stoop to no flatteries quite the contrary said miss blanche and till you know foolish lies as vulgar men do why should you and i with our experience ape romance and dissemble passion i do not believe miss blanche amory to be peerless among the beautiful nor the greatest poetess nor the most surpassing musician any more than i believe you to be the tallest woman in the whole world like the giantess whose picture we saw as we rode through the fair yesterday but if i don't set you up as a heroine neither do i offer you your very humble servant as a hero but i think you are well there i think you are very sufficiently good-looking merci miss blanche said with another curtsey i think you sing charmingly i am sure you are clever i hope and believe that you are good-natured and that you will be companionable and so provided i bring you a certain sum of money and a seat in parliament you condescend to fling to me your royal pocket-handkerchief said blanche que d'honneur we used to call your highness the prince of fair oaks what an honour to think that i am to be elevated to the throne and to bring the seat in parliament as backsheesh to the sultan i am glad i am clever and that i can play and sing to your liking my songs will amuse my lord's leisure and if thieves are about the house said pen grimly pursuing the simile forty besetting thieves in the shape of lurking cares and enemies in ambush and passion in arms my morgiana will dance round me with a tambourine and kill all my rogues and thieves with a smile won't she but pen looked as if he did not believe that she would ah blanche he continued after a pause don't be angry don't be hurt at my 
truth telling don't you see that i always take you at your word you say you will be a slave and dance i say dance you say i take you with what you bring i say i take you with what you bring to the necessary deceits and hypocrisies of our life why add any that are useless and unnecessary if i offer myself to you because i think we have a fair chance of being happy together and because by your help i may get for both of us a good place and a not undistinguished name why ask me to feign raptures and counterfeit romance in which neither of us believe do you want me to come wooing in a prince pretty man's dress from the masquerade warehouse and to pay you compliments like sir charles grandison do you want me to make you verses as in the days when we were when we were children i will if you like and sell them to bacon and bungay afterwards shall i feed my pretty princess with bonbons mais j'adore les bonbons moi said the little sylphide with a queer piteous look i can buy a hatful at fortnum and masons for a guinea and it shall have its bonbons its pooty little sugar-plums that it shall pen said with a bitter smile nay my dear nay my dearest little blanche don't cry dry the pretty eyes i can't bear that and he proceeded to offer that consolation which the circumstance required in which the tears the genuine tears of vexation which now sprang from the angry eyes of the author of malarm demanded the scornful and sarcastic tone of pendennis quite frightened and overcame the girl i i don't want your consolation i i never was so spoken to before by any of my my by anybody she sobbed out with much simplicity anybody shouted out pen with a savage burst of laughter and blanche blushed one of the most genuine blushes which her cheek had ever exhibited and she cried out oh arthur vous êtes un homme terrible she felt bewildered frightened oppressed the worldly little flirt who had been playing at love for the last dozen years of her life and yet not displeased at meeting a master tell me arthur she said after a pause in this strange love-making why does sir francis clavering give up his seat in parliament oh fay why does he give it to me asked arthur now blushing in his turn you always mock me sir she said if it is good to be in parliament why does sir francis go out my uncle has talked him over he always said that you were not sufficiently provided for in the the family disputes when your mamma paid his debt so liberally it was stipulated i suppose that you that is that i that is upon my word i don't know why he goes out of parliament pen said with rather a forced laugh you see blanche that you and i are two good little children and that this marriage has been arranged for us by our mammas and uncles and that we must be obedient like a good little boy and girl so when pen went to london he sent blanche a box of bonbons each sugar-plum of which was wrapped up in ready-made french verses of the most tender kind and besides dispatched to her some poems of his own manufacture quite as artless and authentic and it was no wonder that he did not tell warrington what his conversations with miss amory had been of so delicate a sentiment were they and of a nature so necessarily private and if like many a worse and better man arthur pendennis the widow's son was meditating an apostasy and going to sell himself to we all know whom at least the renegade did not pretend to be a believer in the creed to which he was ready to swear and if every woman and man in this kingdom who has sold her or himself for money or position as mr pendennis was about to do would but purchase a copy of his memoirs what tons of volumes messieurs bradbury and evans would sell End of chapter sixty five chapter sixty six of the history of pendennis this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the history of pendennis by william makepeace thackeray chapter sixty six in which pen begins his canvass melancholy as the great house at clavering park had been in the days before his marriage when its bankrupt proprietor was a refugee in foreign lands it was not much more cheerful now when sir francis clavering came to inhabit it the greater part of the mansion was shut up and the baronet only occupied a few of the rooms on the ground floor where his housekeeper and her assistant from the lodge gate waited upon the luckless gentleman in his forced retreat and cooked up part of the game which he spent the dreary mornings in shooting lightfoot his man had passed over to my lady's service and as pen was informed in a letter from mr smirk who performed the ceremony had executed his prudent intention of marrying mrs bonner 
my lady's woman who in her mature years was stricken with the charms of the youth and endowed him with her savings and her mature person to be landlord and landlady of the clavering arms was the ambition of both of them and it was agreed that they were to remain in lady clavering's service until quarter day arrived when they were to take possession of their hotel pen graciously promised that he would give his election dinner there when the baronet should vacate his seat in the young man's favour and as it had been agreed by his uncle to whom clavering seemed to be able to refuse nothing arthur came down in september on a visit to clavering park the owner of which was very glad to have a companion who would relieve his loneliness and perhaps would lend him a little ready money pen furnished his host with these desirable supplies a couple of days after he had made his appearance at clavering and no sooner were these small funds in sir francis's pocket than the latter found he had business at chatteris and at the neighbouring watering-places of which blankshire boasts many and went off to see to his affairs which were transacted as might be supposed at the county race-grounds and billiard-rooms arthur could live alone well enough having many mental resources and amusements which did not require other persons company he could walk with the gamekeeper of a morning and for the evenings there was a plenty of books and occupation for a literary genius like mr arthur who required but a cigar and a sheet of paper or two to make the night pass away pleasantly in truth in two or three days he had found the society of sir francis clavering perfectly intolerable and it was with a mischievous eagerness and satisfaction that he offered clavering the little pecuniary aid which the latter according to his custom solicited and supplied him with the means of taking flight from his own house besides our ingenious friend had to ingratiate himself with the townspeople of clavering and with the voters of the borough which he hoped to represent and he set himself to this task with only the more eagerness remembering how unpopular he had before been in clavering and determined to vanquish the odium which he had inspired amongst the simple people there his sense of humour made him delight in this task naturally rather reserved and silent in public he became on a sudden as frank easy and jovial as captain strong he laughed with everybody who would exchange a laugh with him shook hands right and left with what may be certainly called a dexterous cordiality made his appearance at the market day in the farmer's ordinary and in fine acted like a consummate hypocrite and as gentlemen of the highest birth and most spotless integrity act when they wish to make themselves agreeable to their constituents and have some end to gain of the country folks how is it that we allow ourselves not to be deceived but to be ingratiated so readily by a glib tongue a ready laugh and a frank manner we know for the most part that it is false coin and we take it we know that it is flattery which it costs nothing to distribute to everybody and we had rather have it than be without it friend pen went about at clavering laboriously simple and adroitly pleased and quite a different being from the scornful and rather sulky young dandy whom the inhabitants remembered ten years ago the rectory was shut up dr portman was gone with his gout and his family to harrogate an event which pen deplored very much in a letter to the doctor in which in a few kind and simple words he expressed his regret in not seeing his old friend whose advice he wanted and whose aid he might require some day but pen consoled himself for the doctor's absence by making acquaintance with mr simcoe the opposition preacher and with the two partners of the cloth factory at chatteris and with the independent preacher there all of whom he met at clavering athenaeum which the liberal party had set up in accordance with the advanced spirit of the age and perhaps in opposition to the aristocratic old reading-room into which the edinburgh review had once scarcely got an admission and where no tradesmen were allowed an entrance he propitiated the younger partner of the cloth factory by asking him to dine in a friendly way at the park he complimented the honourable mrs simcoe with hares and partridges from the same quarter and a request to read her husband's last sermon and being a little unwell one day the rascal took advantage of the circumstance to show his tongue to mr huckster who sent him medicines and called the next morning how delighted old pendennis would have been with his pupil pen himself was amused with the sport in which he was engaged 
and his success inspired him with a wicked good humour and yet as he walked out of clavering of a night after presiding at a meeting at the athenaeum or working through an evening with mrs simcoe who with her husband was awed by the young londoner's reputation and had heard of his social successes as he passed over the old familiar bridge of the rushing brawl and heard that well-remembered sound of waters beneath and saw his own cottage of fair oaks among the trees their darkling outlines clear against the starlit sky different thoughts no doubt came to the young man's mind and awakened pangs of grief and shame there there still used to be a light in the windows of the room which he remembered so well and in which the saint who loved him had passed so many hours of care and yearning and prayer he turned away his gaze from the faint light which seemed to pursue him with its wan reproachful gaze as though it was his mother's spirit watching and warning how clear the night was how keen the stars shone how ceaseless the rush of the flowing waters the old home trees whispered and waved gently their dark heads and branches over the cottage roof yonder in the faint starlight glimmer was the terrace where as a boy he walked of summer evenings ardent and trustful unspotted untried ignorant of doubts or passions sheltered as yet from the world's contamination in the pure and anxious bosom of love the clock of the near town tolling midnight with a clang disturbs our wanderer's reverie and sends him onwards towards his night's resting-place through the lodge into clavering avenue and under the dark arcades of the rustling limes when he sees the cottage the next time it is smiling in sunset those bedroom windows are open where the light was burning the night before and penn's tenant captain stokes of the bombay artillery whose mother old mrs stokes lives in clavering receives his landlord's visit with great cordiality shows him over the grounds and the new pond he has made in the back garden from the stables talks to him confidentially about the roof and chimneys and begs mr pendennis to name a day when he will do himself and his mrs stokes the pleasure to etc pen who has been a fortnight in the country excuses himself for not having called sooner upon the captain by frankly owning that he had not the heart to do it i understand you sir the captain says and mrs stokes who had slipped away at the ring of the bell how odd it seemed to pen to ring the bell comes down in her best gown surrounded by her children the young ones clam about stokes the boy jumps into an armchair it was pen's father's armchair and arthur remembers the days when he would as soon have thought of mounting the king's throne as of seating himself in that armchair he asks of miss stokes she is the very image of her mamma if she can play he should like to hear a tune on that piano she plays he hears the notes of the old piano once more enfeebled by age but he does not listen to the player he is listening to laura singing as in the days of their youth and sees his mother bending and beating time over the shoulder of the girl the dinner at fair oaks given in pen's honour by his tenant and at which old mrs stokes captain glanders squire hobnell and the clergyman and his lady from tinkleton were present was very stupid and melancholy for pen until the waiter from clavering who aided the captain's stable-boy and mrs stokes's butler whom pen remembered as a street boy and who was now indeed barber in that place dropped a plate over pen's shoulder on which mr hobnell who also employed him remarked i suppose hodson your hands are slippery with bear's grease he's always dropping the crockery about that hodson is ha ha on which hodson blushed and looked so disconcerted that pen burst out laughing and good humour and hilarity were the order of the evening for the second course there was a hare and partridges top and bottom and when after the withdrawal of the servants pen said to the vicar of tinkleton i think mr stooks you should have asked hodson to cut the hair the joke was taken instantly by the clergyman who was followed in the course of a few minutes by captain stokes and glanders and by mr hobnell who arrived rather late but with an immense guffaw while mr pen was engaged in the country in the above schemes it happened that the lady of his choice if not of his affections came up to london from the tunbridge villa bound upon shopping expeditions or important business and in company of old mrs bonner her mother's maid who had lived and quarrelled with blanche many times since she was an infant and who now being about to quit lady clavering's service for the hymeneal state was anxious like a good soul to bestow some token of respectful kindness upon her old and young mistress before she quitted them altogether to take her post as the wife of lightfoot 
and landlady of the clavering arms the honest woman took the benefit of miss amory's taste to make the purchase which she intended to offer her ladyship and requested the fair blanche to choose something for herself that should be to her liking and remind her of her old nurse who had attended her through many a wakeful night and eventful teething and childish fever and who loved her like a child of her own amost these purchases were made and as the nurse insisted on buying an immense bible for blanche the young lady suggested that bonner should purchase a large johnson's dictionary for her mamma each of the two women might certainly profit by the present made to her then mrs bonner invested money in some bargains in linen drapery which might be useful at the clavering arms and bought a red and yellow neck handkerchief which blanche could see at once was intended for mr lightfoot younger than herself by at least five-and-twenty years mrs bonner regarded that youth with a fondness at once parental and conjugal and loved to lavish ornaments on his person which already glittered with pins rings shirt studs and chains and seals purchased at the good creature's expense it was in the strand that mrs bonner made her purchases aided by miss blanche who liked the fun very well and when the old lady had bought everything that she desired and was leaving the shop blanche with a smiling face and a sweet bow to one of the shopmen said pray sir will you have the kindness to show us the way to shepherd's inn shepherd's inn was but a few score of yards off old castle street was close by the elegant young shopman pointed out the turning which the young lady was to take and she and her companion walked off together shepherd's inn what can you want in shepherd's inn miss blanche bonner inquired mr strong lives there do you want to go and see the captain i should like to see the captain very well i like the captain but it is not him i want i want to see a dear little good girl who was very kind to to mr arthur when he was so ill last year and saved his life almost and i want to thank her and ask her if she would like anything i looked out several of my dresses on purpose this morning bonner and she looked at bonner as if she had a right to admiration and had performed an act of remarkable virtue blanche indeed was very fond of sugar-plums she would have fed the poor upon them when she had had enough and given a country girl a ball dress when she had worn it and was tired of it pretty girl pretty young woman mumbled mrs bonner i know i want no pretty young women to come about lightfoot and in imagination she peopled the clavering arms with a harem of the most hideous chambermaids and barmaids blanche with pink and blue and feathers and flowers and trinkets that wondrous invention a chatelaine was not extant yet or she would have had one we may be sure and a shot silk dress and a wonderful mantle and a charming parasol presented a vision of elegance and beauty such as bewildered the eyes of mrs bolton who was scrubbing the lodge floor of shepherd's inn and caused betsy jane and ameliar ann to look with delight blanche looked on them with a smile of ineffable sweetness and protection like rowena going to see rebecca like marie antoinette visiting the poor in the famine like the marchioness of carabao alighting from her carriage and four at a pauper tenant's door and taking from john number two the packet of epsom salts for the invalid's benefit carrying it with her own imperial hand into the sick-room blanche felt a queen stepping down from her throne to visit a subject and enjoyed all the bland consciousness of doing a good action my good woman i want to see fanny fanny bolton is she here mrs bolton had a sudden suspicion from the splendour of blanche's appearance that it must be a play-actor or something worse what do you want with fanny pray she asked i am lady clavering's daughter you have heard of sir francis clavering and i wish very much indeed to see fanny bolton pray step in miss betsy jane where is fanny betsy jane said fanny had gone into number three staircase on which mrs bolton said she was probably in strong's rooms and bade the child go and see if she was there in captain strong's rooms oh let us go to captain strong's rooms cried out miss blanche i know him very well you dearest little girl show us the way to captain strong cried out miss blanche for the floor reeked with the recent scrubbing and the goddess did not like the smell of brown soap and as they passed up the stairs a gentleman by the name of costigan who happened to be swaggering about the court and gave a very knowing look with his oi under blanche's bonnet remarked to himself that's a devilish foine girl bedad goin up to Svrong and altamont they're always having foine girls up their stairs hallo what's that he presently said looking up at the windows from which some piercing shrieks issued at the sound of the voice of a distressed female the intrepid cos 
rushed up the stairs as fast as his old legs would carry him being nearly overthrown by a strong servant who was descending the stair cos found the outer door of strong's chambers opened and began to thunder at the knocker after many and fierce knocks the inner door was partially unclosed and strong's head appeared it's oi eh, me boy what's that noise throng asked costigan go to the devil was the only answer and the door was shut on cos's venerable red nose and he went downstairs muttering threats at the indignity offered to him and vowing that he would have satisfaction in the meanwhile the reader more lucky than captain costigan will have the privilege of being made acquainted with the secret which was withheld from that officer it has been said of how generous a disposition mr altamont was and when he was well supplied with funds how liberally he spent them of a hospitable turn he had no greater pleasure than drinking in company with other people so that there was no man more welcome at greenwich and richmond than the emissary of the nawab of lucknow now it chanced that on the day when blanche and mrs bonner ascended the staircase to strong's room in shepherd's inn the colonel had invited miss de Lavelle of the blank theatre royale and her mother mrs hodge to a little party down the river and it had been agreed that they were to meet at chambers and thence walk down to a port in the neighbouring strand to take water so that when mrs bonner and may larm came to the door where grady altamont's servant was standing the domestic said walk in ladies with the utmost affability and led them into the room which was arranged as if they had been expected there indeed two bouquets of flowers bought at covent garden that morning and instances of the tender gallantry of altamont were awaiting his guests upon the table blanche smelt at the bouquet and put her pretty little dainty nose into it and tripped about the room and looked behind the curtains and at the books and prints and at the plan of clavering estate hanging up on the wall and had asked the servant for captain strong and had almost forgotten his existence and the errand about which she had come namely to visit fanny bolton so pleased was she with the new adventure and the odd strange delightful droll little idea of being in a bachelor's chambers in a queer old place in the city grady meanwhile with a pair of ample varnished boots had disappeared into his master's room blanche had hardly the leisure to remark how big the boots were and how unlike mr strong's the women's come said grady helping his master to the boots did you ask him if they would take a glass of anything asked altamont grady came out he says will you take anything to drink the domestic asked of them at which blanche amused with the artless question broke out into a pretty little laugh and asked of mrs bonner shall we take anything to drink well you may take it or lave it said mr grady who thought his offer slighted and did not like the contemptuous manner of the newcomers and so left them will we take anything to drink blanche asked again and again began to laugh grady bawled out a voice from the chamber within a voice that made mrs bonner start grady did not answer his song was heard from afar off from the kitchen his upper room where grady was singing at his work grady my coat again roared the voice from within why that is not mr strong's voice said the sylphide still half laughing grady my coat bonner who is grady my coat we ought to go away bonner still looked quite puzzled at the sound of the voice which he had heard the bedroom door here opened and the individual who had called out grady my coat appeared without the garment in question he nodded to the women and walked across the room i beg your pardon ladies grady bring my coat down sir well my dears it's a fine day and we'll have a jolly lark at blank he said no more for here mrs bonner who had been looking at him with scared eyes suddenly shrieked out amory amory and fell back screaming and fainting in her chair the man so apostrophized looked at the woman an instant and rushing up to blanche seized her and kissed her yes betsy he said by god it is me mary bonner knew me what a fine gal we've grown but it's a secret mind i'm dead though i'm your father your poor mother don't know it what a pretty gal we've grown kiss me kiss me close my betsy damn it i love you i'm your old father betsy or blanche looked quite bewildered and began to scream too once twice thrice and it was her piercing shrieks which captain costigan heard as he walked the court below at the sound of these shrieks the perplexed parent clasped his hands his wristbands were open and on one brawny arm you could see letters tattooed in blue and rushing to his apartment came back with an eau de cologne bottle from his grand silver dressing-case with the fragrant contents of which he began liberally to sprinkle bonner and blanche the screams of these women brought the other occupants of the chambers into the room 
grady from his kitchen and strong from his apartment in the upper story the latter at once saw from the aspect of the two women what had occurred grady go and wait in the court he said and if anybody comes you understand me is it the play actress and her mother said grady yes confound you say that there's nobody in chambers and the party's off for to-day shall i say that sir and after i bought them bouquets asked grady of his master yes said amory with a stamp of his foot and strong going to the door too reached it just in time to prevent the entrance of captain costigan who had mounted the stair the ladies from the theatre did not have their treat to greenwich nor did blanche pay her visit to fanny bolton on that day and cos who took occasion majestically to inquire of grady what the mischief was and who was crying had for answer that twas a woman another of them and that they were in grady's opinion the cause of most all the mischief in the world End of chapter sixty six chapter sixty seven of the history of pendennis this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the history of pendennis by william makepeace thackeray chapter sixty seven in which pen begins to doubt about his election whilst pen in his own county was thus carrying on his selfish plans and parliamentary schemes news came to him that lady rockminster had arrived at Baymouth and had brought with her our friend laura at the announcement that laura his sister was near him pen felt rather guilty his wish was to stand higher in her esteem perhaps than in that of any other person in the world she was his mother's legacy to him he was to be her patron and protector in some sort how would she brave the news which he had to tell her and how should he explain the plans which he was meditating he felt as if neither he nor blanche could bear laura's dazzling glance of calm scrutiny and as if he would not dare to disclose his worldly hopes and ambitions to that spotless judge at her arrival at baymouth he wrote a letter thither which contained a great number of fine phrases and protests of affection and a great deal of easy satire and raillery in the midst of all which mr pen could not help feeling that he was in panic and that he was acting like a rogue and hypocrite how was it that a simple country girl should be the object of fear and trembling to such an accomplished gentleman as mr pen his worldly tactics and diplomacy his satire and knowledge of the world could not bear the test of her purity he felt somehow and he had to own to himself that his affairs were in such a position that he could not tell the truth to that honest soul as he rode from clavering to baymouth he felt as guilty as a schoolboy who doesn't know his lesson and is about to face the awful master for is not truth the master always and does she not have the power and hold the book under the charge of her kind though somewhat wayward and absolute patroness lady rockminster laura had seen somewhat of the world in the last year had gathered some accomplishments and profited by the lessons of society many a girl who had been accustomed to that too great tenderness in which laura's early life had been passed would have been unfitted for the changed existence which she now had to lead helen worshipped her two children and thought as home-bred women will that all the world was made for them or to be considered after them she tended laura with a watchfulness of affection which never left her if she had a headache the widow was as alarmed as if there had never been an aching head before in the world she slept and woke read and moved under her mother's fond superintendence which was not withdrawn from her along with the tender creature whose anxious heart would beat no more and painful moments of grief and depression no doubt laura had when she stood in the great careless world alone nobody heeded her griefs or her solitude she was not quite the equal in social rank of the lady whose companion she was or of the friends and relatives of the imperious but kind old dowager some very likely bore her no goodwill some perhaps slighted her it might have been that servants were occasionally rude their mistress certainly was often laura not seldom found herself in family meetings the confidence 
and familiarity of which she felt were interrupted by her intrusion and her sensitiveness of course was wounded at the idea that she should give or feel this annoyance how many governesses are there in the world thought cheerful laura how many ladies whose necessities make them slaves and companions by profession what bad tempers and coarse unkindness have not these to encounter how infinitely better my lot is with these really kind and affectionate people than that of thousands of unprotected girls it was with this cordial spirit that our young lady adapted herself to her new position and went in advance of her fortune with a trustful smile did you ever know a person who met fortune in that way whom the goddess did not regard kindly are not even bad people won by a constant cheerfulness and a pure and affectionate heart when the babes in the wood and the ballad looked up fondly and trustfully at those notorious rogues whom their uncle had set to make away with the little folks we all know how one of the rascals relented and made away with the other not having the heart to be unkind to so much innocence and beauty oh happy they who have that virgin loving trust and sweet smiling confidence in the world and fear no evil because they think none miss laura bell was one of these fortunate persons and besides the gentle widow's little cross which as we have seen pen gave her had such a sparkling and brilliant cohenure in her bosom as is even more precious than that famous jewel for it not only fetches a price and is retained by its owner in another world where diamonds are stated to be of no value but here too is of inestimable worth to its possessor is a talisman against evil and lightens up the darkness of life like kogia hassan's famous stone so that before miss bell had been a year in lady rockminster's house there was not a single person in it whose love she had not won by the use of this talisman from the old lady to the lowest dependent of her bounty laura had secured the goodwill and kindness of everybody with a mistress of such a temper my lady's woman who had endured her mistress for forty years and had been clawed and scolded and jibed every day and night in that space of time could not be expected to have a good temper of her own and was at first angry against miss laura as she had been against her ladyship's fifteen preceding companions but when laura was ill at paris this old woman nursed her in spite of her mistress who was afraid of catching the fever and absolutely fought for her medicine with martha from fair oaks now advanced to be miss laura's own maid as she was recovering grand jean the chef wanted to kill her by the numbers of delicacies which he dressed for her and wept when she ate her first slice of chicken the swiss major-domo of the house celebrated miss bell's praises in almost every european language which he spoke with indifferent incorrectness the coachman was happy to drive her out the page cried when he heard she was ill and calverley and coldstream those two footmen so large so calm ordinarily and so difficult to move broke out into extraordinary hilarity at the news of her convalescence and intoxicated the page at a wine-shop to fet laura's recovery even lady diana pincent our former acquaintance mr pincent had married by this time lady diana who had had a considerable dislike to laura for some time was so enthusiastic as to say that she thought miss bell was a very agreeable person and that grandmamma had found a great true value in her all this good will and kindness laura had acquired not by any arts not by any flattery but by the simple force of good nature and by the blessed gift of pleasing and being pleased on the one or two occasions when he had seen lady rockminster the old lady who did not admire him had been very pitiless and abrupt with our young friend and perhaps pen expected when he came to baymouth to find laura installed in her house in the quality of humble companion and treated no better than himself when she heard of his arrival she came running downstairs and i am not sure that she did not embrace him in the presence of calverley and coldstream not that those gentlemen ever told if the fractus orbis had come to a smash if laura instead of kissing pen had taken her scissors and snipped off his head calverley and coldstream would have looked on impassively and without allowing a grain of powder to be disturbed by the calamity laura had so much improved in health and looks that pen could not but admire her the frank and kind eyes which met his beamed with good health the cheek which he kissed blushed with beauty as he looked at her artless and graceful pure and candid he thought he had never seen her so beautiful why should he remark her beauty now so much and remark too to himself that he had not remarked it sooner 
he took her fair trustful hand and kissed it fondly he looked in her bright clear eyes and read in them that kindling welcome which he was always sure to find there he was affected and touched by the tender tone and the pure sparkling glance their innocence smote him somehow and moved him how good you are to me laura sister said pen i don't deserve that you should that you should be so kind to me mamma left you to me she said stooping down and brushing his forehead with her lips hastily you know you were to come to me when you were in trouble or to tell me when you were very happy that was our compact arthur last year before we parted are you very happy now or are you in trouble which is it and she looked at him with an arch glance of kindness do you like going into parliament do you intend to distinguish yourself there how i shall tremble for your first speech do you know about the parliament plan then pen asked no all the world knows i've heard it talked about many times lady rockminster's doctor talked about it to-day i dare say it will be in the chatteris paper to-morrow it's all over the county that sir francis clavering of clavering is going to retire in behalf of mr arthur pendennis of fair oaks and that the young and beautiful miss blanche amory is what that too asked pendennis that too dear arthur to sir say as somebody would say whom i intend to be very fond of and who i am sure is very clever and pretty i have had a letter from blanche the kindest of letters she speaks so warmly of you arthur i hope i know she feels what she writes when is it to be arthur why did you not tell me i may come and live with you then mayn't i my home is yours dear laura and everything i have pen said if i did not tell you it was because because i do not know nothing is decided as yet no words have passed between us but you think blanche could be happy with me don't you not a romantic fondness you know i have no heart i think i have told her so only a sober-sided attachment and want my wife on one side of the fire and my sister on the other parliament in the session and fair oaks in the holidays and my laura never to leave me until somebody who has a right comes to take her away somebody who has a right somebody with a right why did pen as he looked at the girl and slowly uttered the words begin to feel angry and jealous of the invisible somebody with the right to take her away anxious but a minute ago how she would take the news regarding his probable arrangements with blanche pen was hurt somehow that she received the intelligence so easily and took his happiness for granted until somebody comes laura said with a laugh i will stay at home and be aunt laura and take care of the children when blanche is in the world i have arranged it all i am an excellent housekeeper do you know i have been to market at paris with mrs beck and have taken some lessons from m grandjean and i have had some lessons in paris in singing too with the money which you sent me you kind boy and i can sing much better now and i have learned to dance though not so well as blanche and when you become a minister of state blanche shall present me and with this and with a provoking good humour she performed for him the last parisian curtsy lady rockminster came in whilst this curtsy was being performed and gave to arthur one finger to shake which he took on over which he bowed as well as he could which in truth was very clumsily so you are going to be married sir said the old lady scold him lady rockminster for not telling us laura said going away which in truth the old lady began instantly to do so you are going to marry and to go into parliament in place of that good-for-nothing sir francis clavering i wanted him to give my grandson his seat why did he not give my grandson his seat i hope you are to have a great deal of money with miss amory i wouldn't take her without a great deal sir francis clavering is tired of parliament pen said wincing and and i rather wish to attempt that career the rest of the story is at least premature i wonder when you had laura at home you could take up with such an affected little creature as that the old lady continued i'm very sorry miss amory does not please your ladyship said pen smiling you mean that it is no affair of mine and that i am not going to marry her well i'm not and i'm very glad i'm not a little odious thing when i think that a man could prefer her to my laura i've no patience with him and so i tell you mr arthur pendennis i'm very glad you see laura with such favourable eyes pen said you are very glad and you are very sorry what does it matter sir whether you are very glad or very sorry a young man who prefers miss amory to miss bell has no business to be sorry or glad a young man who takes up with such a crooked lump of affectation as that little amory for she is crooked i tell you she is after seeing my laura has no right to hold up his head again where's your friend bluebeard 
the tall young man i mean warrington isn't his name why does he not come down and marry laura what do the young men mean by not marrying such a girl as that they all marry for money now you are all selfish and cowards we ran away with each other and made foolish matches in my time i have no patience with the young men when i was at paris in the winter i asked all the three attaches at the embassy why they did not fall in love with miss bell they laughed they said they wanted money you are all selfish you are all cowards i hope before you offered miss bell to the attache said pen with some heat you did her the favour to consult her miss bell has only a little money miss bell must marry soon somebody must make a match for her sir and a girl can't offer herself said the old dowager with great state laura my dear i've been telling your cousin that all the young men are selfish and that there is not a penny worth of romance left among them he is as bad as the rest have you been asking arthur why he won't marry me said laura with a kindly smile coming back and taking her cousin's hand she had been away perhaps to hide some traces of emotion which she did not wish others to see he is going to marry somebody else and i intend to be very fond of her and to go and live with them provided he then does not ask every bachelor who comes to his house why he does not marry me the terrors of pen's conscience being thus appeased and his examination before laura over without any reproaches on the part of the latter pen began to find that his duty and inclination led him constantly to Baymouth, where lady rockminster informed him that a place was always reserved for him at her table and i recommend you to come often the old lady said for grand jean is an excellent cook and to be with laura and me will do your manners good it is easy to see that you are always thinking about yourself don't blush and stammer almost all young men are always thinking about themselves my sons and grandsons always were until i cured them come here and let us teach you to behave properly you will not have to carve that is done at the side table hecker will give you as much wine as is good for you and on days when you are very good and amusing you shall have some champagne hecker mind what i say mr pendennis is miss laura's brother and you will make him comfortable and see that he does not have too much wine or disturb me whilst i am taking my nap after dinner you are selfish i intend to cure you of being selfish you will dine here when you have no other engagements and if it rains you had better put up at the hotel as long as the good lady could order everybody round about her she was not hard to please and all the slaves and subjects of her little dowager court trembled before her but loved her she did not receive a very numerous or brilliant society the doctor of course was admitted as a constant and faithful visitor the vicar and his curate and on public days the vicar's wife and daughters and some of the seasoned visitors at Baymouth were received at the old lady's entertainments but generally the company was a small one and mr arthur drank his wine by himself when lady rockminster retired to take her doze and to be played and sung to sleep by laura after dinner if my music can give her a nap said the good-natured girl ought i not to be very glad that it can do so much good lady rockminster sleeps very little of nights and i used to read to her until i fell ill at paris since when she will not hear of my sitting up why did you not write to me when you were ill asked pen with a blush what good could you do me i had martha to nurse me and the doctor every day you are too busy to write to women or to think about them you have your books and your newspapers and your politics and your railroads to occupy you i wrote when i was well and pen looked at her and blushed again as he remembered that during all the time of her illness he had never written to her and had scarcely thought about her in consequence of his relationship pen was free to walk and ride with his cousin constantly and in the course of those walks and rides could appreciate the sweet frankness of her disposition and the true simplicity and kindliness of her fair and spotless heart in their mother's lifetime she had never spoken so openly or so cordially as now the desire of poor helen to make an union between her two children had caused a reserve on laura's part towards pen for which under the altered circumstances of arthur's life there was now no necessity he was engaged to another woman and laura became his sister at once hiding or banishing from herself any doubts which she might have as to his choice striving to look cheerfully forward and hope for his prosperity promising herself to do all that affection might do to make her mother's darling happy their talk was often about the departed mother 
and it was from a thousand stories which laura told him that arthur was made aware how constant and absorbing that silent maternal devotion had been which had accompanied him present and absent through life and had only ended with the fond widow's last breath one day the people in clavering saw a lad in charge of a couple of horses at the churchyard gate and it was told over the place that pen and laura had visited helen's grave together since arthur had come down into the country he had been there once or twice but the sight of the sacred stone had brought no consolation to him a guilty man doing a guilty deed a mere speculator content to lay down his faith and honour for a fortune and a worldly career and owning that his life was but a contemptible surrender what right had he in the holy place what booted it to him in the world he lived in that others were no better than himself arthur and laura rode by the gates of fair oaks and he shook hands with his tenants children playing on the lawn and the terrace laura looked steadily at the cottage wall at the creeper on the porch and the magnolia growing up to her window mr pendennis rode by to-day one of the boys told his mother with a lady and he stopped and talked to us and he asked for a bit of honeysuckle off the porch and gave it the lady i couldn't see if she was pretty she had her veil down she was riding one of cramp's horses out of baymouth as they rode over the downs between home and baymouth pen did not speak much though they rode very close together he was thinking what a mockery life was and how men refuse happiness when they may have it or having it kick it down or barter it with their eyes open for a little worthless money or beggarly honour and then the thought came what does it matter for the little space the lives of the best and purest of us are consumed in a vain desire and end in a disappointment as the dear souls who sleep in her grave yonder she had her selfish ambition as much as caesar had and died balked of her life's longing the stone covers over our hopes and our memories our place knows us not other people's children are playing on the grass he broke out in a hard voice where you and i used to play laura and you see how the magnolia we planted has grown up since our time i've been round to one or two of the cottages where my mother used to visit it is scarcely more than a year that she has gone and the people whom she used to benefit care no more for her death than for queen anne's we are all selfish the world is selfish there are but a few exceptions like you my dear to shine like good deeds in a naughty world and make the blackness more dismal i wish you would not speak in that way arthur said laura looking down and bending her head to the honeysuckle on her breast when you told the little boy to give me this you were not selfish a pretty sacrifice i made to get it for you said the sneerer but your heart was kind and full of love when you did so one cannot ask for more than love and kindness and if you think humbly of yourself arthur the love and kindness are diminished are they i often thought our dearest mother spoiled you at home by worshipping you and that if you are i hate the word what you say her too great fondness helped to make you so and as for the world when men go out into it i suppose they cannot be otherwise than selfish you have to fight for yourself and to get on for yourself and to make a name for yourself mamma and your uncle both encouraged you in this ambition if it is a vain thing why pursue it i suppose such a clever man as you intend to do a great deal of good to the country by going into parliament or you would not wish to be there what are you going to do when you are in the house of commons women don't understand about politics my dear pen said sneering at himself as he spoke but why don't you make us understand i could never tell about mr pincent why he should like to be there so much he is not a clever man he certainly is not a genius pincent said pen lady diana says that he attends committees all day that then again he is at the house all night that he always votes as he is told that he never speaks that he will never get on beyond a subordinate place and as his grandmother tells him he is choked with red tape are you going to follow the same career arthur what is there in it so brilliant that you should be so eager for it i would rather that you should stop at home and write books good books kind books with gentle kind thoughts such as you have dear arthur and such as might do people good to read and if you do not win fame what then you own it is vanity and you can live very happily without it i must not pretend to advise but i take you at your own word about the world and as you own it is wicked and that it tires you ask you why you don't leave it and what would you have me do asked arthur i would have you bring your wife to fair oaks to live there and study 
and do good round about you i would like to see your own children playing on the lawn arthur and that we might pray in our mother's church again once more dear brother if the world is a temptation are we not told to pray that we may not be led into it do you think blanche would make a good wife for a petty country gentleman do you think i should become the character very well laura pen asked remember temptation walks about the hedgerows as well as the city streets and idleness is the greatest tempter of all what does does mr warrington say said laura as a blush mounted up to her cheek and of which pen saw the fervour though laura's veil fell over her face to hide it pen rode on by laura's side silently for a while george's name so mentioned brought back the past to him and the thoughts which he had once had regarding george and laura why should the recurrence of the thought agitate him now that he knew the union was impossible why should he be curious to know if during the months of their intimacy laura had felt a regard for warrington from that day until the present time george had never alluded to his story and arthur remembered now that since then george had scarcely ever mentioned laura's name at last he came close to her tell me something laura he said she put back her veil and looked at him what is it arthur she asked though from the tremor of her voice she guessed very well tell me but for george's misfortune i never knew him speak of it before or since that day would you would you have given him what you refused me yes pen she said bursting into tears he deserved you better than i did poor arthur groaned forth with an indescribable pang at his heart i am but a selfish wretch and george is better nobler truer than i am god bless him yes pen said laura reaching out her hand to her cousin and he put his arm round her and for a moment she sobbed on his shoulder the gentle girl had had her secret and told it in the widow's last journey from fair oaks when hastening with her mother to arthur's sick-bed laura had made a different confession and it was only when warrington told his own story and described the hopeless condition of his life that she discovered how much her feelings had changed and with what tender sympathy with what great respect delight and admiration she had grown to regard her cousin's friend until she knew that some plans she might have dreamed of were impossible and that warrington reading in her heart perhaps had told his melancholy story to warn her she had not asked herself whether it was possible that her affections could change and had been shocked and seared by the discovery of the truth how should she have told it to helen and confessed her shame poor laura felt guilty before her friend with a secret which she dared not confide to her felt as if she had been ungrateful for helen's love and regard felt as if she had been wickedly faithless to pen in withdrawing that love from him which he did not even care to accept humbled even and repentant before warrington lest she should have encouraged him by undue sympathy or shown the preference which she began to feel the catastrophe which broke up laura's home and the grief and anguish which she felt for her mother's death gave her little leisure for thoughts more selfish and by the time she rallied from that grief a, the minor one was also almost cured it was but for a moment that she had indulged a hope about warrington her admiration and respect for him remained as strong as ever but the tender feeling with which she knew she had regarded him was schooled into such calmness that it may be said to have been dead and passed away the pang which it left behind was one of humility and remorse oh how wicked and proud i was about arthur she thought how self-confident and unforgiving i never forgave from my heart this poor girl who was fond of him or him for encouraging her love and i have been more guilty than she poor little artless creature i professing to love one man could listen to another only too eagerly and would not pardon the change of feelings in arthur whilst i myself was changing and unfaithful and so humiliating herself and acknowledging her weakness the poor girl sought for strength and refuge in the manner in which she had been accustomed to look for them she had done no wrong but there are some folks who suffer for a fault ever so trifling as much as others whose stout consciences can walk under crimes of almost any weight and poor laura chose to fancy that she had acted in this delicate juncture of her life as a very great criminal she determined that she had done pen a great injury by withdrawing that love which privately in her mother's hearing she had bestowed upon him that she had been ungrateful to her dead benefactress by ever allowing herself to think of another or of violating her promise 
and that considering her own enormous crime she ought to be very gentle in judging those of others whose temptations were much greater very likely and whose motives she could not understand a year back laura would have been indignant at the idea that arthur should marry blanche and her high spirit would have risen as she thought that from worldly motives he should stoop to one so unworthy now when the news was brought to her of such a chance the intelligence was given to her by old lady rockminster whose speeches were as direct and rapid as a slap on the face the humbled girl winced a little at the blow but bore it meekly and with a desperate acquiescence he has a right to marry he knows a great deal more of the world than i do she argued with herself blanche may not be so light-minded as she seemed and who am i to be her judge i dare say it is very good that arthur should go into parliament and distinguish himself and my duty is to do everything that lies in my power to aid him and blanche and to make his home happy i dare say i shall live with them if i am godmother to one of their children i will leave her my three thousand pounds and forthwith she began to think what she could give blanche out of her small treasures and how best to conciliate her affection she wrote her forthwith a kind letter in which of course no mention was made of the plans in contemplation but in which laura recalled old times and spoke her good will and in reply to this she received an eager answer from blanche in which not a word about marriage was said to be sure but mr pendennis was mentioned two or three times in the letter and they were to be henceforth dearest laura and dearest blanche and loving sisters and so forth when pen and laura reached home after laura's confession pen's noble acknowledgment of his own inferiority and generous expression of love for warrington causing the girl's heart to throb and rendering doubly keen those tears which she sobbed on his shoulder a little slim letter was awaiting miss bell in the hall which she trembled rather guiltily as she unsealed in which pen blushed as he recognized for he saw instantly that it was from blanche laura opened it hastily and cast her eyes quickly over it as pen kept his fixed on her blushing she dates from london laura said she has been with old bonner lady clavering's maid bonner's going to marry lightfoot the butler where do you think blanche has been she cried out eagerly to paris to scotland to the casino to shepherd's inn to see fanny but fanny wasn't there and blanche is going to leave a present for her isn't it kind of her and thoughtful and she handed the letter to pen who read i saw madame mere who was scrubbing the room and looked at me with very scrubby looks but la belle fanny was not o loges and as i heard that she was in captain strong's apartments bonner and i mounted o troisieme to see this famous beauty another disappointment only the chevalier strong and a friend of his in the room so we came away after all without seeing the enchanting fanny je t'envoie mille et mille baiser when will that horrid canvassing be over sleeves are worn etc 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 after dinner the doctor was reading the times a young gentleman i attended when he was here some eight or nine years ago has come into a fine fortune the doctor said i see here announced the death of john henry foker esq of logwood hall at pau in the pyrenees on the fifteenth last month end of chapter sixty seven chapter sixty eight of the history of pendennis this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the history of pendennis by william makepeace thackeray chapter sixty eight in which the major is bidden to stand and deliver any gentleman who has frequented the wheel of fortune public house where it may be remembered that mr james morgan's club was held and where sir francis clavering had an interview with major pendennis is aware that there are three rooms for guests upon the ground floor besides the bar where the landlady sits one is a parlour frequented by the public at large to another room gentlemen in livery resort and the third apartment on the door of which private is painted is that hired by the club of the confidentials of which messrs morgan and lightfoot were members the noiseless morgan had listened to the conversation between strong and major pendennis 
at the latter's own lodgings and had carried away from it matter for much private speculation and a desire of knowledge had led him to follow his master when the major came to the wheel of fortune and to take his place quietly in the confidential room whilst pendennis and clavering had their discourse in the parlour there was a particular corner in the confidential room from which you could hear almost all that passed in the next apartment and as the conversation between the two gentlemen there was rather angry and carried on in a high key morgan had the benefit of overhearing almost the whole of it and what he heard strengthened the conclusions which his mind had previously formed he knew altamont at once did he when he saw him in sydney clavering ain't no more married to my lady than i am altamont's the man altamont's a convict young harther comes into parliament and the governor promises not to split by jove what a sly old rogue it is that old governor no wonder he's anxious to make the match between blanche and harther while well, she'll have a hundred thousand if she's a penny and bring her man a seat in parliament into the bargain nobody saw but a physiognomist would have liked to behold the expression of mr morgan's countenance when this astounding intelligence was made clear to him before my hage and the confounded prejudices of society he said surveying himself in the glass dammy james morgan you might marry her yourself but if he could not marry miss blanche and her fortune morgan thought he could mend his own by the possession of this information and that it might be productive of benefit to him from very many sources of all the persons whom the secret affected the greater number would not like to have it known for instance sir francis clavering whose fortune it involved would wish to keep it quiet colonel altamont whose neck it implicated would naturally be desirous to hush it and that young hupstart beast mr harther who was for getting into parliament on the strength of it and was as proud as if he was a duke with half a million a year such we grieve to say was morgan's opinion of his employer's nephew would pay anything sooner than let the world know that he was married to a convict's daughter and had got his seat in parliament by trafficking with this secret as for lady c morgan thought if she's tired of clavering and wants to get rid of him she'll pay if she's frightened about her son and fond of the little beggar she'll pay all the same and miss blanche will certainly come down handsome to the man who will put her into her rights which she was unjustly defrauded of them and no mistake dammy concluded the valet reflecting upon this wonderful hand which luck had given him to play with such cards as these james morgan you are a made man it may be a regular enmity to me every one of em must subscribe and with what i've made already i may cut business give my old governor warning turn gentleman and have a servant of my own begad entertaining himself with calculations such as these that were not a little likely to perturb a man's spirit mr morgan showed a very great degree of self-command by appearing and being calm and by not allowing his future prospects in any way to interfere with his present duties one of the persons whom the story chiefly concerned colonel altamont was absent from london when morgan was thus made acquainted with his history the valet knew of sir francis clavering's shepherd's inn haunt and walked thither an hour or two after the baronet and pendennis had had their conversation together but that bird was flown colonel altamont had received his derby winnings and was gone to the continent the fact of his absence was exceedingly vexatious to mr morgan he'll drop all that money at the gambling shops on the rhine thought morgan and i might have had a good bit of it it's confounded annoying to think he's gone and couldn't have waited a few days longer hope triumphant or deferred ambition or disappointment victory or patient ambush 
morgan bore all alike with similar equable countenance until the proper day came the major's boots were varnished and his hair was curled his early cup of tea was brought to his bedside his oaths rebukes and senile satire borne with silent obsequious fidelity who would think to see him waiting upon his master packing and shouldering his trunks and occasionally assisting at table at the country houses where he might be staying that morgan was richer than his employer and knew his secrets and other people's in the profession mr morgan was greatly respected and admired and his reputation for wealth and wisdom got him much renown at most supper tables the younger gentleman voted him stupid a feller of no ideas and a fogey in a word but not one of them would not say amen to the heartfelt prayer which some of the most serious-minded among the gentlemen uttered when i die may i cut up as well as morgan pendennis as became a man of fashion major pendennis spent the autumn passing from house to house of such country friends as were at home to receive him and if the duke happened to be abroad the marquis in scotland condescending to sojourn with sir john or the plain squire to say the truth the old gentleman's reputation was somewhat on the wane many of the men of his time had died out and the occupants of their halls and the present wearers of their titles knew not major pendennis and little cared for his traditions of the wild prince and poins and of the heroes of fashion passed away it must have struck the good man with melancholy as he walked by many a london door to think how seldom it was now opened for him and how often he used to knock at it to what banquets and welcome he used to pass through it a score of years back he began to own that he was no longer of the present age and dimly to apprehend that the young men laughed at him such melancholy musings must come across many a pell-mell philosopher the men thinks he are not such as they used to be in his time the old grand manner and courtly grace of life are gone what is castlewood house and the present castlewood compared to the magnificence of the old mansion and owner the late lord came to london with fort post-chaises and sixteen horses all the north road hurried out to look at his cavalcade the people in london streets even stopped as his procession passed them the present lord travels with five bagmen in a railway carriage and sneaks away from the station smoking a cigar in a broom the late lord in autumn filled castlewood with company who drank claret till midnight the present man buries himself in a hut on a scotch mountain and passes november in two or three closets in an entresol at paris where his amusements are a dinner at a cafe and a box at a little theatre what a contrast there is between his lady lorraine the regent's lady lorraine and her little ladyship of the present era he figures to himself the first beautiful gorgeous magnificent in diamonds and velvets daring in rouge the wits of the world the old wits the old polished gentlemen not the canaille of to-day with their language of the cab stand and their coats smelling of smoke bowing at her feet and then thinks of to-day's lady lorraine a little woman in a black silk gown like a governess who talks astronomy and labouring classes and emigration and the deuce knows what and lurks to church at eight o'clock in the morning abbot's lorraine that used to be the noblest house in the county is turned into a monastery a regular la trappe they don't drink two glasses of wine after dinner and every other man at table is a country curate with a white neckcloth whose talk is about polly higson's progress at school or widow watkins's lumbago and the other young men those lounging guardsmen and great lazy dandies sprawling over sofas and billiard tables and stealing off to smoke pipes in each other's bedrooms caring for nothing reverencing nothing not even an old gentleman who has known their fathers and their betters not even a pretty woman what a difference there is between these men who poison the very turnips and stubble fields with their tobacco and the gentlemen of our time thanks the major the breed is gone there's no use for em they're replaced by a parcel of damned cotton spinners and utilitarians and young sprigs of parsons with their hair combed down their barks 
i'm getting old they're getting past me they laugh at us old boys thought old pendennis and he was not far wrong the times and manners which he admired were pretty nearly gone the gay young men larked him irreverently whilst the serious youth had a grave pity and wonder at him which would have been even more painful to bear had the old gentleman been aware of its extent but he was rather simple his examination of moral questions had never been very deep it had never struck him perhaps until very lately that he was otherwise than a most respectable and rather fortunate man is there no old age but his without reverence did youthful folly never jeer at other ball pates for the past two or three years he had begun to perceive that his day was well nigh over and that the men of the new time had begun to reign after a rather unsuccessful autumn season then during which he was faithfully followed by mr morgan his nephew arthur being engaged as we have seen at clavering it happened that major pendennis came back for a while to london at the dismal end of october when the fogs and the lawyers come to town who has not looked with interest at those loaded cabs piled boxes and crowded children rattling through the streets on the dun october evenings stopping at the dark houses where they discharge nurse and infant girls matron and father whose holidays are over yesterday it was france and sunshine or broad stairs and liberty to-day comes work and a yellow fog and ye gods what a heap of bills there lies in master's study and the clerk has brought the lawyer's papers from chambers and in half an hour the literary man knows that the printer's boy will be in the passage and mr smith with that little account that particular little account has called presentient of your arrival and has left word that he will call to-morrow morning at ten who amongst us has not said good-bye to his holiday returned to dun london and his fate surveyed his labours and liabilities laid out before him and been aware of that inevitable little account to settle smith and his little account in the morning symbolized duty difficulty struggle which you will meet let us hope friend with a manly and honest heart and you think of him as the children are slumbering once more in their own beds and the watchful housewife tenderly pretends to sleep old pendennis had no special labours or bills to encounter on the morrow as he had no affection at home to soothe him he had always money in his desk sufficient for his wants and being by nature and habit tolerably indifferent to the wants of other people these latter were not likely to disturb him but a gentleman may be out of temper though he does not owe a shilling and though he may be ever so selfish he must occasionally feel dispirited and lonely he had had two or three twinges of gout in the country house where he had been staying the birds were wild and shy and the walking over the ploughed fields had fatigued him deucedly the young men had laughed at him and he had been peevish at table once or twice he had not been able to get his whist of an evening and in fine was glad to come away in all his dealings with morgan his valet he had been exceedingly sulky and discontented he had sworn at him and abused him for many days past he had scalded his mouth with bad soup at swindon he had left his umbrella in the railroad carriage at which piece of forgetfulness he was in such a rage that he cursed morgan more freely than ever both the chimneys smoked furiously in his lodgings and when he caused the windows to be flung open he swore so acrimoniously that morgan was inclined to fling him out of window too through that open casement the valet swore after his master as pendennis went down the street on his way to the club bases was not at all pleasant the house had been new painted and smelt of varnish and turpentine and a large streak of white paint inflicted itself on the back of the old boy's fur-collared surtout the dinner was not good and the three most odious men in all london old hawkshaw whose cough and accompaniments are fit to make any man uncomfortable old colonel gripley who seizes on all the newspapers and that irreclaimable old boar jawkins who would come and dine at the next table to pendennis and describe to him every inn bill which he had paid in his foreign tour each and all of these disagreeable personages and incidents had contributed to make major pendennis miserable and the club waiter trod on his toe as he brought him his coffee never alone appear the immortals the furies always hunt in company they pursued pendennis from home to the club and from the club home whilst the major was absent from his lodgings morgan had been seated in the landlady's parlour drinking freely of hot brandy and water and pouring out on mrs brixham some of the abuse which he had received from his master upstairs mrs brixham was mr morgan's slave he was his landlady's landlord he had 
bought the lease of the house which she rented he had got her name and her son's two acceptances and a bill of sale which made him master of the luckless widow's furniture the young brixham was a clerk in an insurance office and morgan could put him into what he called quod any day mrs brixham was a clergyman's widow and mr morgan after performing his duties on the first floor had a pleasure in making the old lady fetch him his boot jack and his slippers she was his slave the little black profiles of her son and daughter the very picture of tittlecott church where she was married and her poor dear brixham lived and died was now morgan's property as it hung there over the mantelpiece of his back parlour morgan sat in the widow's back room in the ex-curate's old horsehair study chair making mrs brixham bring supper for him and fill his glass again and again the liquor was bought with the poor woman's own coin and hence morgan indulged in it only the more freely and he had eaten his supper and was drinking a third tumbler when old pendennis returned from the club and went upstairs to his rooms mr morgan swore very savagely at him and his bell when he heard the latter and finished his tumbler of brandy before he went up to answer the summons he received the abuse consequent on this delay in silence nor did the major condescend to read in the flushed face and glaring eyes of the man the anger under which he was labouring the old gentleman's footbath was at the fire his gown and slippers awaiting him there morgan knelt down to take his boots off with due subordination and as the major abused him from above kept up a growl of maledictions below at his feet thus when pendennis was crying confound you sir mind that strap curse you don't wrench my foot off morgan sotto voce below was expressing a wish to strangle him drown him and punch his head off the boots removed it became necessary to divest mr pendennis of his coat and for this purpose the valet had necessarily to approach very near to his employer so near that pendennis could not but perceive what mr morgan's late occupation had been to which he adverted in that simple and forcible phraseology which men are sometimes in the habit of using to their domestics informing morgan that he was a drunken beast and that he smelt of brandy at this the man broke out losing patience and flinging up all subordination i'm drunk am i i'm a beast am i i'm darned am i you infernal old miscreant shall i wring your old head off and drown dear in that pail of water do you think i'm a goin to bear your confounded old harrogance you old wigsby chatter your old hiveries at me do you you grinning old baboon come on if you are a man and can stand to a man ha you coward knives knives if you advance a step i'll send it in to you said the major seizing up a knife that was on the table near him go downstairs you drunken brute and leave the house send for your book and your wages in the morning and never let me see your insolent face again this darned impertinence of yours has been growing for some months past you have been growing too rich you are not fit for service get out of it and out of the house and where would you wish me to go pray out of the ouse asked the man and won't it be equal convenient to-morrow morning to de fay mames shows sive play mun sir silence you beast and go cried out the major morgan began to laugh with a rather sinister laugh look yere pendennis he said seating himself since i've been in this room you've called me beast brute dog and darn me haven't you how do you suppose one man likes that sort of talk from another how many years have i waited on you and how many dams and cusses have you given me along with my wages do you think a man's a dog that you can talk to him in this way if i choose to drink a little why shouldn't i i've seen many a gentleman drunk formerly and perhaps have a, a bit from them i ain't a-goin to leave this house old feller and shall i tell you why the house is my house every stick of furniture in it is mine except your old traps and your shower-bath and your wig-box i've bought the place i tell you with my own industry and perseverance i can show a hundred pound where you can show a fifty or your damned supercellious nephew either i've served you honourable done everything for you these dozen years and i'm a dog am i i'm a beast am i that's the language for gentlemen not for our rank but i'll bear it no more i throw up your service i'm tired on it i've combed your old wig and buckled your old girths and waistbands long enough i tell you don't look savage at me i'm sitting in my own chair in my own room a tellin the truth to you i'll be your beast and your brute and your dog no more major pendennis alf pay 
the fury of the old gentleman met by the servant's abrupt revolt had been shocked and cooled by the concussion as much as if a sudden shower bath or a pail of cold water had been flung upon him that effect produced and his anger calmed morgan's speech had interested him and he rather respected his adversary and his courage in facing him as of old days in the fencing-room he would have admired the opponent who hit him you are no longer my servant the major said and the house may be yours but the lodgings are mine and you will have the goodness to leave them to-morrow morning when we have settled our accounts i shall remove into other quarters in the meantime i desire to go to bed and have not the slightest wish for your further company we'll have a settlement don't you be afraid morgan said getting up from his chair i ain't done with you yet nor with your family nor with the clavering family major pendennis and that you shall know have the goodness to leave the room sir i'm tired said the major ha ah, you'll be more tired of me afore you've done answered the man with a sneer and walked out of the room leaving the major to compose himself as best he might after the agitation of this extraordinary scene he sat amused by his fireside over the past events and the confounded impudence and ingratitude of servants and thought how he should get a new man how devilish unpleasant it was for a man of his age and with his habits to part with a fellow to whom he had been accustomed how morgan had a receipt for boot varnish which was incomparably better and more comfortable to the feet than any he had ever tried how very well he made mutton broth and tended him when he was unwell gad it is a hard thing to lose a fellow of that sort but he must go thought the major he has grown rich and impudent since he has grown rich he was horribly tipsy and abusive to-night we must part and i must go out of the lodgings damn me i like the lodgings i'm used to em it's very unpleasant at my time of life to change my quarters and so on mused the old gentleman the shower-bath had done him good the testiness was gone the loss of the umbrella the smell of paint at the club were forgotten under the superior excitement confound the insolent villain thought the old gentleman he understood my wants to a nicety he was the best servant in england he thought about a servant as a man thinks of a horse that has carried him long and well and that has come down with him and is safe no longer how the deuce to replace him where can he get such another animal in these melancholy cogitations the major who had donned his own dressing-gown and replaced his head of hair a little grey had been introduced into the coiffure of late by mr truefit which had given the major's head the most artless and respectable appearance in these cogitations we say the major who had taken off his wig and put on his night handkerchief sat absorbed by the fireside when a feeble knock came at his door which was presently opened by the landlady of the lodgings god bless my soul mrs brixham cried out the major startled that a lady should be holding in the simple apparel of his night toilet it it's very late mrs brixham i wish i might speak to you sir said the landlady very piteously about morgan i suppose he has cooled himself at the pump can't take him back mrs brixham impossible i'd determined to part with him before when i heard of his dealings in the discount business i suppose you've heard of em mrs brixham my servants a capitalist begat oh sir said mrs brixham i know it to my cost i borrowed from him a little money five years ago and though i have paid him many times over i am entirely in his power i am ruined by him sir everything i had is his he's a dreadful man a eh, mrs brixham two p devilish sorry for you and that i must quit your house after lodging here so long there's no help for it i must go he says we must all go sir sobbed out the luckless widow he came downstairs from you just now he had been drinking and it always makes him very wicked and he said that you had insulted him sir and treated him like a dog and spoken to him unkindly and he swore he would be revenged and and i owe him a hundred and twenty pounds sir and he has a bill of sale of all my furniture and says he will turn me out of my house and send my poor george to prison he has been the ruin of my family that man devilish sorry mrs brixham pray take a chair what can i do could you not intercede with him for us george will give half his allowance my daughter can send something if you will but stay on sir and pay a quarter's rent in advance my good madam i would as soon give you a quarter in advance as not if i were going to stay in the lodgings but i can't and i can't afford to fling away twenty pounds my good madam i'm a poor half-pay officer and want every shilling i have begad as far as a few pounds goes say five pounds i don't say and shall be most happy in that sort of thing and i'll give it you in the morning with pleasure but but it's getting late and i have made a railroad journey god's will be done sir said the poor woman drying her tears i must bear my fate 
and a devilish hard one it is and most sincerely i pity you mrs brixham i i'll say ten pounds if you will permit me good night mr morgan sir when he came downstairs and when when i besought him to have pity on me and told him he had been the ruin of my family said something which i did not well understand that he would ruin every family in the house that he knew something would bring you down to and that you should pay him for your your insolence to him i i must own to you that i went down on my knees to him sir and he said with a dreadful oath against you that he would have you on your knees me by gad that is too pleasant where is the confounded fellow he went away sir he said he should see you in the morning oh pray try and pacify him and save me and my poor boy and the widow went away with this prayer to pass her night as she might and look for the dreadful morrow the last words about himself excited major pendennis so much that his compassion for mrs brixham's misfortunes was quite forgotten in the consideration of his own case me on my knees thought he as he got into bed confound his impudence who ever saw me on my knees what the devil does the fellow know gad i've not had an affair these twenty years i defy him and the old campaigner turned round and slept pretty sound being rather excited and amused by the events of the day the last day in berry street he was determined it should be for it's impossible to stay on with a valet over me and a bankrupt landlady what good can i do this poor devil of a woman i'll give her twenty pounds there's warrington's twenty pound which he has just paid but what's the use she'll want more and more and more and that cormorant morgan will swallow all no damn me i can't afford to know poor people and to-morrow i'll say good-bye to mrs brixham and mr morgan End of chapter sixty eight chapter sixty nine of the history of pendennis this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the history of pendennis by william makepeace thackeray chapter sixty nine in which the major neither yields his money nor his life early next morning pendennis's shutters were opened by morgan who appeared as usual with a face perfectly grave and respectful bearing with him the old gentleman's clothes cans of water and elaborate toilet requisites it's you is it said the old fellow from his bed i shan't take you back again you understand i have not the least wish to be took back again major pendennis mr morgan said with grave dignity nor to serve you nor any man but as i wish you to be comfortable as long as you stay in my house i came up to do what's necessary and once more and for the last time mr james morgan laid out the silver dressing-case and strapped the shining razor these offices concluded he addressed himself to the major with an indescribable solemnity and said thinkin that you would most likely be in want of a respectable person until you suited yourself i spoke to a young man last night who is ear indeed said the warrior in the tent bed he have lived in the fuss families and i can vouch for his respectability you are monstrous polite grinned the old major and the truth is that after the occurrences of the previous evening morgan had gone out to his own club at the wheel of fortune and there finding frosh a courier and valet just returned from a foreign tour with young lord cubley and for the present disposable had represented to mr frosh that he morgan had a devil of a blow hup with his own governor and was going to retire from the business hall together and that if frosh wanted a temporary job he might probably have it by applying in berry street you're very polite said the major and your recommendation i'm sure will have every weight morgan blushed he felt his master was a chafin of him the man have awaited on you before sir he said with great dignity lord de la pole sir gave him to his nephew young lord cubley and he have been with him on his foreign tour and not wishing to go to fitzers castle which frosh's chest is delicate and he cannot bear the cold in scotland he is free to serve you or not as you choose 
i repeat sir that you are exceedingly polite said the major come in frosh you will do very well mr morgan will you have the kindness to i shall show him what is necessary sir and what is customary for you to wish to have done will you please to take breakfast ere or at the club major pendennis with your kind permission i will breakfast here and afterwards we will make our little arrangements if you please sir will you now oblige me by leaving the room morgan withdrew the excessive politeness of his ex-employer made him almost as angry as the major's bitterest words and whilst the old gentleman is making his mysterious toilet we will also modestly retire after breakfast major pendennis and his new aide-de-camp occupied themselves in preparing for their departure the establishment of the old bachelor was not very complicated he encumbered himself with no useless wardrobe a bible his mother's a road-book pen's novel calf elegant and the duke of wellington's dispatches with a few prints maps and portraits of that illustrious general and of various sovereigns and consorts of this country and of the general under whom major pendennis had served in india formed his literary and artistical collection he was always ready to march at a few hours notice and the cases in which he had brought his property into his lodgings some fifteen years before were still in the lofts amply sufficient to receive all his goods these the young woman who did the work of the house and who was known by the name of betty to her mistress and of slavey to mr morgan brought down from their resting-place and obediently dusted and cleaned under the eyes of the terrible morgan his demeanour was guarded and solemn he had spoken no word as yet to mrs brixham respecting his threats of the past night but he looked as if he would execute them and the poor widow tremblingly awaited her fate old pendennis armed with his cane superintended the package of his goods and chattels under the hands of mr frosh and the slavey burned such of his papers as he did not care to keep flung open doors and closets until they were all empty and now all boxes and chests were closed except his desk which was ready to receive the final accounts of mr morgan that individual now made his appearance and brought his books as i wish to speak to you in private perhaps you will have the kindness to request frosh to step downstairs he said on entering bring a couple of cabs frosh if you please and wait downstairs until i ring for you said the major morgan saw frosh downstairs watched him go along the street upon his errand and produced his books and accounts which were simple and very easily settled and now sir said he having pocketed the cheque which his ex-employer gave him and signed his name to his book with a flourish and now that accounts is closed between us sir he said i porpoise to speak to you as one man to another morgan liked the sound of his own voice and as an individual indulged in public speaking whenever he could get an opportunity at the club or the housekeeper's room and i must tell you that i am in possession of certain information and may i inquire of what nature pray asked the major it's valuable information major pendennis as you know very well i know of a marriage as is no marriage of a honourable baronet as is no more married than i am in which his wife is married to somebody else as you know too sir pendennis at once understood all ha ah, this accounts for your behaviour you have been listening at the door sir i suppose said the major looking very haughty i forgot to look at the keyhole when i went to that public-house i might have suspected what sort of a person was behind it i may have my schemes as you may have yours i suppose answered morgan i may get my information and i may act on that information and i may find that information valuable as anybody else may a poor servant may have a bit of luck as well as a gentleman mayn't he don't you be putting on your audy looks sir and come in the aristocrat over me that's all gammon with me i'm an englishman i am and as good as you to what the devil does this tend sir and how does the secret which you have surprised concern me i should like to know asked major pendennis with great majesty how does it concern me indeed how grand we are how does it concern my nephew i wonder 
how does it concern my nephew seedham parliament and to sorbonnation of bigamy how does it concern that what are you to be the only man to have a secret and to trade on it why shouldn't i go halves major pendennis i found it out too look here i ain't going to be unreasonable with you make it worth my while and i'll keep the thing close let up mr arthur take his seat and his rich wife if you like i don't want to marry her but i will have my share as sure as my name's james morgan and if i don't and if you don't sir what pendennis asked if i don't i split and tell all i smash clavering and have him and his wife up for bigamy so help me i will i smash young hopeful's marriage and i show up you and him as making use of this secret in order to squeeze a seat in parliament out of sir francis and a fortune out of his wife mr pendennis knows no more of this business than the babe unborn sir cried the major aghast no more than lady clavering than miss amory does tell that to the marines major replied the valet that cock won't fight with me do you doubt my word you villain no bad language i don't care one tuppence a penny whether your word's true or not i tell you i intend this to be a nice little annuity to me major for i have every one of you and i ain't such a fool as to let you go i should say that you might make it five hundred a year to me among you easy pay me down the first quarter now and i'm as mum as a mouse just give a note for one twenty-five there's your cheque-book on your desk and there's this too you villain cried the old gentleman in the desk to which the valet pointed was a little double-barrelled pistol which had belonged to van dennis's old patron the indian commander-in-chief and which had accompanied him in many a campaign one more word you scoundrel and i'll shoot you like a mad dog stop by jove i'll do it now you'll assault me will you you'll strike at an old man will you you lying coward kneel down and say your prayers sir for by the lord you shall die the major's face glared with rage at his adversary who looked terrified before him for a moment and at the next with a shriek of murder sprang towards the open window under which a policeman happened to be on his beat murder police bellowed mr morgan to his surprise major pendennis wheeled away the table and walked to the other window which was also open he beckoned the policeman come up here policeman he said and then went and placed himself against the door you miserable sneak he said to morgan the pistol hasn't been loaded these fifteen years as you would have known very well if you had not been such a coward that policeman is coming and i will have him up and have your trunks searched i have reason to believe that you are a thief sir i know you are i'll swear to the things you gave em to me you gave em to me cried morgan the major laughed we'll see he said and the guilty valet remembered some fine lawn fronted shirts a certain gold-headed cane an opera-glass which he had forgotten to bring down and of which he had assumed the use along with certain articles of his master's clothes which the old dandy neither wore nor asked for policeman x entered followed by the seared mrs brixham and her maid of all work who had been at the door and found some difficulty in closing it against the street amateurs who wished to see the row the major began instantly to speak i have had occasion to discharge this drunken scoundrel he said both last night and this morning he insulted and assaulted me i am an old man and took up a pistol you see it is not loaded and this coward cried out before he was hurt i am glad you are come i was charging him with taking my property and desired to examine his trunks and his room the velvet cloak you ain't worn these three years nor the waistcoats and i thought i might take the shirts and i i take my hoath i intended to put back the hopper glass roared morgan writhing with rage and terror the man acknowledges that he is a thief the major said calmly he has been in my service for years and i have treated him with every kindness and confidence we will go upstairs and examine his trunks in those trunks mr morgan had things which he would fain keep from public eyes mr morgan the bill discounter gave goods as well as money to his customers he provided young spendthrifts with snuff-boxes and pins and jewels and pictures and cigars and of a very doubtful quality those cigars and jewels and pictures were their display at a police office the discovery of his occult profession and the exposure of the major's property which he had appropriated indeed rather than stolen would not have added to the reputation of mr morgan he looked a piteous image of terror and discomfiture 
he'll smash me willie thought the major i'll crush him now and finish with him but he paused he looked at poor mrs brixham's scared face and he thought for a moment to himself that the man brought to bay and in prison might make disclosures which had best be kept secret and that it was best not to deal too fiercely with a desperate man stop he said policeman i'll speak with this man by himself do you give mr morgan in charge said the policeman i've brought no charges yet the major said with a significant look at his man thank you sir whispered morgan very low go outside the door and wait there policeman if you please now morgan you have played one game with me and you have not had the best of it my good man no begad you've not had the best of it though you had the best hand and you've got to pay too now you scoundrel yes sir said the man i've only found out within the last week the game which you have been driving you villain young de boots of the blues recognized you as the man who came to barracks and did business one-third in money one-third in eau de cologne and one-third in french prince you confounded demure old sinner i didn't miss anything or care a straw what you've taken you booby but i took this shot and it hit hit the bull's eye begad dammy six i'm an old campaigner what do you want with me sir i'll tell you your bills i suppose you keep about you in that demmed great leather pocket-book don't you you'll burn mrs brixham's bill sir i ain't a goin to part with my property growled the man you lent her sixty pounds five years ago she and that poor devil of an insurance clerk her son have paid you fifty pounds a year ever since and you have got a bill of sale for her furniture and her note of hand for a hundred and fifty pounds she told me so last night by jove sir you've bled that poor woman enough i won't give it up said morgan if i do i'm policeman cried the major you shall have the bill said morgan you're not going to take money of me and you a gentleman i shall want you directly said the major to x who here entered and who again withdrew no my good sir the old gentleman continued i have not any desire to have further pecuniary transactions with you but we will draw out a little paper which you will have the kindness to sign no stop you shall write it you have improved immensely in writing of late and have now a very good hand you shall sit down and write if you please there at that table so let me see we may as well have the date right berry street st james's october twenty one eighteen blank and mr morgan wrote as he was instructed and as the pitiless old major continued i james morgan having come in extreme poverty into the service of arthur pendennis esq of berry street st james's a major in her majesty's service acknowledge that i received liberal wages and board wages from my employer during fifteen years you can't object to that i am sure said the major during fifteen years wrote morgan in which time by my own care and prudence the dictator resumed i've managed to amass sufficient money to purchase the house in which my master resides and besides to effect other savings amongst other persons from whom i have had money i may mention my present tenant mrs brixham who in consideration of sixty pounds advanced by me five years since has paid back to me the sum of two hundred and fifty pounds sterling besides giving me a note of hand for one hundred and twenty pounds which i restore to her at the desire of my late master major arthur pendennis and therewith free her furniture of which i had a bill of sale have you written i think if this pistol was loaded i'd blow your brains out said morgan no you wouldn't you have too great a respect for your valuable life my good man the major answered let us go on and begin a new sentence and having in return for my master's kindness stolen his property from him which i acknowledge to be now upstairs in my trunks and having uttered falsehoods regarding his and other honourable families i do hereby in consideration of his clemency to me express my regret for uttering these falsehoods and for stealing his property and declare that i am not worthy of belief and that i hope yes begad that i hope to amend for the future signed james morgan i'm durned if i sign it said morgan my good man it will happen to you whether you sign or no begad said the old fellow chuckling at his own wit there i shall not use this you understand unless unless i am compelled to do so mrs brixham and our friend the policeman will witness it i dare say without reading it 
and i will give the old lady back her note of hand and say which you will confirm that she and you are quits i see there is frosh come back with the cab for my trunks i shall go to an hotel you may come in now policeman mr morgan and i have arranged our little dispute if mrs brixham will sign this paper and you policeman will do so i shall be very much obliged to you both mrs brixham you and your worthy landlord mr morgan are quits i wish you joy of him let frosh come and pack the rest of the things frosh aided by the slavey under the calm superintendence of mr morgan carried major pendennis's boxes to the cabs in waiting and mrs brixham when her persecutor was not by came and asked a heaven's blessing upon the major her preserver and the best and quietest and kindest of lodgers and having given her a finger to shake which the humble lady received with a curtsey and over which she was ready to make a speech full of tears the major cut short that valedictory oration and walked out of the house to the hotel in jermyn street which was not many steps from morgan's door that individual looking forth from the parlour window discharged anything but blessings at his parting guest but the stout old boy could afford not to be frightened at mr morgan and flung him a look of great contempt and humour as he strutted away with his cane major pendennis had not quitted his house of berry street many hours and mr morgan was enjoying his odium in a dignified manner surveying the evening fog and smoking a cigar on the doorsteps when arthur pendennis esq the hero of this history made his appearance at the well-known door my uncle out i suppose morgan he said to the functionary knowing full well that to smoke was treason in the presence of the major major pendennis is out sir said morgan with gravity bowing but not touching the elegant cap which he wore major pendennis have left this house to-day sir and i have no longer the honour of being in his service sir indeed and where is he i believe he have taken temporary lodgings at cox's hotel in jummin street said mr morgan and added after a pause are you in town for some time pray sir are you in chambers i should like to have the honour of waiting on you there and would be thankful if you would favour me with a quarter of an hour do you want my uncle to take you back asked arthur insolent and good-natured i want no such thing i'd see him the man glared at him for a minute but he stopped no sir thank you he said in a softer voice it's only with you that i wish to speak on some business which concerns you and perhaps you would favour me by walking into my house if it is but for a minute or two i will listen to you morgan said arthur and thought to himself i suppose the fellow wants me to patronize him and he entered the house card was already in the front windows proclaiming that apartments were to be let and having introduced mr pendennis into the dining-room and offered him a chair mr morgan took one himself and proceeded to convey some information to him of which the reader has already had cognizance End of chapter sixty nine chapter seventy of the history of pendennis this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the history of pendennis by william makepeace thackeray chapter seventy in which pendennis counts his eggs our friend had arrived in london on that day only though but for a brief visit and having left some fellow-travellers at an hotel to which he had convoyed them from the west he hastened to the chambers in lamb court which were basking in as much sun as chose to visit that dreary but not altogether comfortless building freedom stands in lieu of sunshine in chambers and templars grumble but take their ease in their inn penn's domestic announced to him that warrington was in chambers too and of course arthur ran up to his friend's room straightway and found it as of old perfumed with the pipe and george once more at work with his newspapers and reviews the pair greeted each other with the rough cordiality which young englishmen use one to another and which carries a great deal of warmth and kindness under its rude exterior warrington smiled and took his pipe out of his mouth and said well young one penn advanced and held out his hand and said how are you old boy and so this greeting passed between two friends who had not seen each other for months 
alphonse and frederick would have rushed into each other's arms and shrieked ce bon coeur ce cher alphonse over each other's shoulders max and wilhelm would have bestowed half a dozen kisses scented with havana upon each other's mustachios well young one how are you old boy is what two britons say after saving each other's lives possibly the day before to-morrow they will leave off shaking hands and only wag their heads at one another as they come to breakfast each has for the other the very warmest confidence and regard each would share his purse with the other and hearing him attacked would break out in the loudest and most enthusiastic praise of his friend but they part with a mere good-bye they meet with a mere how do you do and they don't write to each other in the interval curious modesty strange stoical decorum of english friendship yes we are not demonstrative like those confounded foreigners says hardman who not only shows no friendship but never felt any all his life long been in switzerland says penn yes says warrington couldn't find a bit of tobacco fit to smoke till we came to strasbourg where i got some capital the man's mind is full very likely of the great sights which he has seen of the great emotions with which the vast works of nature have inspired it but his enthusiasm is too coy to show itself even to his closest friend and he veils it with a cloud of tobacco he will speak more fully of confidential evenings however and write ardently and frankly about that which he is shy of saying the thoughts and experience of his travel will come forth in his writings as the learning which he never displays in talk enriches his style with pregnant allusion and brilliant illustration colors his generous eloquence and points his wit the elder gives a rapid account of the places which he has visited in his tour he has seen switzerland north italy and the tyrol he has come home by vienna and dresden and the rhine he speaks about these places in a shy sulky voice as if he had rather not mention them at all and as if the sight of them had rendered him very unhappy the outline of the elder man's tour thus gloomily sketched out the young one begins to speak he has been in the country very much bored canvassing uncommonly slow he is here for a day or two and going on to to the neighbourhood of tunbridge wells to some friends that will be uncommonly slow too how hard it is to make an englishman acknowledge that he is happy and the seat in parliament pen have you made it all right asked warrington all right as soon as parliament meets and a new writ can be issued clavering retires and i step into his shoes says pen and under which king does bazonian speaker die asked warrington do we come out as liberal conservative or as government man or on our own hook hem there are no politics now every man's politics at least are pretty much the same i've not got acres enough to make me a protectionist nor could i be one i think if i had all the land in the county i shall go pretty much with government and in advance of them upon some social questions which i have been getting up during the vacation don't grin you old cynic i've been getting up the blue books and intend to come out rather strong on the sanitary and colonization questions we reserve to ourselves the liberty of voting against government though we are generally friendly we are however friends of the people avant tout we give lectures at the clavering institute and shake hands with the intelligent mechanics we think the franchise ought to be very considerably enlarged at the same time we are free to accept office some day when the house has listened to a few crack speeches from us and the administration perceives our merit i'm not moses said pen with as usual somewhat of melancholy in his voice i have no laws from heaven to bring down to the people from the mountain i don't belong to the mountain at all or set up to be a leader and reformer of mankind my faith is not strong enough for that nor my vanity nor my hypocrisy great enough i will tell no lies george that i promise you and do no more than coincide in those which are necessary 
and past current and can't be got in without recalling the whole circulation give a man at least the advantage of his sceptical turn if i find a good thing to say in the house i will say it a good measure i will support it a fair place i will take it and be glad of my luck but i would no more flatter a great man than a mob and now you know as much about politics as i do what call have i to be a whig whiggism is not a divine institution why not vote with the liberal conservatives they have done for the nation what the whigs could never have done without them who converted both the radicals and the country outside i think the morning post is often right and punch is often wrong i don't profess a call but take advantage of a chance parlons d'autres choses the next thing at your heart after ambition is love i suppose warrington said how have our young loves prospered are we going to change our condition and give up our chambers are you going to divorce me arthur and take unto yourself a wife i suppose so she is very good-natured and lively she sings and she don't mind smoking she'll have a fair fortune i don't know how much but my uncle augurs everything from the begum's generosity and says that she will come down very handsomely and i think blanche is devilish fond of me said arthur with a sigh that means that we accept her caresses and her money haven't we said before that life was a transaction pendennis said i don't pretend to break my heart about her i have told her pretty fairly what my feelings are and and have engaged myself to her and since i saw her last and for the last two months especially whilst i have been in the country i think she has been growing fonder and fonder of me and her letters to me and especially to laura seem to show it mine have been simple enough no raptures no vows you understand but looking upon the thing as an affaire fait and not desirous to hasten or defer the completion and laura how is she warrington asked frankly laura george said penn looking his friend hard in the face by heaven laura is the best and noblest and dearest girl the sun ever shone upon his own voice fell as he spoke it seemed as if he could hardly utter the words he stretched out his hand to his comrade who took it and nodded his head have you only found out that now young un warrington said after a pause who has not learned things too late george cried arthur in his impetuous way gathering words and emotion as he went on whose life is not a disappointment who carries his heart entire to the grave without a mutilation i never knew anybody who was happy quite or who has not had to ransom himself out of the hands of fate with the payment of some dearest treasure or other lucky if we are left alone afterwards when we have paid our fine and if the tyrant visits us no more suppose i have found out that i have lost the greatest prize in the world now that it can't be mine that for years i had an angel under my tent and let her go am i the only one ah dear old boy am i the only one and do you think my lot is easier to bear because i own that i deserve it she's gone from us god's blessing be with her she might have stayed and i lost her it's like undine isn't it george she was in this room once said george he saw her there he heard the sweet low voice he saw the sweet smile and eyes shining so kindly the face remembered so fondly thought of in what night watches blessed and loved always gone now a glass that had held a nosegay a bible with helen's handwriting were all that were left him of that brief flower of his life say it is a dream say it passes better the recollection of a dream than an aimless waking from a blank stupor the two friends sat in silence a while each occupied with his own thoughts and aware of the others pen broke it presently by saying that he must go and seek for his uncle and report progress to the old gentleman the major had written in a very bad humour the major was getting old i should like to see you in parliament and snugly settled with a comfortable house and an heir to the name before i make my bow show me these the major wrote and then let old arthur pendennis make room for the younger fellows he has walked the pell-mell paved long enough 
there's a kindness about the old heathen said warrington he cares for somebody besides himself at least for some other part of himself besides that which is buttoned into his own coat for you and your race he would like to see the progeny of the pendennises multiplying and increasing in hopes that they may inherit the land the old patriarch blesses you from the club window of bases and is carried off and buried under the flags of st james's church in sight of piccadilly and the cab stand and the carriage is going to the levee it is an edifying ending the new blood i bring into the family mused pen is rather tainted if i had chosen i think my father-in-law amory would not have been the progenitor i should have desired for my race nor my grandfather-in-law snell nor our oriental ancestors by the way who was amory amory was lieutenant of an india man blanche wrote some verses about him about the storm the mountain wave the seaman's grave the gallant father and that sort of thing amory was drowned commanding a country ship between calcutta and sydney amory and the begum weren't happy together she has been unlucky in her selection of husbands the good old lady for between ourselves a more despicable creature than sir francis clavering of clavering park baronet never legislated for his country broke in warrington at which pen blushed rather by the way at baden said warrington i found our friend the chevalier strong in great state and wearing his orders he told me that he had quarrelled with clavering of whom he seemed to have almost as bad an opinion as you have and in fact i think though i will not be certain confided to me his opinion that clavering was an utter scoundrel that fellow blundell who taught you card-playing at oxbridge was with strong and time i think has brought out his valuable qualities and rendered him a more accomplished rascal than he was during your undergraduateship but the king of the place was the famous colonel altamont who is carrying all before him giving flies to the whole society and breaking the bank it was said my uncle knows something about that fellow clavering knows something about him there is something louche regarding him but come i must go to berry street like a dutiful nephew and taking his hat pen prepared to go i will walk too said warrington and they descended the stairs stopping however at pen's chambers which as the reader has been informed were now on the lower story here pen began sprinkling himself with eau de cologne and carefully scenting his hair and whiskers with that odoriferous water what is the matter you've not been smoking is it my pipe that has poisoned you growled warrington i'm going to call upon some women said pen i'm i'm going to dine with them they are passing through town and are at a hotel in jermyn street warrington looked with good-natured interest at the young fellow dandifying himself up to a pitch of completeness and appearing at length in a gorgeous shirt-front and neckcloth fresh gloves and glistening boots george had a pair of thick high lows and his old shirt was torn about the breast and ragged at the collar where his blue beard had worn it well young un said he simply i like you to be a buck somehow when i walk about with you it is as if i had a rose in my buttonhole and you are still affable i don't think there is any young fellow in the temple turns out like you and i don't believe you were ever ashamed of walking with me yet don't laugh at me george said pen i say pen continued the other sadly if you write if you write to laura i wish you would say god bless her from me pen blushed and then looked at warrington and then and then burst into an uncontrollable fit of laughing i'm going to dine with her he said i brought her and lady rockminster up from the country to-day made two days of it slept last night at bath i say george come and dine too i may ask any one i please and the old lady is constantly talking about you george refused george had an article to write george hesitated and oh strange to say at last he agreed to go it was agreed that they should go and call upon the ladies and they marched away in high spirits to the hotel in jermyn street once more the dear face shone upon him once more the sweet voice spoke to him and the tender hand pressed a welcome there still wanted half an hour to dinner you will go and see your uncle now mr pendennis old lady rockminster said you will not bring him to dinner no his old stories are intolerable and i want to talk to mr warrington i dare say he will amuse us i think we have heard all your stories 
we have been together for two whole days and i think we are getting tired of each other so obeying her ladyship's orders arthur went downstairs and walked to his uncle's lodgings End of chapter seventy chapter seventy one of the history of pendennis this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the history of pendennis by william makepeace thackeray chapter seventy one fiat justitia the dinner was served when arthur returned and lady rockminster began to scold him for arriving late but laura looking at her cousin saw that his face was so pale and scared that she interrupted her imperious patroness and asked with tender alarm what had happened was arthur ill arthur drank a large bumper of sherry i have heard the most extraordinary news i will tell you afterwards he said looking at the servants he was very nervous and agitated during the dinner don't tramp and beat so with your feet under the table lady rockminster said you have trodden on fido and upset his saucer you see mr warrington keeps his boots quiet at the dessert it seemed as if the unlucky dinner would never be over lady rockminster said this dinner has been exceedingly stupid i suppose something has happened and that you want to speak to laura i will go and have my nap i am not sure that i shall have any tea no good night mr warrington you must come again and when there is no business to talk about and the old lady tossing up her head walked away from the room with great dignity george and the others had risen with her and warrington was about to go away and was saying good night to laura who of course was looking much alarmed about her cousin when arthur said pray stay george you should hear my news too and give me your counsel in this case i hardly know how to act in it it's something about blanche arthur said laura her heart beating and her cheek blushing as she thought it had never blushed in her life yes and the most extraordinary story said pen when i left you to go to my uncle's lodgings i found his servant morgan who has been with him so long at the door and he said that he and his master had parted that morning that my uncle had quitted the house and had gone to an hotel this hotel i asked for him when i came in but he was gone out to dinner morgan then said that he had something of a most important nature to communicate to me and begged me to step into the house his house it is now it appears the scoundrel has saved a great deal of money whilst in my uncle's service and is now a capitalist and a millionaire for what i know well i went into the house and what do you think he told me this must be a secret between us all at least if we can keep it now that it is in possession of that villain blanche's father is not dead he has come to life again the marriage between clavering and the begum is no marriage and blanche i suppose is her grandfather's heir said warrington perhaps but the child of what a father amory is an escaped convict clavering knows it my uncle knows it and it was with this piece of information held over clavering in terrorem that the wretched old man got him to give up his burrow to me blanche doesn't know it said laura nor poor lady clavering no said pen blanche does not even know the history of her father she knew that he and her mother had separated and had heard as a child from bonner her nurse that mr amory was drowned in new south wales he was there as a convict not as a ship's captain as the poor girl thought lady clavering has told me that they were not happy and that her husband was a bad character she would tell me all she said some day and i remember her saying to me with tears in her eyes that it was hard for a woman to be forced to own that she was glad to hear her husband was dead and that twice in her life she should have chosen so badly what is to be done now the man can't show and claim his wife death is probably over him if he discovers himself return to transportation certainly but the rascal has held the thread of discovery over clavering for some time past and has extorted money from him time after time it is our friend colonel altamont of course said warrington i see all now 
if the rascal comes back continued arthur morgan who knows his secret will use it over him and having it in his possession proposes to extort money from us all the dastard rascal supposed i was cognizant of it said pen white with anger asked me if i would give him an annuity to keep it quiet threatened me me as if i was trafficking with this wretched old begum's misfortune and would extort a seat in parliament out of that miserable clavering good heavens was my uncle mad to tamper in such a conspiracy fancy our mother's son laura trading on such a treason i can't fancy it dear arthur said laura seizing arthur's hand and kissing it no broke out warrington's deep voice with a tremor he surveyed the two generous and loving young people with a pang of indescribable love and pain no our boy can't meddle with such a wretched intrigue as that arthur pendennis can't marry a convict's daughter and sit in parliament as member for the hulks you must wash your hands of the whole affair pen you must break off you must give no explanations of why and wherefore but state that family reasons render a match impossible it is better that those poor women should fancy you false to your word than that they should know the truth besides you can get from that dog clavering i can fetch that for you easily enough an acknowledgment that the reasons which you have given to him as the head of the family are amply sufficient for breaking off the union don't you think with me laura he scarcely dared to look her in the face as he spoke any lingering hope that he might have any feeble hold that he might feel upon the last spar of his wrecked fortune he knew he was casting away and he let the wave of his calamity close over him pen had started up whilst he was speaking looking eagerly at him he turned his head away he saw laura rise up also and go to pen and once more take his hand and kiss it she thinks so too god bless her said george her father's shame is not blanche's fault dear arthur is it laura said very pale and speaking very quickly suppose you had been married would you desert her because she had done no wrong are you not pledged to her would you leave her because she is in misfortune and if she is unhappy wouldn't you console her our mother would had she been here and as she spoke the kind girl folded her arms round him and buried her face upon his heart our mother is an angel with god pen sobbed out and you are the dearest and best of women the dearest the dearest and the best teach me my duty pray for me that i may do it pure heart god bless you god bless you my sister amen groaned out warrington with his head in his hands she is right he murmured to himself she can't do any wrong i think that girl indeed she looked and smiled like an angel many a day after he saw that smile saw her radiant face as she looked up at pen saw her putting back her curls blushing and smiling and still looking fondly towards him she leaned for a moment her little fair hand on the table playing on it and now and now she said looking at the two gentlemen and what now asked george and now we will have some tea said miss laura with her smile but before this unromantic conclusion to a rather sentimental scene could be suffered to take place a servant brought word that major pendennis had returned to the hotel and was waiting to see his nephew upon this announcement laura not without some alarm and an appealing look to pen which said behave yourself well hold to the right and do your duty be gentle but firm with your uncle laura we say with these warnings written in her face took leave of the two gentlemen and retreated to her dormitory warrington who was not generally fond of tea yet grudged that expected cup very much why could not old pendennis have come in an hour later well an hour sooner or later what matter the hour strikes at last the inevitable moment comes to say farewell the hand is shaken the door closed and the friend gone and the brief joy over you are alone in which of those many windows of the hotel does her light beam 
perhaps he asks himself as he passes down the street he strides away to the smoking-room of a neighbouring club and there applies himself to his usual solace of a cigar men are brawling and talking loud about politics opera girls horse racing the atrocious tyranny of the committee bearing this sacred secret about him he enters into this brawl talk away each louder than the other rattle and crack jokes laugh and tell your wild stories it is strange to take one's place and part in the midst of the smoke and din and think every man here has his secret ego most likely which is sitting lonely and apart away in the private chamber from the loud game in which the rest of us is joining arthur as he traversed the passages of the hotel felt his anger rousing up within him he was indignant to think that yonder old gentleman whom he was about to meet should have made him such a tool and puppet and so compromised his honour and good name the old fellow's hand was very cold and shaky when arthur took it he was coughing he was grumbling over the fire froge could not bring his dressing-gown or arrange his papers as that darned confounded impudent scoundrel of a morgan the old gentleman bemoaned himself and cursed morgan's ingratitude with peevish pathos the confounded impudent scoundrel he was drunk last night and challenged me to fight him pen and begat at one time i was so excited that i thought i should have driven a knife into him and the infernal rascal has made ten thousand pound i believe and deserves to be hanged and will be but curse him i wish he could have lasted out my time he knew all my ways and damn me when i rang the bell the confounded thief brought the thing i wanted not like that stupid german lout and what sort of time have you had in the country been a good deal with lady rockminster you can't do better she is one of the old school vieille ecole bonne ecole eh damn me they don't make gentlemen and ladies now and in fifty years you'll hardly know one man from another but they'll last my time i ain't long for this business i'm getting a very old pen my boy and gad i was thinking to-day as i was packing up my little library there's a bible amongst the books that belong to my poor mother i would like you to keep that pen i was thinking sir that you would most likely open the box when it was your property and the old fellow was laid under the sod sir and the major coughed and wagged his old head over the fire his age his kindness disarmed pen's anger somewhat and made arthur feel no little compunction for the deed which he was about to do he knew that the announcement which he was about to make would destroy the darling hope of the old gentleman's life and create in his breast a woeful anger and commotion hey hey i'm off sir nodded the elder but i'd like to read a speech of yours in the times before i go mr pendennis said unaccustomed as i am to public speaking hey sir hey arthur begad you look devilish well and healthy sir i always said my brother jack would bring the family right you must go down into the west and buy the old estate sir neck tenui penna hey we'll rise again sir rise again on the wing and begad i shouldn't be surprised that you will be a baronet before you die his words smote pen and it is i he thought that am going to fling down the poor old fellow's air castle well it must be here goes i i went into your lodgings at berry street though i did not find you pen slowly began and i talked with morgan uncle indeed the old gentleman's cheek began to flush involuntarily and he muttered the cat's out of the bag now begad he told me a story sir which gave me the deepest surprise and pain said pen the major tried to look unconcerned what that story about about what do you call him hey about miss amory's father about lady clavering's first husband and who he is and what hem a devilish awkward affair said the old man rubbing his nose i i've been aware of that a eh? confounded circumstance for some time i wish i had known it sooner or not at all said arthur gloomily he is all safe thought the senior greatly relieved gad i should have liked to keep it from you altogether and from those two poor women who are as innocent as unborn babes in the transaction you are right there is no reason why the two women should hear it and i shall never tell them 
though that villain morgan perhaps may arthur said gloomily he seems disposed to trade upon his secret and has already proposed terms of ransom to me i wish i had known of the matter earlier sir it is not a very pleasant thought to me that i am engaged to a convict's daughter the very reason why i kept it from you my dear boy but miss amory is not a convict's daughter don't you see miss amory is the daughter of lady clavering with fifty or sixty thousand pounds for a fortune and her father-in-law a baronet and country gentleman of high reputation approves of the match and gives up his seat in parliament to his son-in-law what can be more simple is it true sir begad yes it is true of course it's true amory's dead i tell you he is dead the first sign of life he shows he is dead he can't appear we have him at a deadlock like the fellow in the play the critic eh devilish amusing play that critic monstrous witty man sheridan and so was his son by gad sir when i was at the cape i remember the old gentleman's garrulity and wished to conduct arthur to the cape perhaps arose from a desire to avoid the subject which was nearest his nephew's heart but arthur broke out interrupting him if you had told me this tale sooner i believe you would have spared me and yourself a great deal of pain and disappointment and i should not have found myself tied to an engagement from which i can't in honour recede no begad we've fixed you and a man who's fixed to a seat in parliament and a pretty girl with a couple of thousand a year is fixed to no bad thing let me tell you said the old man great heavens sir said arthur are you blind can't you see see what young gentleman asked the other see that rather than trade upon this secret of amory's arthur cried out i would go and join my father-in-law at the hulks see that rather than take a seat in parliament as a bribe from clavering for silence i would take the spoons off the table see that you have given me a felon's daughter for a wife doomed me to poverty and shame curse my career when it might have been when it might have been so different but for you don't you see that we have been playing a guilty game and have been overreached that in offering to marry this poor girl for the sake of her money and the advancement she would bring i was degrading myself and prostituting my honour what in heaven's name do you mean sir cried the old man i mean to say that there is a measure of baseness which i can't pass arthur said i have no other words for it and am sorry if they hurt you i have felt for months past that my conduct in this affair has been wicked sordid and worldly i am rightly punished by the event and having sold myself for money and a seat in parliament by losing both how do you mean that you lose either shrieked the old gentleman who the devil's to take your fortune or your seat away from you by god clavering shall give em to you you shall have every shilling of eighty thousand pounds i'll keep my promise to miss amory sir said arthur and begad her parents shall keep theirs to you not so please god arthur answered i have sinned but heaven help me i will sin no more i will let clavering off from that bargain which was made without my knowledge i will take no money with blanche but that which was originally settled upon her and i will try to make her happy you have done it you have brought this on me sir but you knew no better and i forgive arthur in god's name and your father's who by heavens was the proudest man alive and had the honour of the family always at heart in mine for the sake of a poor broken-down old fellow who has always been devilish fond of you don't fling this chance away i pray you i beg you i implore you my dear dear boy don't fling this chance away it's the making of you you're sure to get on you'll be a baronet it's three thousand a year damn me on my knees there i beg you of you don't do this and the old man actually sank down on his knees and seizing one of arthur's hands looked up piteously at him it was cruel to remark the shaking hands the wrinkled and quivering face the old eyes weeping and winking the broken voice ah sir said arthur with a groan you have brought pain enough on me spare me this you have wished me to marry blanche i marry her for god's sake sir rise 
i can't bear it you you mean to say that you will take her as a beggar and be one yourself said the old gentleman rising up and coughing violently i look at her as a person to whom a great calamity has befallen and to whom i am promised she cannot help the misfortune and as she had my word when she was prosperous i shall not withdraw it now she is poor i will not take clavering's seat unless afterwards it should be given of his free will i will not have a shilling more than her original fortune have the kindness to ring the bell said the old gentleman i have done my best and said my say and i am a devilish old fellow and and it don't matter and and shakespeare was right and cardinal wolsey begat and had i but served my god as i have served you yes on my knees by jove to my own nephew i mightn't have been good night sir you needn't trouble yourself to call again arthur took his hand which the old man left to him it was quite passive and clammy he looked very much oldened and it seemed as if the contest and defeat had quite broken him on the next day he kept his bed and refused to see his nephew End of chapter seventy one chapter seventy two of the history of pendennis this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the history of pendennis by william makepeace thackeray chapter seventy two in which the decks begin to clear when arrayed in his dressing-gown pen walked up according to custom to warrington's chambers next morning to inform his friend of the issue of the last night's interview with his uncle and to ask as usual for george's advice and opinion mrs flanagan the laundress was the only person whom arthur found in the dear old chambers george had taken a carpet-bag and was gone his address was to his brother's house in suffolk packages addressed to the newspaper and review for which he wrote lay on the table awaiting delivery i found him at the table when i came the dear gentleman mrs flanagan said writing at his papers and one of the candles was burned out and hard as his bed is he wasn't in it all night sir indeed having sat at the club until the brawl there became intolerable to him george had walked home and had passed the night finishing some work on which he was employed and to the completion of which he bent himself with all his might the labor was done and the night was worn away somehow and the tardy november dawn came and looked in on the young man as he sat over his desk in the next day's paper or quarter's review many of us very likely admired the work of his genius the variety of his illustration the fierce vigor of his satire the depth of his reason there was no hint in his writing of the other thoughts which occupied him and always accompanied him in his work a tone more melancholy than was customary a satire more bitter and impatient than that which he afterwards showed may have marked the writings of this period of his life to the very few persons who knew his style or his name we have said before could we know the man's feelings as well as the author's thoughts how interesting most books would be more interesting than mary i suppose harlequin's face behind his mask is always grave if not melancholy certainly each man who lives by the pen and happens to read this must remember if he will his own experiences and recall many solemn hours of solitude and labor what a constant care sat at the side of the desk and accompanied him fever or sickness were lying possibly in the next room a sick child might be there with a wife watching over it terrified and in prayer or grief might be bearing him down and the cruel mist before the eyes rendering the paper scarce visible as he wrote on it and the inexorable necessity drove on the pen what man among us has not had nights and hours like these but to the manly heart severe as these pangs are they are endurable long as the night seems the dawn comes at last and the wounds heal and the fever abates and rest comes and you can afford to look back on the past misery with feelings that are anything but bitter two or three books for reference fragments of torn-up manuscript drawers open pens and ink stand lines half visible on the blotting paper a bit of sealing wax twisted and bitten and broken into sundry pieces such relics as these were about the table and pen flung himself down in george's empty chair noting things according to his wont or in spite of himself 
there was a gap in the bookcase next to the old college plato with the boniface arms where helen's bible used to be he has taken that with him thought pen he knew why his friend was gone dear dear old george pen rubbed his hand over his eyes oh how much wiser how much better how much nobler he is than i he thought where was such a friend or such a brave heart where shall i ever hear such a frank voice and kind laughter where shall i ever see such a true gentleman no wonder she loved him god bless him what was i compared to him what could she do else but love him to the end of our days we will be her brothers as fate wills that we can be no more we'll be her knights and wait on her and when we're old we'll say how we loved her dear dear old george when pen descended to his own chambers his eye fell on the letter-box of his outer door which he had previously overlooked and there was a little note to a p esq in george's well-known handwriting george had put into pen's box probably as he was going away dear pen i shall be halfway home when you breakfast and intend to stay over christmas in norfolk or elsewhere i have my own opinion of the issue of matters about which we talked in j street yesterday and think my presence de trop voile g w give my very best regards and adieu to your cousin and so george was gone and mrs flanagan the laundress ruled over his empty chambers pen of course had to go and see his uncle on the day after their colloquy and not being admitted he naturally went to lady rockminster's apartments where the old lady instantly asked for bluebeard and insisted that he should come to dinner bluebeard is gone pen said and he took out poor george's scrap of paper and handed it to laura who looked at it did not look at pen in return but passed the paper back to him and walked away pen rushed into an eloquent eulogium upon his dear old george to lady rockminster who was astonished at his enthusiasm she had never heard him so warm in praise of anybody and told him with her usual frankness that she didn't think it had been in his nature to care so much about any other person as mr pendennis was passing in waterloo place in one of his many walks to the hotel where laura lived and whither duty to his uncle carried arthur every day arthur saw issuing from his years jim cracks celebrated shop and old friend who was followed to his broom by an obsequious shopman bearing parcels the gentleman was in the deepest mourning the broom the driver and the horse were in mourning grief in easy circumstances and supported by the comfortablest springs and cushions was typified in the equipage and the little gentleman its proprietor what foker hail foker cried out pen the reader no doubt has likewise recognized arthur's old schoolfellow and he held out his hand to the heir of the late lamented john henry foker esq the master of logwood and other houses the principal partner in the great brewery of foker and company the greater portion of foker's entire a little hand covered with a glove of the deepest ebony and set off by three inches of a snowy wristband was put forth to meet arthur's salutation the other little hand held a little morocco case containing no doubt something precious of which mr foker had just become proprietor in messrs jim crack's shop pen's keen eyes and satiric turn showed him at once upon what errand mr foker had been employed and he thought of the air in horace pouring forth the gathered wine of his father's vats and that human nature is pretty much the same in regent street as in the via sacra le rat est mort vive le rat said arthur ah said the other yes thank you very much obliged how do you do pen very busy good-bye and he jumped into the black broom and sat like a little black care behind the black coachman he had blushed on seeing pen and shown other signs of guilt and perturbation which pen attributed to the novelty of his situation and on which he began to speculate in his usual sardonic manner yes so wags the world thought pen the stone closes over harry the fourth and harry the fifth reigns in his stead the old ministers at the brewery come and kneel before him with their books the draymen his subjects fling up their red caps and shout for him what a grave deference and sympathy the bankers and the lawyers show there was too great a stake at issue between those two that they should ever love each other very cordially as long as one man keeps another out of twenty thousand a year the younger must be always hankering after the crown and the wish must be the father to thought of possession thank heaven there was no thought of money between me and our dear mother laura there never could have been you would have spurned it cried laura why make yourself more selfish than you are pen and allow your mind to own for an instant that it would have entertained such such dreadful meanness you make me blush for you arthur you make me her eyes finished this sentence and she passed her handkerchief across them there are some truths which women will never acknowledge pen said and from which your modesty always turns away i do not say that i ever knew the feeling only that i am glad i had not the temptation is there any harm in that confession of weakness 
we are all taught to ask to be delivered from evil arthur said laura in a low voice i am glad if you were spared from that great crime and only sorry to think that you could by any possibility have been led into it but you never could and you don't think you could your acts are generous and kind you disdain mean actions you take blanche without money and without a bribe yes thanks be to heaven dear brother you could not have sold yourself away i knew you could not when it came to the day and you did not praise be be where praise is due why does this horrid scepticism pursue you my arthur why doubt and sneer at your own heart at every one's oh if you knew the pain you give me how i lie awake and think of those hard sentences dear brother and wish them unspoken unthought do i cause you many thoughts and many tears laura asked arthur the fullness of innocent love beamed from her in reply a smile heavenly pure a glance of unutterable tenderness sympathy pity shone in her face all which indications of love and purity arthur beheld and worshipped in her as you would watch them in a child as one fancies one might regard them in an angel i i don't know what i've done he said simply to have merited such regard from two such women it is like undeserved praise laura or too much good fortune which frightens one or a great post when a man feels that he is not fit for it ah sister how weak and wicked we are how spotless and full of love and truth heaven made you i think for some of you there has been no fall he said looking at the charming girl with an almost paternal glance of admiration you can't help having sweet thoughts and doing good actions dear creature they are the flowers which you bear and what else sir asked laura i see a sneer coming over your face what is it why does it come to drive all the good thoughts away a sneer is there i was thinking my dear that nature in making you so good and loving did very well but but what what is that wicked but and why are you always calling it up but will come in spite of us but is reflection but is the sceptic's familiar with whom he has made a compact and if he forgets it and indulges in happy day-dreams or building of air-castles or listens to sweet music let us say or to the bells ringing to church but taps at the door and says master i'm here you are my master but i'm yours go where you will you can't travel without me i will whisper to you when you are on your knees at church i will be at your marriage pillow i will sit down at your table with your children i will be behind your death-bed curtain that is what but is pen said pen you frighten me cried laura do you know what but came and said to me just now when i was looking at you but said if that girl had reason as well as love she would love you no more if she knew you as you are the sullied selfish being which you know she must part from you and could give you no love and no sympathy didn't i say he added fondly that some of you seem exempt from the fall love you no but the knowledge of evil is kept from you what is this you young folks are talking about asked lady rockminster who at this moment made her appearance in the room having performed in the mystic retirement of her own apartments and under the hands of her attendant those elaborate toilet rites without which the worthy old lady never presented herself to public view mr pendennis you are always coming here it is very pleasant to be here arthur said and we were talking when you came in about my friend foker whom i met just now and who as your ladyship knows has succeeded to his father's kingdom he has a very fine property he has fifteen thousand a year he is my cousin he is a very worthy young man he must come and see me said lady rockminster with a look at laura he has been engaged for many years past to his cousin lady something lady anne is a foolish little chit lady rockminster said with much dignity and i have no patience with her she has outraged every feeling of society she has broken her father's heart and thrown away fifteen thousand a year thrown away what has happened asked pen it will be the talk of the town in a day or two and there is no need why i should keep the secret any longer said lady rockminster who had written and received a dozen letters on the subject I had a letter yesterday from my daughter who was staying at drummington until all the world was obliged to go away on account of the frightful catastrophe which happened there when mr foker came home from nice and after the funeral lady anne went down on her knees to her father said that she never could marry her cousin that she had contracted another attachment and that she must die rather than fulfil her contract poor lord rosherville who is dreadfully embarrassed showed his daughter what the state of his affairs was and that it was necessary that the arrangement should take place and in fine we all supposed that she had listened to reason and intended to comply with the desires of her family but what has happened last thursday she went out after breakfast with her maid and was married in the very church in drummington park to mr hobson her father's own chaplain and her brother's tutor a red-haired widower with two children poor dear rosherville is in a dreadful way he wishes henry foker should marry alice or barbara but alice is marked with the smallpox and barbara is ten years older than he is 
and of course now the young man is his own master he will think of choosing for himself the blow on lady agnes is very cruel she is inconsolable she has the house in grosvenor street for a life and her settlement which was very handsome have you not met her yes she dined one day at lady clavering's the first day i saw you and a very disagreeable young man i thought you were but i have formed you we have formed him haven't we laura where is bluebeard let him come that horrid grindley the dentist will keep me in town another week to the latter part of her ladyship's speech arthur gave no ear he was thinking for whom could foker be purchasing those trinkets which he was carrying away from the jewellers why did harry seem anxious to avoid him could he be still faithful to the attachment which had agitated him so much and sent him abroad eighteen months back pshaw the bracelets and presents were for some of harry's old friends of the opera or the french theatre rumours from naples and paris rumours such as are born to club smoking-rooms had announced that the young man had found distractions or precluded from his virtuous attachment the poor fellow had flung himself back upon his old companions and amusements not the only man or woman whom society forces into evil or debars from good not the only victim of the world's selfish and wicked laws as a good thing when it is to be done cannot be done too quickly laura was anxious that pen's marriage intention should be put into execution as speedily as possible and pressed on his arrangements with rather a feverish anxiety why could she not wait pen could afford to do so with perfect equanimity but laura would hear of no delay she wrote to pen she implored pen she used every means to urge expedition it seemed as if she could have no rest until arthur's happiness was complete she offered herself to dearest blanche to come and stay at tunbridge with her when lady rockminster should go on her intended visit to the reigning house of rockminster and although the old dowager scolded and ordered and commanded laura was deaf and disobedient she must go to tunbridge she would go to tunbridge she who ordinarily had no will of her own and complied smilingly with anybody's whim and caprices showed the most selfish and obstinate determination in this instance the dowager lady must nurse herself in her rheumatism she must read herself to sleep if she would not hear her maid whose voice croaked and who made sad work of the sentimental passages in the novels laura must go and be with her new sister in another week she proposed with many loves and regards to dear lady clavering to pass some time with dearest blanche dearest blanche wrote instantly and replied to dearest laura's number one to say with what extreme delight she should welcome her sister how charming it would be to practise their old duets together to wander o'er the grassy sward and amidst the yellowing woods of penhurst and southborough blanche counted the hours till she should embrace her dearest friend laura number two expressed her delight at dearest blanche's affectionate reply she hoped that their friendship would never diminish that the confidence between them would grow in after years that they should have no secrets from each other that the aim of the life of each would be to make one person happy blanche number two followed in two days how provoking their house was very small the two spare bedrooms were occupied by that horrid mrs planter and her daughter who had thought proper to fall ill she always fell ill in country houses and she could not or would not be moved for some days laura number three it was indeed very provoking l had hoped to hear one of dearest b s dear songs on friday but she was the more consoled to wait because lady r was not very well and liked to be nursed by her poor major pendennis was very unwell too in the same hotel too unwell even to see arthur who was constant in his calls on his uncle arthur's heart was full of tenderness and affection she had known arthur all her life she would answer yes even in italic she would answer for his kindness his goodness and his gentleness blanche number three what is this most surprising most extraordinary letter from a p what does dearest laura know about it what has happened what what mystery is enveloped under his frightful reserve blanche number three requires an explanation and it cannot be better given than in the surprising and mysterious letter of arthur pendennis End of chapter seventy two chapter seventy three of the history of pendennis this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the history of pendennis by william makepeace thackeray chapter seventy three mr and mrs sam huckster dear blanche arthur wrote you are always reading and dreaming pretty dramas and exciting romances in real life are you now prepared to enact a part of one and not the pleasantest part dear blanche that in which the heroine 
takes possession of her father's palace and wealth and introducing her husband to the loyal retainers and faithful vassals greets her happy bridegroom with all of this is mine and thine but the other character that of the luckless lady who suddenly discovers that she is not the prince's wife but claude mel nuts the beggars that of al nascar's wife who comes in just as her husband has kicked over the tray of porcelain which was to be the making of his fortune but stay al nascar who kicked down the china was not a married man he had cast his eye on the vizier's daughter and his hopes of her went to the ground with the shattered bowls and teacups will you be the vizier's daughter and refuse and laugh to scorn al nascar or will you be the lady of lyon and love the penniless claude melnut i will act that part if you like i will love you my best in return i will do my all to make your humble life happy for humble it will be at least the odds are against any other conclusion we shall live and die in a poor prosy humdrum way there will be no stars and epaulets for the hero of our story i shall write one or two more stories which will presently be forgotten i shall be called to the bar and try to get on in my profession perhaps some day if i am very lucky and work very hard which is absurd i may get a colonial appointment and you may be an indian judge's lady meanwhile i shall buy back the pall mall gazette the publishers are tired of it since the death of poor shandon and will sell it for a small sum warrington will be my right hand and write it up to a respectable sale i will introduce you to mr finucane the sub-editor and i know who in the end will be mrs finucane a very nice gentle creature who has lived sweetly through a sad life and we will jog on i say and look out for better times and earn our living decently you shall have the opera boxes and superintend the fashionable intelligence and break your little heart in the poet's corner shall we live over the offices there are four very good rooms a kitchen and a garret for laura in catherine street in the strand or would you like a house in the waterloo road it would be very pleasant only there is that halfpenny toll at the bridge the boys may go to king's college mayn't they does all this read to you like a joke ah dear blanche it is no joke and i am sober and telling the truth our fine daydreams are gone our carriage has whirled out of sight like cinderella's our house in belgravia has been whisked away into the air by a malevolent genius and i am no more a member of parliament than i am a bishop on his bench in the house of lords or a duke with a garter at his knee you know pretty well what my property is and your own little fortune we may have enough with those two to live in decent comfort to take a cab sometimes when we go out to see our friends and not to deny ourselves an omnibus when we are tired but that is all is that enough for you my little dainty lady i doubt sometimes whether you can bear the life which i offer you at least it is fear that you should know what it will be if you say yes arthur i will follow your fate whatever it may be and be a loyal and loving wife to aid and cheer you come to me dear blanche and may god help me so that i may do my duty to you if not and you look to a higher station i must not bar blanche's fortune i will stand in the crowd and see your ladyship go to court when you are presented and you shall give me a smile from your chariot window i saw lady mirabel going to the drawing-room last season the happy husband at her side glittered with stars and cordons all the flowers in the garden bloomed in the coachman's bosom will you have these and the chariot or walk on foot and mend your husband's stockings i cannot tell you now afterwards i might should the day come when we may have no secrets from one another what has happened within the last few hours which has changed all my prospects in life but so it is that i have learned something which forces me to give up the plans which i had formed and many vain and ambitious hopes in which i had been indulging i have written and dispatched a letter to sir francis clavering saying that i cannot accept his seat in parliament until after my marriage in like manner i cannot and will not accept any larger fortune with you than that which has always belonged to you since your grandfather's death and the birth of your half-brother 
your good mother is not in the least aware i hope she never may be of the reasons which force me to this very strange decision they arise from a painful circumstance which is attributable to none of our faults but having once befallen they are as fatal and irreparable as that shock which overset honest alnaskar's porcelain and shattered all his hopes beyond the power of mending i write gaily enough for there is no use in bewailing such a hopeless mischance we have not drawn the great prize in the lottery dear blanche but i shall be contented enough without it if you can be so and i repeat with all my heart that i will do my best to make you happy and now what news shall i give you my uncle is very unwell and takes my refusal of the seat in parliament in sad dudgeon the scheme was his poor old gentleman and he naturally bemoans its failure but warrington laura and i had a council of war they know this awful secret and back me in my decision you must love george as you love what is generous and upright and noble and as for laura she must be our sister blanche our saint our good angel with two such friends at home what need we care for the world without or who is member for clavering or who is asked or not asked to the great balls of the season to this frank communication came back the letter from blanche to laura and one to pen himself which perhaps his own letter justified you are spoiled by the world blanche wrote you do not love your poor blanche as she would be loved or you would not offer thus lightly to take her or to leave her no arthur you love me not a man of the world you have given me your plighted troth and are ready to redeem it but that entire affection that love whole and abiding where where is that vision of my youth i am but a pastime of your life and i would be its all but a fleeting thought and i would be your whole soul i would have our two hearts one but ah my arthur how lonely yours is how little you give me of it you speak of our parting with a smile on your lip of our meeting and you care not to hasten it is life but a disillusion then and are the flowers of our garden faded away i have wept i have prayed i have passed sleepless hours i have shed bitter bitter tears over your letter to you i bring the gushing poesy of my being the yearnings of the soul that longs to be loved that pines for love 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 beyond all that flings itself at your feet and cries love me arthur your heart beats no quicker at the kneeling appeal of my love your proud eye is dimmed by no tear of sympathy you accept my soul's treasure as though twere dross not the pearls from the unfathomable deeps of affection not the diamonds from the caverns of the heart you treat me like a slave and bid me bow to my master is this the guerdon of a free maiden is this the price of a life's passion ah me when was it otherwise when did love meet with aught but disappointment could i hope fond fool to be the exception to the lot of my race and lay my fevered brow on a heart that comprehended my own foolish girl that i was one by one all the flowers of my young life have faded away and this the last the sweetest the dearest the fondly the madly loved the wildly cherished where is it but no more of this heed not my bleeding heart bless you bless you always arthur i will write more when i am more collected my racking brain renders thought almost impossible i long to see laura she will come to us directly we return from the country will she not and you cold one b the words of this letter were perfectly clear and written in blanche's neatest hand upon her scented paper and yet the meaning of the composition not a little puzzled pen did blanche mean to accept or to refuse his polite offer her phrases either meant that pen did not love her and she declined him or that she took him and sacrificed herself to him cold as he was he laughed sardonically over the letter and over the transaction which occasioned it he laughed to think how fortune had jilted him and how he deserved his slippery fortune he turned over and over the musky gilt-edged riddle it amused his humour he enjoyed it as if it had been a funny story he was thus seated twiddling the queer manuscript in his hand joking grimly to himself when his servant came in with a card from a gentleman who wished to speak to him very particularly and if pen had gone out into the passage he would have seen sucking his stick 
rolling his eyes and showing great marks of anxiety his old acquaintance mr samuel huckster mr huckster on particular business pray beg mr huckster to come in said pen amused rather and not the less so when poor sam appeared before him pray take a chair mr huckster said pen in his most superb manner in what way can i be of service to you i'd rather not speak before the flunk before the man mr pendennis on which mr arthur's attendant quitted the room i'm in a fix said mr huckster gloomily indeed she sent me to you continued the young surgeon what fanny is she well i was coming to see her but i have had a great deal of business since my return to london i heard of you through my governor and jack hobnell broke in huckster i wish you joy mr pendennis both of the borough and the ladies sir fanny wishes you joy too he added with something of a blush there's many a slip between the cup and the lip who knows what may happen mr huckster or who will sit in parliament for clavering next session you can do anything with my governor continued mr huckster you got him clavering park the old boy was very much pleased sir at your calling him in hobnell wrote me so do you think you could speak to the governor for me mr pendennis and tell him what i've gone and done it sir said huckster with a particular look you you don't mean to say you have you have done any wrong to that dear little creature sir said pen starting up in a great fury i hope not said huckster with a hang-dog look but i've married her and i know there will be an awful shindy at home it was agreed that i should be taken into partnership when i had passed the college and it was to have been huckster and son but i would have it confounded it's all over now and the old boys wrote me that he's coming up to town for drugs he will be here to-morrow and then it must all come out and when did this event happen asked pen not over well pleased most likely that a person who had once attracted some portion of his royal good graces should have transferred her allegiance and consoled herself for his loss last thursday was five weeks it was two days after miss amory came to shepherd's inn huckster answered pen remembered that blanche had written and mentioned her visit i was called in huckster said i was in the inn looking after old cause's leg and about something else too very likely and i met strong who told me there was a woman taken ill in chambers and went up to give her my professional services it was the old lady who attends miss amory her housekeeper or some such thing she was taken with strong hysterics i found her kicking and screaming like a good one in strong's chamber along with him and colonel altamont and miss amory crying and as pale as a sheet and altamont fuming about a regular kick-up they were two hours in the chambers and the old woman went whooping off in a cab she was much worse than the young one i called in groves from her place next day to see if i could be of any service but they were gone without so much as thanking me and the day after i had business of my own to attend to a bad business too said mr huckster gloomily but it's done and can't be undone and we must make the best of it she has known the story for a month thought pen with a sharp pang of grief and a gloomy sympathy this accounts for her letter of to-day she will not implicate her father or divulge his secret she wishes to let me off from the marriage and finds a pretext the generous girl do you know who altamont is sir asked huckster after the pause during which pen had been thinking of his own affairs fanny and i have talked him over and we can't help fancying that it's mrs lightfoot's first husband come to life again and she who has just married a second perhaps lightfoot won't be very sorry for it sighed huckster looking savagely at arthur for the demon of jealousy was still in possession of his soul and now and more than ever since his marriage the poor fellow fancied that fanny's heart belonged to his rival let us talk about your affairs said pen show me how i can be of any service to you huckster let me congratulate you on your marriage i am thankful that fanny who is so good so fascinating so kind a creature has found an honest man and a gentleman who will make her happy show me what i can do to help you she thinks you can sir said huckster accepting pen's proffered hand and i'm very much obliged to you i'm sure and that you might talk over my father and break the business to him and my mother who always has her back up about being a clergyman's daughter fanny ain't of a good family i know and not up to us in breeding in that but she's a huckster now the wife takes the husband's rank of course said pen and with a little practice in society continued huckster imbibing his stick she'll be as good as any girl in clavering you should hear her sing and play on the piano did you ever old bows taught her 
and she'll do on the stage if the governor was to throw me over but i'd rather not have her there she can't help being a coquette mr pendennis she can't help it damme sir i'll be bound to say that two or three of the bartholomew chaps that i've brought into my place are sitting with her now even jack linton that i took down as my best man is as bad as the rest and she will go on singing and making eyes at him it's what bose says if there were twenty men in a room and one not taking notice of her she wouldn't be satisfied until the twentieth was at her elbow you should have her mother with her said pen laughing she must keep the lodge she can't see so much of her family as she used i can't you know sir go on with that lot consider my rank in life said huckster putting a very dirty hand up to his chin oh fay said mr pen who was infinitely amused and concerning whom matato nomine and of course concerning nobody else in the world the fable might have been narrated as the two gentlemen were in the midst of this colloquy another knock came to pen's door and his servant presently announced mr bows the old man followed slowly his pale face blushing and his hand trembling somewhat as he took pen's he coughed and wiped his face in his checked cotton pocket handkerchief and sat down with his hands on his knees the sun shining on his bald head pen looked at the homely figure with no small sympathy and kindness this man too has had his griefs and his wounds arthur thought this man too has brought his genius and his heart and laid them at a woman's feet where she spurned them the chance of life has gone against him and the prize is with that creature yonder fanny's bridegroom thus mutely apostrophized had winked meanwhile with one eye at old bows and was driving holes in the floor with the cane which he loved so we have lost mr bows and here is the lucky winner pen said looking hard at the old man here is the lucky winner sir as you say i suppose you have come from my place asked huckster who having winked at bows with one eye now favoured pen with a wink of the other a wink which seemed to say infatuated old boy you understand over head and ears in love with her poor old fool yes i have been there ever since you went away it was mrs sam who sent me after you who said that she thought you might be doing something stupid something like yourself huckster there's as big fools as i am growled the young surgeon a few perhaps said the old man not many let us trust yes she sent me after you for fear you should offend mr pendennis and i dare say because she thought you wouldn't give her message to him and beg him to go and see her and she knew i would take her errand did he tell you that sir huckster blushed scarlet and covered his confusion with an imprecation pen laughed the scene suited his bitter humour more and more i have no doubt mr huckster was going to tell me arthur said and very much flattered i am sure i shall be to pay my respects to his wife it's in charterhouse lane over the baker's on the right-hand side as you go from st john street continued bows without any pity you know smithfield mr pendennis st john street leads into smithfield dr johnson has been down the street many a time with ragged shoes and a bundle of penny a lining for the gents magazine you literary gents are better off now eh you ride in your cabs and wear yellow kid gloves now i've known so many brave and good men fail and so many quacks and impostors succeed that you mistake me if you think i am puffed up by my own personal good luck old friend arthur said sadly do you think the prizes of life are carried by the most deserving and set up that mean test of prosperity for merit you must feel that you are as good as i i have never questioned it it is you that are peevish against the freaks of fortune and grudge the good luck that befalls others it is not the first time you have unjustly accused me bows perhaps you are not far wrong sir said the old fellow wiping his bald forehead i am thinking about myself and grumbling most men do when they get on that subject here's the fellow that's got the prize in the lottery here's the fortunate youth i don't know what you are driving at huckster said who had been much puzzled as the above remarks passed between his two companions perhaps not said bows dryly mrs h sent me here to look after you and to see that you brought that little message to mr pendennis which you didn't you see and so she was right women always are they have always a reason for everything why sir he said turning round to pen with a sneer she had a reason even for giving me that message i was sitting with her after you left us very quiet and comfortable i was talking away and she was mending your shirts when your two young friends jack linden and bob blades looked in from bartholomew's and then it was she found out that she had this message to send you needn't hurry yourself she don't want you back again they'll stay these two hours i dare say huckster arose with great perturbation at this news and plunged his stick into the pocket of his pale tot and seized his hat you'll come and see us sir won't you he said to pen you'll talk over the governor won't you sir if i can get out of this place and down to clavering you will promise to attend me gratis if ever i fall ill at fair oaks will you huckster pen said good-naturedly 
i will do anything i can for you i will come and see mrs huckster immediately and we will conspire together about what is to be done i thought that would send him out sir beau said dropping into his chair again as soon as the young surgeon had quitted the room and it's all true sir every word of it she wants you back again and sends her husband after you she cajoles every one the little devil she tries it on you on me on poor costigan on the young chaps from bartholomew's she's got a little court of em already and if there is nobody there she practises on the old german baker in the shop or coaxes the black sweeper at the crossing is she fond of that fellow asked pen there is no accounting for likes and dislikes bose answered yes she is fond of him and having taken the thing into her head she would not rest until she married him they had their bans published at st clement's and nobody heard it or knew any just cause or pediment and one day she slips out of the porter's lodge and has the business done and goes off to gravesend with lothario and leaves a note for me to go and explain all things to her ma bless you the old woman knew it as well as i did though she pretended ignorance and so she goes and i'm alone again i miss her sir tripping along that court and coming for her singing lesson and i've no heart to look into the porter's lodge now which looks very empty without her the little flirting thing and i go and sit and dangle about her lodgings like an old fool she makes em very trim and nice though gets up all huckster's shirts and clothes cooks his little dinner and sings at her business like a little lark what's the use of being angry i lent em three pound to go on with for they haven't got a shilling till the reconciliation and pa comes down when bose had taken his leave pen carried his letter from blanche and the news which he had just received to his usual adviser laura it was wonderful upon how many points mr arthur who generally followed his own opinion now wanted another person's counsel he could hardly so much as choose a waistcoat without referring to miss bell if he wanted to buy a horse he must have miss bell's opinion all which marks of deference tended greatly to the amusement of the shrewd old lady with whom miss bell lived and whose plans regarding her protege we have indicated arthur produced blanche's letter then to laura and asked her to interpret it laura was very much agitated and puzzled by the contents of the note it seems to me she said as if blanche is acting very artfully and wishes so to place matters that she may take me or leave me is it not so it is i am afraid a kind of duplicity which does not augur well for your future happiness and is a bad reply to your own candour and honesty arthur do you know i think i think i scarcely like to say what i think said laura with a deep blush but of course the blushing young lady yielded to her cousin's persuasion and expressed what her thoughts were it looks to me arthur as if there might be there might be somebody else said laura with a repetition of the blush and if there is broken arthur and if i am free once again will the best and dearest of all women you are not free dear brother laura said calmly you belong to another of whom i own it grieves me to think ill but i can't do otherwise it is very odd that in this letter she does not urge you to tell her the reason why you have broken arrangements which would have been so advantageous to you and avoid speaking on the subjects she somehow seems to write as if she knows her father's secret pen said yes she must know it and told the story which he had just heard from huckster of the interview at shepherd's inn it was not so that she described the meeting said laura and going to her desk produced from it that letter of blanche's which mentioned her visit to shepherd's inn another disappointment only the chevalier strong and a friend of his in the room this was all that blanche had said but she was bound to keep her father's secret pen laura added and yet and yet it is very puzzling the puzzle was this that for three weeks after this eventful discovery blanche had been only too eager about her dearest arthur was urging as strongly as so much modesty could urge the completion of the happy arrangements which were to make her arthur's for ever and now it seemed as if something had interfered to mar these happy arrangements as if arthur poor was not quite so agreeable to blanche as arthur rich and a member of parliament as if there was some mystery at last she said tunbridge wells is not very far off is it arthur hadn't you better go and see her they had been in town a week and neither had thought of that simple plan before End of chapter seventy three chapter seventy four of the history of pendennis this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the history of pendennis by william makepeace thackeray chapter seventy four shows how arthur had better have taken a return ticket the train carried arthur only too quickly to tunbridge though he had time to review all the circumstances of his life 
as he made the brief journey and to acknowledge to what sad conclusions his selfishness and waywardness had led him here is the end of hopes and aspirations thought he of romance and ambitions where i yield or where i am obstinate i am alike unfortunate my mother implores me and i refuse an angel say i had taken her forced on me as she was laura would never have been an angel to me i could not have given her my heart at another's instigation i never could have known her as she is had i been obliged to ask another to interpret her qualities and point out her virtues i yield to my uncle's solicitations and accept on his guarantee blanche and a seat in parliament and wealth and ambition and a career and see fortune comes and leaves me the wife without the dowry which i had taken in compensation of a heart why was i not more honest or am i not less so it would have cost my poor old uncle no pangs to accept blanche's fortune whencesoever it came he can't even understand he is bitterly indignant heart-stricken almost at the scruples which actuate me in refusing it i dissatisfy everybody a maimed weak imperfect wretch it seems as if i am unequal to any fortune i neither make myself nor any one connected with me happy what prospect is there for this poor little frivolous girl who is to take my obscure name and share my fortune i have not even ambition to excite me or self-esteem enough to console myself much more her for my failure if i were to write a book that should go through twenty editions why i should be the very first to sneer at my reputation say i could succeed at the bar and achieve a fortune by bullying witnesses and twisting evidence is that a fame which would satisfy my longings or a calling in which my life would be well spent how i wish i could be that priest opposite who never has lifted his eyes from his breviary except when we were in Rygate tunnel when he could not see or that old gentleman next him who scowls at him with eyes of hatred over his newspaper the priest shuts his eyes to the world but has his thoughts on the book which is his directory to the world to come his neighbour hates him as a monster tyrant persecutor and fancies burning martyrs and that pale countenance looking on and lighted up by the flame these have no doubts these march on trustfully bearing their load of logic would you like to look at the paper sir here interposed the stout gentleman it had a flaming article against the order of the black-coated gentleman who was travelling with them in the carriage and pen thanked him and took it and pursued his reverie without reading two sentences of the journal and yet would you take either of those men's creeds with its consequences he thought ah me you must bear your own burthen fashion your own faith think your own thoughts and pray your own prayer to what mortal ear could i tell all if i had a mind or who could understand all who can tell another's shortcomings lost opportunities weigh the passions which overpower the defects which incapacitate reason what extent of truth and right his neighbour's mind is organised to perceive and to do what invisible and forgotten accident terror of you chance or mischance of fortune may have altered the whole current of life a grain of sand may alter it as the flinging of a pebble may end it who can weigh circumstances passions temptations that go to our good and evil account save one before whose awful wisdom we kneel and at whose mercy we ask absolution here it ends thought pen this day or to-morrow will wind up the account of my youth a weary retrospect alas a sad history with many a page i would fain not look back on but who has not been tired or fallen and who has escaped without scars from that struggle and his head fell on his breast and the young man's heart prostrated itself humbly and sadly before that throne where sits wisdom and love and pity for all and made its confession what matters about fame or poverty he thought if i marry this woman i have chosen may i have strength and will to be true to her and to make her happy if i have children pray god teach me to speak and to do the truth among them and to leave them an honest name there are no splendours for my marriage does my life deserve any i begin a new phase of it a better than the last may it be i pray heaven the train stopped at tunbridge as pen was making these reflections and he handed over the newspaper to his neighbour of whom he took leave while the foreign clergyman in the opposite corner still sat with his eyes on his book 
pen jumped out of the carriage then his carpet-bag in hand and briskly determined to face his fortune a fly carried him rapidly to lady clavering's house from the station and as he was transported thither arthur composed a little speech which he intended to address to blanche and which was really as virtuous honest and well-minded an oration as any man of his turn of mind and under his circumstances could have uttered the purport of it was blanche i cannot understand from your last letter what your meaning is or whether my fair and frank proposal to you is acceptable or no i think you know the reason which induces me to forego the worldly advantages which a union with you offered and which i could not accept without as i fancy being dishonoured if you doubt of my affection here i am ready to prove it let smirk be called in and let us be married out of hand and with all my heart i propose to keep my vow and to cherish you through life and to be a true and a loving husband to you from the fly arthur sprang out then to the hall door where he was met by a domestic whom he did not know the man seemed to be surprised at the approach of the gentleman with the carpet-bag which he made no attempt to take from arthur's hands her ladyship's not at home sir the man remarked i am mr pendennis arthur said where is lightfoot lightfoot is gone answered the man my lady is out and my orders was i hear miss amory's voice in the drawing-room said arthur take the bag to a dressing-room if you please and passing by the porter he walked straight towards that apartment from which as the door opened a warble of melodious notes issued our little siren was at her piano singing with all her might and fascinations master clavering was asleep on the sofa indifferent to the music but near blanche sat a gentleman who was perfectly enraptured with her strain which was of a passionate and melancholy nature as the door opened the gentleman started up with hello the music stopped with a little shriek from the singer frank clavering woke up from the sofa and arthur came forward and said what foker how do you do foker he looked at the piano and there by miss amory's side was just such another purple leather box as he had seen in harry's hand three days before when the heir of logwood was coming out of a jeweller's shop in waterloo place it was opened and curled round the white satin cushion within was oh such a magnificent serpentine bracelet with such a blazing ruby head and diamond tail how do you do pendennis said foker blanche made many motions of the shoulders and gave signs of unrest and agitation and she put her handkerchief over the bracelet and then she advanced with a hand which trembled very much to greet pen how is dearest laura she said the face of foker looking up from his profound mourning that face so piteous and puzzled was one which the reader's imagination must depict for himself also that of master frank clavering who looking at the three interesting individuals with an expression of the utmost knowingness had only time to ejaculate the words here's a jolly go and to disappear sniggering pen too had restrained himself up to that minute but looking still at foker whose ears and cheeks tingled with blushes arthur burst out into a fit of laughter so wild and loud that it frightened blanche much more than any the most serious exhibition and this was the secret was it don't blush and turn away foker my boy why man you are a pattern of fidelity could i stand between blanche and such constancy could i stand between miss amory and fifteen thousand a year it is not that mr pendennis blanche said with great dignity it is not money it is not rank it is not gold that moves me but it is constancy it is fidelity it is a whole trustful loving heart offered to me that i treasure yes that i treasure and she made for her handkerchief but reflecting what was underneath it she paused i do not disown i do not disguise my life is above disguise to him on whom it is bestowed my heart must be for ever bare that i once thought i loved you yes thought i was beloved by you i own how i clung to that faith how i strove i prayed i longed to believe it but your conduct always your own words so cold so heartless so unkind have undeceived me you trifled with the heart of the poor maiden you flung me back with scorn the troth which i had plighted i have explained all all to mr foker that you have said foker with devotion and conviction in his looks what all 
said pen with a meaning look at blanche it is i am in fault is it well well blanche be it so i won't appeal against your sentence and bear it in silence i came down here looking to very different things heaven knows and with a heart most truly and kindly disposed towards you i hope you may be happy with another as on my word it was my wish to make you so and i hope my honest old friend here will have a wife worthy of his loyalty his constancy and affection indeed they deserve the regard of any woman even miss blanche amory shake hands harry don't look askance at me has anybody told you that i was a false and heartless character i think you're a foker was beginning in his wrath when blanche interposed henry not a word i pray you let there be forgiveness you're an angel by jove you're an angel said foker at which blanche looked seraphically up to the chandelier in spite of what has passed for the sake of what has passed i must always regard arthur as a brother the seraph continued we have known each other years we have trodden the same fields and plucked the same flowers together arthur henry i beseech you to take hands and to be friends forgive you i forgive you arthur with my heart i do should i not do so for making me so happy there is only one person of us three whom i pity blanche arthur said gravely and i say to you again that i hope you will make this good fellow this honest and loyal creature happy happy oh heavens said harry he could not speak his happiness gushed out at his eyes she don't know she can't know how fond i am of her and and who am i a poor little beggar and she takes me up and says she'll try and i i love me i ain't worthy of so much happiness give us your hand old boy since she forgives you after your heartless conduct and says she loves you i'll make you welcome i tell you i'll love everybody who loves her by goodness if she tells me to kiss the ground i'll kiss it tell me to kiss the ground i say tell me i love you so you see i love you so blanche looked up seraphically again her gentle bosom heaved she held out one hand as if to bless harry and then royally permitted him to kiss it she took up the pocket-handkerchief and hid her own eyes as the other fair hand was abandoned to poor harry's tearful embrace i swear that is a villain who deceives such a loving creature as that said pen blanche laid down the handkerchief and put hand number two softly on foker's head which was bent down kissing and weeping over hand number one foolish boy she said it shall be loved as it deserves who could help loving such a silly creature and at this moment frank clavering broke in upon the sentimental trio i say pendennis he said well frank the man wants to be paid and go back he's had some beer i'll go back with him cried pen good-bye blanche god bless you foker old friend you know neither of you want me here he longed to be off that instant stay i must say one word to you one word in private if you please blanche said you can trust us together can't you henry the tone in which the word henry was spoken and the appeal ravished foker with delight trust you said he oh who wouldn't trust you come along frankie my boy let's have a cigar said frank as they went into the hall she don't like it said foker gently law bless you she don't mind pendennis used to smoke regular said the candid youth it was but a short word i had to say said blanche to pen with great calm when they were alone you never loved me mr pendennis i told you how much said arthur i never deceived you i suppose you would go back and marry laura continued blanche was that what you had to say said pen you were going to her this very night i am sure of it there is no denying it you never cared for me et vous et moi c'est différent i have been spoilt early i cannot live out of the world out of excitement i could have done so but it is too late if i cannot have emotions i must have the world 
you would offer me neither one nor the other you are blasé in everything even in ambition you had a career before you and you would not take it you give it up for what for a bêtise for an absurd scruple why would you not have that seat and be such a puritain why should you refuse what is mine by right by right entendez-vous you know all then said pen only within a month but i have suspected ever since Baymouth, and namport since when it is not too late he is as if he had never been and there is a position in the world before you yet why not sit in parliament exert your talent and give a place in the world to yourself to your wife i take celui-là il est bon il est riche il est vous les connaissez autant que moi enfin think you that i would not prefer un homme qui fera parler de moi if the secret appears i am rich a millions how does it affect me it is not my fault it will never appear you will tell harry everything won't you je comprends vous refusez said blanche savagely i will tell harry at my own time when we are married you will not betray me will you you having a defenceless girl's secret will not turn upon her and use it s'il me plaît de la cacher mon secret pourquoi le donnerai je je l'aime mon pauvre père voyez-vous i would rather live with that man than with you fades intriguers of the world i must have emotions il m'en donne il m'écrit il écrit très bien voyez-vous comme un pirate comme un bohémien comme un homme but for this i would have said to my mother ma mère quittant ce lâche mari cette lâche société retournant à mon père the pirate would have wearied you like the rest said pen eh il me faut des émotions said blanche pen had never seen her or known so much about her in all the years of their intimacy as he saw and knew now though he saw more than existed in reality for this young lady was not able to carry out any emotion to the full but had a sham enthusiasm a sham hatred a sham love a sham taste a sham grief each of which flared and shone very vehemently for an instant but subsided and gave place to the next sham emotion End of chapter seventy four chapter seventy five of the history of pendennis this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the history of pendennis by william makepeace thackeray chapter seventy five a chapter of matchmaking upon the platform at tunbridge pen fumed and fretted until the arrival of the evening train to london a full half hour six hours it seemed to him but even this immense interval was passed the train arrived the train sped on the london lights came in view a gentleman who forgot his carpet-bag in the train rushed at a cab and said to the man drive as hard as you can go to jermyn street the cabman although a handsome cabman said thank you for the gratuity which was put into his hand and pen ran up the stairs of the hotel to lady rockminster's apartments laura was alone in the drawing-room reading with a pale face by the lamp the pale face looked up when pen opened the door may we follow him the great moments of life are but moments like the others your doom is spoken in a word or two a single look from the eyes a mere pressure of the hand may decide it or of the lips though they cannot speak when lady rockminster who has had her after-dinner nap gets up and goes into her sitting-room we may enter with her ladyship upon my word young people are the first words she says and her attendant makes wondering eyes over her shoulder and well may she say so 
and well may the attendant cast wondering eyes for the young people are in an attitude and pen in such a position as every young lady who reads this has heard tell of or has seen or hopes or at any rate deserves to see in a word directly he entered the room pen went up to laura of the pale face who had not time even to say what back so soon and seizing her outstretched and trembling hand just as she was rising from her chair fell down on his knees before her and said quickly i have seen her she has engaged herself to harry foker and and now laura the hand gives a pressure the eyes beam a reply the quivering lips answer though speechless pen's head sinks down in the girl's lap as he sobs out come and bless us dear mother and arms as tender as helen's once more enfold him in this juncture it is that lady rockminster comes in and says upon my word young people beck leave the room what do you want poking your nose in here pen starts up with looks of triumph still holding laura's hand she is consoling me for my misfortune ma'am he says what do you mean by kissing her hand i don't know what you will be next doing pen kissed her ladyships i have been to tunbridge he says and seen miss amory and find on my arrival that that a villain has transplanted me in her affections he says with a tragedy air is that all is that what you were whimpering on your knees about says the old lady growing angry you might have kept the news till to-morrow yes another has superseded me goes on pen but why call him villain he is brave he is constant he is young he is wealthy he is beautiful what stuff are you talking sir cried the old lady what has happened miss amory has jilted me and accepted henry foker esq i found her warbling ditties to him as he lay at her feet presents had been accepted vows exchanged these ten days harry was old mrs planter's rheumatism which kept dearest laura out of the house he is the most constant and generous of men he has promised the living of logwood to lady anne's husband and given her a splendid present on her marriage and he rushed to fling himself at blanche's feet the instant he found he was free and so as you can't get blanche you put up with laura is that it sir asked the old lady he acted nobly laura said i acted as she bade me said pen never mind how lady rockminster but to the best of my knowledge and power and if you mean that i am not worthy of laura i know it and pray heaven to better me and if the love and company of the best and purest creature in the world can do so at least i shall have these to help me hm hm replied the old lady to this looking with rather an appeased air at the young people it is all very well but i should have preferred bluebeard and now pen to divert the conversation from a theme which was growing painful to some parties present bethought him of his interview with huckster in the morning and of fanny bolton's affairs which he had forgotten under the immediate pressure and excitement of his own and he told the ladies how huckster had elevated fanny to the rank of wife and what terrors he was in respecting the arrival of his father he described the scene with considerable humour taking care to dwell especially upon that part of it which concerned fanny's coquetry and irrepressible desire of captivating mankind his meaning being you see laura i was not so guilty in that little affair it was the girl who made love to me and i who resisted as i am no longer present the little siren practises her arts and fascinations upon others let that transaction be forgotten in your mind if you please or visit me with a very gentle punishment for my error laura understood his meaning under the eagerness of his explanations if you did any wrong you repented dear pen she said and you know she added with meaning eyes and blushes that i have no right to reproach you hm grumbled the old lady i should have preferred bluebeard the past is broken away the morrow is before us i will do my best to make your morrow happy dear laura pen said his heart was humbled by the prospect of his happiness it stood awe-stricken in the contemplation of her sweet goodness and purity he liked his wife better than she had owned to that passing feeling for warrington and laid bare her generous heart to him and she 
very likely she was thinking how strange it is that i ever should have cared for another i am vexed almost to think i care for him so little am so little sorry that he has gone away oh in these past two months how i have learned to love arthur i care about nothing but arthur my waking and sleeping thoughts are about him he is never absent from me and to think that he is to be mine mine and that i am to marry him and not to be his servant as i expected to be only this morning for i would have gone down on my knees to blanche to beg her to let me live with him and now oh it is too much oh mother mother that you were here indeed she felt as if helen were there by her actually though invisibly a halo of happiness beamed from her she moved with a different step and bloomed with a new beauty arthur saw the change and the old lady rockminster remarked it with her shrewd eyes what a sly demure little wretch you have been she whispered to laura while pen in great spirits was laughing and telling his story about huckster and how you have kept your secret how are we to help the young couple said laura of course miss laura felt an interest in all young couples as generous lovers always love other lovers we must go and see them said pen of course we must go and see them said laura i intend to be very fond of fanny let us go this instant lady rockminster may i have the carriage go now why you stupid creature it is eleven o'clock at night mr and mrs huckster have got their nightcaps on i dare say and it is time for you to go now good night mr pendennis arthur and laura begged for ten minutes more we will go to-morrow morning then i will come and fetch you with martha an earl's coronet said pen who no doubt was pleased himself will have a great effect in lamb court and smithfield stay lady rockminster will you join us in a little conspiracy how do you mean conspiracy young man will you please to be a little ill to-morrow and when old mr huckster arrives will you let me call him in if he is put into a good humour at the notion of attending a baronet in the country what influence won't a countess have on him when he is softened when he is quite ripe we will break the secret upon him bring in the young people extort the paternal benediction and finish the comedy a parcel of stuff said the old lady take your hat sir come away miss there my head is turned another way good night young people and who knows but the old lady thought of her own early days as she went away on laura's arm nodding her head and humming to herself with the early morning came laura and martha according to appointment and the desired sensation was let us hope effected in lamb court whence the three proceeded to wait upon mr and mrs samuel huckster at their residence in charterhouse lane the two ladies looked at each other with great interest and not a little emotion on fanny's part she had not seen her guardian as she was pleased to call pen in consequence of his bequest since the event had occurred which had united her to mr huckster samuel told me how kind you had been she said you were always very kind mr pendennis and and i hope your friend is better who was took ill in shepherd's inn ma'am my name is laura said the other with a blush i am that is i was that is i am arthur's sister and we shall always love you for being so good to him when he was ill and when we live in the country i hope we shall see each other and i shall be always happy to hear of your happiness fanny we are going to do what you and huckster have done fanny where is huckster what nice snug lodgings you've got what a pretty cat while fanny is answering these questions in reply to pen laura says to herself well now really is this the creature about whom we were all so frightened what could he see in her she's a homely little thing but such manners well she was very kind to him bless her for that mr samuel had gone out to meet his pa mrs huckster said that the old gentleman was to arrive that day at the somerset coffee-house in the strand and fanny confessed that she was in a sad tremor about the meeting if his parent casts him off what are we to do she said i shall never pardon myself for bringing ruin on my husband's head you must intercede for us mr arthur if mortal man can you can bend and influence mr huckster senior fanny still regarded pen in the light of a superior being that was evident no doubt arthur thought of the past as he marked the solemn little tragedy airs and looks the little ways the little trepidations vanities of the little bride as soon as the interview was over entered messrs linton and blades who came of course to visit huckster 
and brought with them a fine fragrance of tobacco they had watched the carriage at the baker's door and remarked the coronet with awe they asked of fanny who was that uncommonly heavy swell who had just driven off and pronounced the countess was of the right sort and when they heard that it was mr pendennis and his sister they remarked that pen's father was only a sawbones and that he gave himself confounded airs they had been in huxter's company on the night of his little altercation with pen in the back kitchen returning homewards through fleet street and as laura was just stating to pen's infinite amusement that fanny was very well but that really there was no beauty in her there might be but she could not see it as they were locked near temple bar they saw young huckster returning to his bride the governor had arrived was at the somerset coffee-house was in tolerable good humour something about the railway but he had been afraid to speak about about that business would mr pendennis try it on pen said he would go and call at that moment upon mr huckster and see what might be done huckster jr would lurk outside whilst that awful interview took place the coronet on the carriage inspired his soul also with wonder and old mr huckster himself beheld it with delight as he looked from the coffee-house window on that strand which it was always a treat to him to survey and i can afford to give myself a lark sir said mr huckster shaking hands with pen of course you know the news we have got our bill sir we shall have our branch line our shares are up sir and we buy your three fields along the brawl and put a pretty penny into your pocket mr pendennis indeed that was good news pen remembered that there was a letter from mr tatham at chambers these three days but he had not opened the communication being interested with other affairs i hope you don't intend to grow rich and give us practice said pen we can't lose you at clavering mr huckster though i hear very good accounts of your son my friend dr goodenough speaks most highly of his talents it is hard that a man of your eminence though should be kept in a country town the metropolis would have been my sphere of action sir said mr huckster surveying the strand but a man takes his business where he finds it and i succeeded to that of my father it was my father's too said pen i sometimes wished i had followed it you sir have taken a more lofty career said the old gentleman you aspire to the senate and to literary honours you wield the poet's pen sir and move in the circles of fashion we keep an eye upon you at clavering we read your name in the lists of the select parties of the nobility why it was only the other day that my wife was remarking how odd it was that at a party at the earl of kidderminster's your name was not mentioned to what member of the aristocracy may i ask does that equipage belong from which i saw you descend the countess dowager of rockminster how is her ladyship her ladyship is not very well and when i heard that you were coming to town i strongly urged her to see you mr huckster pen said old huckster felt if he had a hundred votes for clavering he would give them all to pen there is an old friend of yours in the carriage a clavering lady too will you come out and speak to her asked pen the old surgeon was delighted to speak to a coroneted carriage in the midst of the full strand he ran out bowing and smiling huckster jr dodging about the district beheld the meeting between his father and laura saw the latter put out her hand and presently after a little colloquy with pen beheld his father actually jump into the carriage and drive away with miss bell there was no room for arthur who came back laughing to the young surgeon and told him whither his parent was bound during the whole of the journey that artful laura coaxed and wheedled and cajoled him so adroitly that the old gentleman would have granted her anything and lady rockminster achieved the victory over him by complimenting him on his skill and professing her anxiety to consult him what were her ladyship's symptoms should he meet her ladyship's usual medical attendant mr jones was called out of town he should be delighted to devote his very best the energies and experience to her ladyship's service he was so charmed with his patient that he wrote home about her to his wife and family he talked of nothing but lady rockminster to samuel when that youth came to partake of beefsteak and oyster sauce and accompany his parent to the play there was a simple grandeur a polite urbanity a high-bred grace about her ladyship which he had never witnessed in any woman her symptoms did not seem alarming he had prescribed spur amon aromat with a little spur mint pip and orange flower which would be all that was necessary miss bell seemed to be on the most confidential and affectionate footing with her ladyship she was about to form a matrimonial connection all young people ought to marry such were her ladyship's words and the countess condescended to ask respecting my own family 
and i mentioned you by name to her ladyship sam my boy i shall look in to-morrow when if the remedies which i have prescribed for her ladyship have had the effect which i anticipate i shall probably follow them up by a little spur lathen comp and so set my noble patient up what is the theatre which is most frequented by the by the higher classes in town hey sam and to what amusement will you take an old country doctor to-night hey sir on the next day when mr huckster called in jermyn street at twelve o'clock lady rockminster had not yet left her room but miss bell and mr pendennis were in waiting to receive him lady rockminster had had a most comfortable night and was getting on as well as possible how had mr huckster amused himself at the theatre with his son what a capital piece it was and how charmingly mrs o'leary looked and sang it and what a good fellow young huckster was liked by everybody an honour to his profession he is not his father's manners i grant you or that old-world tone which is passing away from us but a more excellent sterling fellow never lived he ought to practise in the country whatever you do sir said arthur he ought to marry other people are going to do so and settle the very words that her ladyship used yesterday mr pendennis he ought to marry sam should marry sir the town is full of temptation sir continued pen the old gentleman thought of that hoary mrs o'leary there is no better safeguard for a young man than an early marriage with an honest affectionate creature no better sir no better and love is better than money isn't it indeed it is said miss bell i agree with so fair an authority said the old gentleman with a bow and and suppose sir pen said that i had a piece of news to communicate to you god bless my soul mr pendennis what do you mean asked the old gentleman suppose i had to tell you that a young man carried away by an irresistible passion for an admirable and most virtuous young creature whom everybody falls in love with had consulted the dictates of reason and his heart and had married suppose i were to tell you that the man is my friend that our excellent our truly noble friend the countess dowager of rockminster is truly interested about him and you may fancy what a young man can do in life when that family is interested for him suppose i were to tell you that you know him that he is here that he is sam married god bless my soul sir you don't mean that and to such a nice creature dear mr huckster her ladyship is charmed with her said pen telling almost the first fib which he has told in the course of this story married the rascal is he thought the old gentleman they will do it sir said pen and went and opened the door mr and mrs samuel huckster issued thence and both came and knelt down before the old gentleman the kneeling little fanny found favour in his sight and must have been something attractive about her in spite of laura's opinion we'll never do so any more sir said sam get up sir said mr huckster and they got up and fanny came a little nearer and a little nearer still and looked so pretty and pitiful that somehow mr huckster found himself kissing the little crying laughing thing and feeling as if he liked it what's your name my dear he said after a minute of this sport fanny papa said mrs samuel End of chapter seventy five chapter seventy six of the history of pendennis this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the history of pendennis by william makepeace thackeray chapter seventy six exeunt omnis our characters are all a month older than they were when the last described adventures and conversations occurred and a great number of the personages of our story have chanced to reassemble at the little country town where we were first introduced to them frederick lightfoot formerly maitre d'hotel in the service of sir francis clavering of clavering park baronet has begged leave to inform the nobility and gentry of blankshire that he has taken that well-known and comfortable hotel the clavering arms in clavering where he hopes for the continued patronage of the gentlemen and families of the county this ancient and well-established house mr lightfoot's manifesto states has been repaired and decorated in a style of the greatest comfort gentlemen hunting with the dumpling bear hounds will find excellent stabling and loose boxes for horses at the clavering arms a commodious billiard room has been attached to the hotel and the cellars have been furnished with the choicest wines and spirits selected without regard to expense by c l commercial gentlemen will find the clavering arms a most comfortable place of resort 
and the scale of charges has been regulated for all so as to meet the economical spirit of the present times indeed there is a considerable air of liveliness about the old inn the clavering arms have been splendidly repainted over the gateway the coffee-room windows are bright and fresh and decorated with christmas holly the magistrates have met in petty sessions in the card-room of the old assembly the farmer's ordinary is held as of old and frequented by increased numbers who are pleased with mrs lightfoot's cuisine her indian curries and mulligatawny soup are especially popular major stokes the respected tenant of fair oaks cottage captain glanders h p and other resident gentry have pronounced in their favour and have partaken of them more than once both in private and at the dinner of the clavering institute attendant on the incorporation of the reading-room and when the chief inhabitants of that flourishing little town met together and did justice to the hostess's excellent cheer the chair was taken by sir francis clavering baronet supported by the esteemed rector dr portman the vice-chair being ably filled by barker esq supported by the rev j simcoe and the rev s giles the enterprising head of the ribbon factory in clavering and chief director of the clavering and chatteris branch of the great western railway which will be opened in another year and upon the works of which the engineers and workmen are now busily engaged an interesting event which is likely to take place in the life of our talented townsman arthur pendennis esq has we understand caused him to relinquish the intentions which he had of offering himself as a candidate for our borough and rumour whispers says the chatteris champion clavering agriculturist and baymouth fisherman that independent county paper so distinguished for its unswerving principles and loyalty to the british oak and so eligible a medium for advertisements rumour states that the c c c a and b f that should sir francis clavering's failing health oblige him to relinquish his seat in parliament he will vacate it in favour of a young gentleman of colossal fortune and related to the highest aristocracy of the empire who is about to contract a matrimonial alliance with an accomplished and lovely lady connected by the nearest ties with the respective family at clavering park lady clavering and miss amory have arrived at the park for the christmas holidays and we understand that a large number of the aristocracy are expected and that festivities of a peculiarly interesting nature will take place there at the commencement of the new year the ingenious reader will be enabled by the help of the above announcement to understand what has taken place during the little break which has occurred in our narrative although lady rockminster grumbled a little at laura's preference for pendennis over bluebeard those who are aware of the latter's secret will understand that the young girl could make no other choice and the kind old lady who had constituted herself miss bell's guardian was not ill-pleased that she was to fulfil the great purpose in life of young ladies and mary she informed her maid of the interesting event that very night and of course mrs beck who was perfectly aware of every single circumstance and kept by martha of fair oaks in the fullest knowledge of what was passing was immensely surprised and delighted mr pendennis's income is so much the railroad will give him so much more he states miss bell has so much and may probably have a little more one day for persons in their degree they will be able to manage very well and i shall speak to my nephew pincent who i suspect was once rather attached to her but of course that was out of the question oh of course my lady i should think so indeed not that you know anything whatever about it or have any business to think at all on the subject i shall speak to george pincent who is now chief secretary of the tape and sealing wax office and have mr pendennis made something and beck in the morning you will carry down my compliments to major pendennis and say that i shall pay him a visit at one o'clock yes muttered the old lady the major must be reconciled and he must leave his fortune to laura's children accordingly at one o'clock the dowager lady rockminster appeared at major pendennis's who was delighted as may be imagined to receive so noble a visitor the major had been prepared if not for the news which her ladyship was about to give him at least with the intelligence that pen's marriage with miss amory was broken off the young gentleman bethinking him of his uncle for the first time that day it must be owned and meeting his new servant in the hall of the hotel asked after the major's health from mr frosh and then went into the coffee-room of the hotel where he wrote a half-dozen lines to acquaint his guardian with what had occurred dear uncle he said if there has been any question between us it is over now i went to tunbridge wells yesterday and found that somebody else had carried off the prize about which we were hesitating 
miss a without any compunction for me has bestowed herself upon harry foker with his fifteen thousand a year i came in suddenly upon their loves and found and left him in possession and you'll be glad to hear tatham writes me that he has sold three of my fields at fair oaks to the railroad company at a great figure i will tell you this and more when we meet and am always your affectionate a p i think i'm aware of what you were about to tell me the major said with a most courtly smile and bow to pen's ambassadress it was a very great kindness of your ladyship to think of bringing me the news how well you look how very good you are how very kind you have always been to that young man it was for the sake of his uncle said lady rockminster most politely he has informed me of the state of affairs and written me a nice note yes a nice note continued the old gentleman and i find he has had an increase to his fortune yes and all things considered i don't much regret that his affair with miss amory is manque though i wished for it once in fact all things considered i am very glad of it we must console him major pendennis continued the lady we must get him a wife the truth then came across the major's mind and he saw for what purpose lady rockminster had chosen to assume the office of ambassadress it is not necessary to enter into the conversation which ensued or to tell at any length how her ladyship concluded a negotiation which in truth was tolerably easy there could be no reason why pen should not marry according to his own and his mother's wish and as for lady rockminster she supported the marriage by intimations which had very great weight with the major but of which we shall say nothing as her ladyship now of course much advanced in years is still alive and the family might be angry and in fine the old gentleman was quite overcome by the determined graciousness of the lady and her fondness for laura nothing indeed could be more bland and kind than lady rockminster's whole demeanour except for one moment when the major talked about his boy throwing himself away at which her ladyship broke out into a little speech in which she made the major understand what poor pen and his friends acknowledged very humbly that laura was a thousand times too good for him laura was fit to be the wife of a king laura was a paragon of virtue and excellence and it must be said that when major pendennis found that a lady of the rank of the countess of rockminster seriously admired miss bell he instantly began to admire her himself so that when herr frosch was requested to walk upstairs to lady rockminster's apartments and inform miss bell and mr arthur pendennis that the major would receive them and laura appeared blushing and happy as she hung on pen's arm the major gave a shaky hand to one and the other with unaffected emotion and cordiality and then went through another salutation to laura which caused her to blush still more happy blushes bright eyes beaming with the light of love the story-teller turns from this group to his young audience and hopes that one day their eyes may all shine so pen having retreated in the most friendly manner and the lovely blanche having bestowed her young affections upon a blushing bridegroom with fifteen thousand a year there was such an outbreak of happiness in lady clavering's heart and family as the good begum had not known for many a year and she and blanche were on the most delightful terms of cordiality and affection the ardent foker pressed onwards the happy day and was as anxious as might be expected to abridge the period of mourning which had put him in possession of so many charms and amiable qualities of which he had been only as it were the heir apparent not the actual owner until then the gentle blanche everything that her affianced lord could desire was not averse to gratify the wishes of her fond henry lady clavering came up from tunbridge milliners and jewellers were set to work and engaged to prepare the delightful paraphernalia of hymen lady clavering was in such a good humour that sir francis even benefited by it and such a reconciliation was effected between this pair that sir francis came to london sat at the head of his own table once more and appeared tolerably flush of money at his billiard rooms and gambling houses again one day when major pendennis and arthur went to dine in grosvenor place they found an old acquaintance established in the quality of major-domo and the gentleman in black who with perfect politeness and gravity offered them their choice of sweet or dry champagne was no other than mr james morgan the chevalier strong was one of the party he was in high spirits and condition and entertained the company with accounts of his amusements abroad it was my lady who invited me said strong to arthur under his voice that fellow morgan looked as black as thunder when i came in he is about no good here i will go away first and wait for you and major pendennis at hyde park gate mr morgan helped major pendennis to his great coat when he was quitting the house and muttered something about having accepted a temporary engagement with the clavering family i have got a paper of yours mr morgan said the old gentleman 
which you can show if you please to sir francis sir and perfectly welcome said mr morgan with downcast eyes i am very much obliged to you major pendennis and if i can pay you for all your kindness i will arthur overheard the sentence and saw the look of hatred which accompanied it suddenly cried out that he had forgotten his handkerchief and ran upstairs to the drawing-room again foker was still there still lingering about his siren pen gave the siren a look full of meaning and we supposed that the siren understood meaning looks for when after finding the voracious handkerchief of which he came in quest he once more went out the siren with a laughing voice said oh arthur mr pendennis i want you to tell dear laura something and she came out to the door what is it she asked shutting the door have you told harry do you know that villain morgan knows all i know it she said have you told harry no no she said you won't betray me morgan will said pen no he won't said blanche i promised him namport wait until after our marriage oh until after our marriage oh how wretched i am said the girl who had been all smiles and grace and gaiety during the evening arthur said i beg and implore you to tell harry tell him now it is no fault of yours he will pardon you anything tell him to-night and give her this il est là with my love please and i beg your pardon for calling you back and if she will be at madame quinolan's at half-past three and if lady rockminster can spare her i should so like to drive with her in the park and she went in singing and kissing her little hand as morgan the velvet footed came up the carpeted stair pen heard blanche's piano breaking out into brilliant music as he went down to join his uncle and they walked away together arthur briefly told him what he had done what was to be done he asked what is to be done begad said the old gentleman what is to be done but to leave it alone begad let us be thankful said the old fellow with a shudder that we are out of the business and leave it to those it concerns i hope to heaven she'll tell him said pen begad she'll take her own course said the old man miss amory is a devilish wide-awake girl sir and must play her own cards and i'm deuce glad you are out of it deuce glad begad who's this smoking oh it's mr strong again he wants to put in his oar i suppose i tell you don't meddle in the business arthur strong began once or twice as if to converse upon the subject but the major would not hear a word he remarked on the moonlight on apsley house the weather the cab stands anything but that subject he bowed stiffly to strong and clung to his nephew's arm as he turned down st james's street and again cautioned pen to leave the affair alone it had like to have cost you so much sir that you may take my advice he said when arthur came out of the hotel strong's cloak and cigar were visible a few doors off the jolly chevalier laughed as they met i'm an old soldier too he said i wanted to talk to you pendennis i've heard of all that has happened and all the chops and changes that have taken place during my absence i congratulate you on your marriage and i congratulate you on your escape too you understand me it was not my business to speak but i know this that a certain party is as errant a little well well never mind what you acted like a man and a trump and are well out of it i have no reason to complain said pen i went back to beg and entreat poor blanche to tell foker all i hope for her sake she will but i fear not there is but one policy strong there is but one and lucky he that can stick to it said the chevalier that rascal morgan means mischief he has been lurking about our chambers for the last two months he has found out that poor mad devil amory's secret he has been trying to discover where he was he has been pumping mr bolton and making old costigan drunk several times he bribed the inn porter to tell him when he came back and he has got into clavering's service on the strength of his information he will get very good pay for it mark my words the villain where is amory asked pen at bologna i believe i left him there and warned him not to come back i have broken with him after a desperate quarrel such as one might have expected with such a madman and i am glad to think that he is in my debt now and that i have been the means of keeping him out of more harms than one he has lost all his winnings i suppose said pen no he is rather better than when he went away or was a fortnight ago he had extraordinary luck at baden broke the bank several nights and was the fable of the place he lied himself there with a fellow by the name of blond who gathered about him a society of all sorts of sharpers male and female russians germans french english amory got so insolent that i was obliged to thrash him one day within an inch of his life i couldn't help myself the fellow has plenty of pluck and i had nothing for it but to hit out and did he call you out said pen you think if i had shot him i should have done nobody any harm no sir i waited for his challenge but it never came and the next time i met him he begged my pardon and said strong i beg your pardon you whopped me and you served me right i shook hands but i couldn't live with him after that i paid him what i owed him the night before said strong with a blush i pawned everything to pay him 
and then i went with my last ten florins and had a shy at the roulette if i had lost i should have let him shoot me in the morning i was weary of my life by jove sir isn't it a shame that a man like me who may have had a few bills out but who never deserted a friend or did an unfair action shouldn't be able to turn his hand to anything to get bread i made a good night sir at roulette and i done with that i'm going into the wine business my wife's relations live at cadiz i intend to bring over spanish wine and hams there's a fortune to be made by it sir a fortune here's my card if you want any sherry or hams recollect ned strong is your man and the chevalier pulled out a handsome card stating that strong and company shepherds inn were sole agents of the celebrated diamond manzanilla of the duke of garbanzos grandee of spain of the first class and of the famous deboso hams fed on acorns only in the country of don quixote come and taste em sir come and try em at my chambers you see i've an eye to business and by jove this time i'll succeed pen laughed as he took the card i don't know whether i shall be allowed to go to bachelor's parties he said you know i'm going to but you must have sherry sir you must have sherry i will have it from you depend on it said the other and i think you are very well out of your other partnership that worthy ultimate and his daughter correspond i hear pen added after a pause yes she wrote him the longest rigmarole letters that i used to read the sly little devil and he answered under cover to mrs bonner he was for carrying her off the first day or two and nothing would content him but having back his child but she didn't want to come as you may fancy and he was not very eager about it here the chevalier burst out in a laugh why sir do you know what was the cause of our quarrel and boxing match there was a certain widow at baden a madame la baronne de la cranche casse who was not much better than himself and whom the scoundrel wanted to marry and would but that i told her he was married already i don't think that she was much better than he was i saw her on the pier at bologna the day i came to england and now we have brought up our narrative to the point whither the announcement in the chatteris champion had already conducted us it wanted but very very few days before that blissful one in folker should call blanche his own the clavering folks had all pressed to see the most splendid new carriage in the whole world which was standing in the coach-house at the clavering arms and shone in grateful return for drink commonly by mr folker's head coachman madame fridsby was occupied in making some lovely dresses for the tenants daughters who were to figure as a sort of bridesmaids chorus at the breakfast and marriage ceremony and immense festivities were to take place at the park upon this delightful occasion yes mr huckster yes a happy tenantry its country's pride will assemble in the baronial hall where the beards will wag all the ox shall be slain and the cup they'll drain and the bell shall peal quite genteel and my father-in-law with the tear of sensibility bedewing his eye shall bless us at his baronial porch that shall be the order of proceedings i think mr huckster and i hope we shall see you and your lovely bride by her husband's side and what will you please to drink sir mrs lightfoot madam you will give to my excellent friend and body surgeon mr huckster mr samuel huckster m r c s every refreshment that your hostel affords and place the festive amount to my account and mr lightfoot sir what will you take though you've had enough already i think yes ha so spoke harry foker in the bar of the clavering arms he had apartments at that hotel and had gathered a circle of friends round him there he treated all to drink who came he was hail fellow with every man he was so happy he danced round madame frisby mrs lightfoot's great ally as she sat pensive in the bar he consoled mrs lightfoot who had already begun to have causes of matrimonial disquiet for the truth must be told that young lightfoot having now the full command of the cellar had none over his own unbridled desires and was tippling and tipsy from morning till night and a piteous sight it was for his fond wife to behold the big youth reeling about the yard and coffee-room or drinking with the farmers and tradesmen his own neat wines and carefully selected stock of spirits when he could find time mr morgan the butler came from the park and took a glass at the expense of the landlord of the clavering arms he watched poor lightfoot's tipsy vagaries with savage sneers mrs lightfoot felt always doubly uncomfortable when her unhappy spouse was under his comrade's eye but a few months married and to think he had got to this madame frisby could feel for her madame frisby could tell her stories of men every bit as bad she had had her own woes too and her sad experience of men so it is that nobody seems happy altogether and that there's bitters as mr foker remarked in the cup of every man's life and yet there did not seem to be any in his the honest young fellow he was brimming over with happiness and good humour 
mr morgan was constant in his attentions to folker and yet i don't like him somehow said the candid young man to mrs lightfoot he always seems as if he was measuring me for my coffin somehow pa and laws afraid of him pa and laws a hem never mind but ma and laws a trump mrs lightfoot indeed my lady was and mrs lightfoot owned with a sigh that perhaps it had been better for her had she never left her mistress no i do not like thee dr fell the reason why i cannot tell continued mr foker and he wants to be taken as my head man blanche wants me to take him why does miss amory like him so did miss blanche like him so the notion seemed to disturb mrs lightfoot very much and there came to this worthy landlady another cause for disturbance a letter bearing the bologna postmark was brought to her one morning and she and her husband were quarrelling over it as foker passed down the stairs by the bar on his way to the park his custom was to breakfast there and bask a while in the presence of armida then as the company of clavering tired him exceedingly and he did not care for sporting he would return for an hour or two to billiards and the society of the clavering arms then it would be time to ride with miss amory and after dining with her he left her and returned modestly to his inn lightfoot and his wife were quarrelling over the letter what was that letter from abroad why was she always having letters from abroad who wrote em he would know he didn't believe it was her brother it was no business of his it was a business of his and with a curse he seized hold of his wife and dashed at her pocket for the letter the poor woman gave a scream and said well take it just as her husband seized on the letter and mr foker entered at the door she gave another scream at seeing him and once more tried to seize the paper lightfoot opened it shaking her away and an enclosure dropped down on the breakfast-table hands off man alive cried little harry springing in don't lay hands on a woman sir the man that lays his hand upon a woman save in the way of kindness is a hallo it's a letter for miss amory what's this mrs lightfoot mrs lightfoot began in piteous tones of reproach to her husband you unmanly to treat a woman so who took you off the street oh you coward to lay your hand upon your wife why did i marry you why did i leave my lady for you why did i spend eight hundred pound in fitting up this house that you might drink and guzzle she gets letters and she won't tell me who writes letters said mr lightfoot with a muzzy voice it's a family affair sir will you take anything sir i will take this letter to miss amory as i am going to the park said foker turning very pale and taking it up from the table which was arranged for the poor landlady's breakfast he went away he's comin dammy who's a comin who's j a mrs lightfoot curse me who's j a cried the husband mrs lightfoot cried out be quiet you tipsy brute do and running to her bonnet and shawl threw them on saw mr foker walking down the street took the by lane which skirts it and ran as quickly as she could to the lodge gate clavering park foker saw a running figure before him but it was lost when he got to the lodge gate he stopped and asked who was that who had just come in mrs bonner was it he reeled almost in his walk the trees swam before him he rested once or twice against the trunks of the naked limes lady clavering was in the breakfast-room with her son and her husband yawning over his paper good morning harry said the begum here's letters lots of letters lady rockminster will be here on tuesday instead of monday and arthur and the major come to-day and laura is to go to dr portman's and come to church from there and what's the matter my dear what makes you so pale harry where is blanche asked harry in a sickening voice not down yet blanche is always the last said the boy eating muffins she's a regular dawdle she is when you're not here she lays in bed till lunch-time be quiet frank said the mother blanche came down presently looking pale and with rather an eager look towards foker then she advanced and kissed her mother and had a face beaming with her very best smiles on when she greeted harry how do you do sir she said and put out both her hands i'm ill answered harry i i brought a letter for you blanche a letter and from whom is it pray voyons she said i don't know i should like to know said foker how can i tell until i see it asked blanche has mrs bonner not told you he said with a shaking voice there's some secret you give her the letter lady clavering lady clavering wondering took the letter from poor foker's shaking hand and looked at the superscription as she looked at it she too began to shake in every limb and with a scared face she dropped the letter and running up to frank clutched the boy to her and burst out with a sob take that away it's impossible it's impossible what is the matter cried blanche with rather a ghastly smile the letter is only from from a poor pensioner and relative of ours it's not true it's not true screamed lady clavering no my frank is it clavering blanche had taken up the letter and was moving with it towards the fire but foker ran to her and clutched her arm i must see that letter he said give it me you shan't burn it you you shall not treat miss amory so in my house cried the baronet give back the letter by jove read it and look at her blanche cried pointing to her mother 
yet it was for her i kept the secret read it cruel man and foker opened and read the letter i have not wrote my darling betsy this three weeks but this is to give her a father's blessing and i shall come down pretty soon as quick as my note and intend to see the ceremony and my son-in-law i shall put up at bonner's i have had a pleasant autumn and am staying here at a hotel where there is good company and which is kept in good style i don't know whether i quite approve of your throwing over mr p for mr f and don't think foker is such a pretty name and from your account of him he seems a muff and not a beauty but he has got the rowdy which is the thing so no more my dear little betsy till we meet from your affectionate father j emery altamont read it lady clavering it is too late to keep it from you now said poor foker and the distracted woman having cast her eyes over again broke out into hysterical screams and convulsively grasped her son they have made an outcast of you my boy she said they've dishonoured your old mother but i'm innocent frank before god i'm innocent i didn't know this mr foker indeed indeed i didn't i'm sure you didn't said foker going up and kissing her hand generous generous harry cried out blanche in an ecstasy but he withdrew his hand which was upon her side and turned from her with a quivering lip that's different he says it was for her sake for her sake harry again miss amory is in an attitude there was something to be done for mine said foker i would have taken you whatever you were everything's talked about in london i knew that your father had come to to grief you don't think it was it was for your connection i married you durn it all i've loved you with all my heart and soul for two years and you've been playing with me and cheating me broke out the young man with a cry oh blanche blanche it's a hard thing a hard thing and he covered his face with his hands and sobbed behind them blanche thought why didn't i tell him that night when arthur warned me don't refuse her harry cried out lady clavering take her take everything i have it's all hers you know at my death this boy's disinherited master frank who had been looking as scared at the strange scene here burst into a loud cry take every shilling give me just enough to live in to go and hide my head with this child and to fly from both oh they've both been bad bad men perhaps he's here now don't let me see him clavering you coward defend me from him clavering started up at this proposal you ain't serious jemima you don't mean that he said you won't throw me and frank over i didn't know it so help me foker i'd no more idea of it than the dead until the fellow came and found me out the derned escaped convict scoundrel the what said foker blanche gave a scream yes screamed out the baronet in his turn yes a derned runaway convict a fellow that forged his father-in-law's name um, a derned attorney and killed a fellow in botany bay hang him and ran into the bush curse him i wish he'd died there and he came to me a good six years ago and robbed me and i've been ruining myself to keep him the infernal scoundrel and pendennis knows it and strong knows it and that baron morgan knows it and she knows it ever so long and i never would tell it never and i kept it from my wife and you saw him and you didn't kill him clavering you coward said the wife of amory come away frank your father's a coward i'm dishonoured but i'm your old mother and you'll you'll love me won't you blanche a plori went up to her mother but lady clavering shrank from her with a sort of terror don't touch me she said you've no heart you never had i see all now i see why that coward was going to give up his place in parliament to arthur yes that coward and why you threatened that you would make me give you half frank's fortune and when arthur offered to marry you without a shilling because he wouldn't rob my boy you left him and you took poor harry have nothing to do with her harry you're good you are don't marry that that convict's daughter come away frank my darling come to your poor old mother we'll hide ourselves but we're honest yes we are honest all this while a strange feeling of exultation had taken possession of blanche's mind that month with poor harry had been a weary month to her all his fortune and splendour scarcely sufficed to make the idea of himself supportable she was wearied of his simple ways and sick of coaxing and cajoling him stay mamma stay madame she cried out with a gesture which was always appropriate though rather theatrical i have no heart have i i keep the secret of my mother's shame i give up my rights to my half-brother and my bastard brother yes my rights and my fortune i don't betray my father and for this i have no heart i'll have my rights now and the laws of my country shall give them to me i appeal to my country's laws yes my country's laws the persecuted one returns this day i desire to go to my father and the little lady swept round her hand and thought that she was a heroine you will will you cried out clavering with one of his usual oaths i'm a magistrate and damn me i'll commit him here's a chaise coming perhaps it's him let him come a chaise was indeed coming up the avenue and the two women shrieked each their loudest expecting at that moment to see altamont arrive 
the door opened and mr morgan announced major pendennis and mr pendennis who entered and found all parties engaged in this fierce quarrel a large screen fenced the breakfast-room from the hall and it is probable that according to his custom mr morgan had taken advantage of the screen to make himself acquainted with all that occurred it had been arranged on the previous day that the young people should ride and at the appointed hour in the afternoon mr foker's horses arrived from the clavering arms but miss blanche did not accompany him on this occasion pen came out and shook hands with him on the doorsteps and harry foker rode away followed by his groom in mourning the whole transactions which have occupied the most active part of our history were debated by the parties concerned during those two or three hours many counsels had been given stories told and compromises suggested and at the end harry foker rode away with a sad god bless you from pen there was a dreary dinner at clavering park at which the lately installed butler did not attend and the ladies were both absent after dinner pen said i will walk down to clavering and see if he is come and he walked through the dark avenue across the bridge and rode by his own cottage the once quiet and familiar fields of which were flaming with the kilns and forges of the artificers employed on the new railroad works and so he entered the town and made for the clavering arms it was past midnight when he returned to clavering park he was exceedingly pale and agitated is lady clavering up yet he asked yes she was in her own sitting-room and he went up to her and there found the poor lady in a piteous state of tears and agitation it is i arthur he said looking in and entering he took her hand very affectionately and kissed it you were always the kindest of friends to me dear lady clavering he said i love you very much i have got some news for you don't call me by that name she said pressing his hand you were always a good boy arthur and it's kind of you to come now very kind you sometimes look very like your ma my dear dear good lady clavering arthur repeated with particular emphasis something very strange has happened has anything happened to him gasped lady clavering oh it's horrid to think i should be glad of it horrid he is well he has been and has gone my dear lady don't alarm yourself he is gone and you are lady clavering still is it true what he sometimes said to me she screamed out that he he was married before he married you said pen he has confessed it to-night he will never come back there came another shriek from lady clavering as she flung her arms round pen and kissed him and burst into tears on his shoulder what pen had to tell through a multiplicity of sobs and interruptions must be compressed briefly for behold our prescribed limit is reached and our tale is coming to its end with the branch coach from the railroad which had succeeded the old delacrity and perseverance amory arrived and was set down at the clavering arms he ordered his dinner at the place under his assumed name of altamont and being of a jovial turn he welcomed the landlord who was nothing loath to a share of his wine having extracted from mr lightfoot all the news regarding the family at the park and found from examining his host that mrs lightfoot as she said had kept his counsel he called for more wine of mr lightfoot and at the end of this symposium both being greatly excited went into mrs lightfoot's bar she was there taking tea with her friend madame fribsby and lightfoot by this time in such a happy state as not to be surprised at anything which might occur so that when altamont shook hands with mrs lightfoot as an old acquaintance the recognition did not appear to him to be in the least strange but only a reasonable cause for further drinking the gentlemen partook then of brandy and water which they offered to the ladies not heeding the terrified looks of one or the other whilst they were so engaged at about six o'clock in the evening mr morgan sir francis clavering's new man came in and was requested to drink he selected his favourite beverage and the parties engaged in general conversation after a while mr lightfoot began to doze mr morgan had repeatedly given hints to mrs fribsby to quit the premises but that lady strangely fascinated and terrified it would seem or persuaded by mrs lightfoot not to go kept her place her persistence occasioned much annoyance to mr morgan who vented his displeasure in such language as gave pain to mrs lightfoot and caused mr altamont to say that he was a rum customer and not polite to the sex the altercation between the two gentlemen became very painful to the women especially to mrs lightfoot who did everything to soothe mr morgan and under pretence of giving a pipe light to the stranger she handed him a paper on which she had privily written the words he knows you go there may have been something suspicious in her manner of handing or in her guests of reading the paper for when he got up a short time afterwards and said he would go to bed morgan rose too with a laugh and said it was too early to go to bed the stranger then said he would go to his bedroom morgan said he would show him the way at this the guest said come up i've got a brace of pistols up there to blow out the brains of any traitor or skulking spy and glared so fiercely upon morgan that the latter 
seizing hold of lightfoot by the collar and waking him said john amory i arrest you in the queen's name stand by me lightfoot this capture is worth a thousand pounds he put forward his hand as if to seize his prisoner but the other doubling his fist gave morgan with his left hand so fierce a blow on the chest that it knocked him back behind mr lightfoot the gentleman who was athletic and courageous said he would knock his guest's head off and prepared to do so as the stranger tearing off his coat and cursing both of his opponents roared to them to come on but with a piercing scream mrs lightfoot flung herself before her husband whilst with another and louder shriek madame fridsby ran to the stranger and calling out armstrong johnny armstrong seized hold of his naked arm on which a blue tattooing of a heart and m f were visible the ejaculation of madame fridsby seemed to astound and sober the stranger he looked down upon her and cried out it's polly by jove mrs fridsby continued to exclaim this is not amory this is johnny armstrong my wicked wicked husband married to me in st martin's church made on board an india man and he left me two months after the wicked wretch this is john armstrong here's the mark on his arm which he made for me the stranger said i am john armstrong sure enough polly i'm john armstrong amory altamont and let em all come on and try what they can do against a british sailor hooray who's for it morgan still called out arrest him but mrs lightfoot said arrest him arrest you you mean spy what stop the marriage and ruin my lady and take away the clavering arms from us did he say he'd take away the clavering arms from us asked mr lightfoot turning round hang him i'll throttle him keep him darling till the coach passes to the up train it'll be here now directly darned him i'll choke him if he stirs said lightfoot and so they kept morgan until the coach came and mr amy or armstrong went away back to london morgan had followed him but of this event arthur pendennis did not inform lady clavering and left her invoking blessings upon him at her son's door going to kiss him as he was asleep it had been a busy day we have to chronicle the events of but one day more and that was the day when mr arthur attired in a new hat a new blue frock-coat and blue handkerchief and a new fancy waistcoat new boots and new shirt studs presented by the right honourable the countess dowager of rockminster made his appearance at a solitary breakfast-table in clavering park where he could scarce eat a single morsel of food two letters were laid by his worship's plate and he chose to open the first which was in a round clerk-like hand in preference to the second more familiar superscription note one ran as follows garbanzo's wine company shepherds in monday my dear pendennis in congratulating you heartily upon the event which is to make you happy for life i send my very kindest remembrances to mrs pendennis whom i hope to know even longer than i have already known her and when i call her attention to the fact that one of the most necessary articles to her husband's comfort is pure sherry i know i shall have her for a customer for your worship's sake but i have to speak to you of other than my own concerns yesterday afternoon a certain j a arrived at my chambers from clavering which he had left under circumstances of which you are doubtless now aware in spite of our difference i could not but give him food and shelter and he partook freely both of the garbanzos amontillado and the toboso ham and he told me what had happened to him and many other surprising adventures the rascal married at sixteen and has repeatedly since performed that ceremony in sydney in new zealand in south america in newcastle he says first before he knew our poor friend the milliner he is a perfect don juan and it seemed as if the commendatore had at last overtaken him for as we were at our meal there came three heavy knocks at my outer door which made our friend start i sustained a siege or two here and went to my usual place to reconnoitre thank my stars i have not a bill out in the world and besides those gentry do not come in that way i found that it was your uncle's late valet morgan and a policeman i think a sham policeman and they said they had a warrant to take the person of john armstrong alias amory alias altamont a runaway convict and threatened to break in the oak now sir in my own days of captivity i had discovered a little passage along the gutter into bows and costigan's window and i sent jack alias along this covered way not without terror of his life for it groaned very cranky and then after a parley let in messieurs morgan and friend the rascal had been instructed about that covered way for he made for the room instantly telling the policeman to go downstairs and keep the gate and he charged up my little staircase as if he had known the premises as he was going out of the window we heard a voice that you know from bose's garret saying who are ye and what are the devil are ye at you'd better ye leave the gutter but dad there's a man killed himself already and as morgan crossing over and looking into the darkness was trying to see whether this awful news was true he took a broomstick and with a vigorous dash broke down the pipe of communication and told me this morning with great glee that he was reminded 
of that azy stratagem by remembering his darling emily when she parted the port of cora in the plea and by the bridge of pozvaro bedad i wish that scoundrel morgan had been on the bridge when the general tried his stratagem if i hear more of jack alias i will tell you he has got plenty of money still and i wanted him to send some to our poor friend the milliner but the scoundrel laughed and said he had no more than he wanted but offered to give anybody a lock of his hair farewell be happy and believe me always truly yours e strong and now for the other letter said pen dear old fellow and he kissed the seal before he broke it warrington tuesday i must not let the day pass over without saying a god bless you to both of you may heaven make you happy dear arthur and dear laura i think pen that you have the best wife in the world and pray that as such you will cherish her and tender the chambers will be lonely without you dear pen but if i am tired i shall have a new home to go to in the house of my brother and sister i am practising in the nursery here in order to prepare for the part of uncle george farewell make your wedding tour and come back to your affectionate g w pendennis and his wife read this letter together after dr portman's breakfast was over and the guests were gone and when the carriage was waiting amidst the crowd at the doctor's outer gate but the wicket led into the churchyard of st mary's where the bells were pealing with all their might and it was here over helen's green grass that arthur showed his wife george's letter for which of those two for grief was it or for happiness that laura's tears abundantly fell on the paper and once more in the presence of the sacred dust she kissed and blessed her arthur there was only one marriage on that day at clavering church for in spite of blanche's sacrifices for her dearest mother honest harry foker could not pardon the woman who had deceived her husband and justly argued that she would deceive him again he went to the pyramids in syria and there left his malady behind him and returned with a fine beard and a supply of tarbushes and nargillies with which he regales all his friends he lives splendidly and through pen's mediation gets his wine from the celebrated vintages of the duke of garbanzos as for poor cause his fate has been mentioned in an early part of this story no very glorious end could be expected to such a career morgan is one of the most respectable men in the parish of st james's and in the present political movement has pronounced himself like a man and a briton and bows on the demise of mr piper who played the organ at clavering little mrs sam hunter who has the entire command of dr portman brought bows down from london to contest the organ loft and her candidate carried the chair when sir francis clavering quitted this worthless life the same little indefatigable canvasser took the borough by storm and it is now represented by arthur pendennis esq blanche amory it is well known married at paris in the saloons of madame de la comtesse de montmorency de valentinois were amongst the most suivi of that capital the duel between the count and the young and fiery representative of the mountain alcide de morobo arose solely from the latter questioning at the club the titles borne by the former nobleman madame de montmorency de valentinois travelled after the adventure and bungay bought her poems and published them with the countess's coronet emblazoned on the countess's work major pendennis became very serious in his last days and was never so happy as when laura was reading to him with her sweet voice or listening to his stories for this sweet lady is the friend of the young and the old and her life was always passed in making other lives happy and what sort of a husband would this pendennis be many a reader will ask doubting the happiness of such a marriage and the fortune of laura the queerest if they meet her are referred to that lady herself who seeing his faults and wayward moods seeing and owning that there are men better than he loves him always with the most constant affection his children or their mother have never heard a harsh word from him and when his fits of moodiness and solitude are over welcome him back with a never-failing regard and confidence his friend is his friend still entirely heart whole that malady is never fatal to a sound organ and george goes through his part of ga papa perfectly and lives alone if mr penn's works have procured him more reputation than has been acquired by his abler friend whom no one knows george lives contented without the fame if the best men do not draw the great prizes in life we know it has been so settled by the ordainer of the lottery we own and see daily how the false and worthless live and prosper while the good are called away and the dear and young perish untimely we perceive in every man's life the maimed happiness the frequent falling the bootless endeavour the struggle of right and wrong in which the strong often succumb and the swift fail we see flowers of good blooming in foul places as in the most lofty and splendid fortunes laws of vice and meanness and stains of evil and knowing how mean the best of us is let us give a hand of charity to arthur pendennis with all his faults and shortcomings who does not claim to be a hero but only a man and a brother the end 
end of chapter seventy six end of the history of pendennis by william makepeace thackeray